Tonight's meeting of the Metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County Council is coming to you live from the council chambers at the historic Metro Courthouse. It's a public affairs presentation of the Metro Nashville Network. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Nolan, your announcer for this program. Tonight, the 15th Metropolitan Council holds its 78th business meeting of a four-year term. This is the 24th council meeting of 2022 that, inclu that includes one special adjourned meeting held earlier this calendar year. Tonight's council agenda is 50 pages long and contains 133 items for business. That includes one proposed council rule change along with one likely controversial resolution on public hearing regarding license plate readers. That will be followed by 43 second reading rezoning bill ordinances on public hearing as well. There's also a required third reading on public hearing, or public hearing on that as well for a bill to annex property in the Urban Services Property Tax District. It's a small number of properties involved in Council District 13. There's also on the agenda tonight 13 regular resolutions, 50 first reading bills, 12 second reading measures, and 13 ordinances on third and final reading. In addition, the council will elect from two nominees given by members of the body to fill a uh, vacant position on the city's industrial development board. The council will also consider two mayoral appointments. One is an appointment to the Metro Action Commission. The other is a reappointment to the Work Release Commission. All those confirmed and elected will have multi-year terms to serve as unpaid volunteers. Among resolutions tonight, there's a public hearing regarding license plate readers, which I mentioned earlier. After a month-long fight in the council, the council approved a six-month pilot project for those kind of readers. This public hearing is the next the next required step, but opponents feel this resolution goes too far and too quickly to begin a permanent license reader program. So look for efforts tonight to defer or possibly defeat this resolution tonight. The bill has 14 co-sponsors. Remember, it only takes a simple majority to pass a resolution, not 21 votes. There are again two bills on the agenda tonight related to the proposed $2.1 billion roof stadium for the Tennessee Titans football team. The new stadium will be built on the east bank of the Cumberland River near the present Nissan Stadium. Council has been studying this proposal in multiple committee meetings and conducting some continuing public hearings across the city. One bill up tonight is BL 2022-1529. It's an ordinance on second reading. It would increase the city's hotel motel occupancy privilege tax in the amount of 1%. The proceeds would be used to pay for part of the city's share of the construction and the future capital improvements to a new enclosed stadium and for its debt service. The amendment tonight would also change the effectiveness uh, of that particular uh, ordinance from February 1st, 2023, saying the ordinance shall take effect on or after the approval of the final binding documents to construct the stadium, which of course at this date is a date uncertain. The other stadium legislation before the council tonight is resolution 2022-1827. It would approve a non-binding term sheet describing the terms and conditions of the agreements and transactions required to finance, construct, and operate a new enclosed multi-purpose stadium on the East Bank. The council has been leery of a non-binding agreement, but the city's sports authority approved it last week. The council has before it an amendment that would further underscore the non-binding nature of this term sheet, but it may defer the resolution again tonight, perhaps after adding that, uh, that uh, amendment, and take it up at the next council meeting. That'll be on December 20th, when the hotel motel tax increase would be up for final approval if it passes on second reading tonight. Other resolutions for the council include RS 2022-1884, would accept nearly $500,000 grant from the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grants Program. The grant would require no matching funds. It would support, it would be used to support a broad range of activities to prevent and control crime based on state and local needs and conditions. Under RS 2022-1888, the council would authorize $200,000 in grants to six different nonprofit organizations. The monies would come from the city's Office for Family Safety under its Community Partnership Grant Program. The individual grants are based on proposals submitted by the nonprofit groups themselves and recommended by the Family Safety Office. RS 2022-1889 would approve a $177,000 grant involving the Metro Board of Health, Metro Fire Department, and the Mental Health Cooperative. It would have nonprofit Profit groups, these nonprofit groups to provide outreach, assessment, and linkage to care for individuals identified by the Metro Fire Department's EMS service as a part of its HIA opioid overdose response program. Under RS 2022-1891, the council would seek a nearly $63.5 million grant from the state to modernize and upgrade the city's water, Dry Creek Water Service Reclamation Facility. Metro would provide a nearly $16 million grant, a match, I should say, if the grant is approved. The current facility is over 50 years in age, and the modernizing efforts are projected to increase capacity for the areas to serve and handle that flow for the next 20 years. On memorializing resolutions, the council will recognize the 30th anniversary of Asylum Health, recognize the LBTQ community, and remember the victims of, club, of the Club Q shooting in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Also, we congratulate Metro Water Services as a recipient of the 2022 Tennessee Solar Energy Industry, Industries Association, their Solar Champion Award, and recognize the 10th anniversary of the American Muslim Advisory Council. On second reading, the council will again consider BL 
1828 to increase the size of several city boards and commissions to foster more diversity and, rep re re and um, representation. The bill has 14 sponsors. It was our co-sponsors. It was deferred two weeks ago to work out a possible amendment from the mayor's office to make these, which, which makes all these appointments. We'll see what that amendment, if, it's, if it happens, what it, what it will look like. Also on second reading, BL 2022-1530 would rewrite the rules, regulations, and permits and fees involving the excavating and obstruction of the public right-of-way for construction or other purposes. RS 2022-1572 would again seek to codify the existing traffic calming program maintained by the Metro Department of Transportation. It also provides additional regulations for privately funded traffic calming programs. The council has struggled with this matter now for several months. Under BL 2022-1571, the council will likely defer until January a new bill on second reading to again rewrite the city's animal code. Finally, on second reading, BL 2022-1533 is a bill that would approve routine easements acceptance on Charlotte Avenue. Now, there's been an amendment filed by Council Member Dave Ro David Rosenberg to change the effective date of that legislation from what it usually is, which is the final approval uh, of the bill to that date. But now, instead, it will be uh, to take effect determined by the approval by the Metro Housing Development in fact, the director of that organization that all occupants at 7002 Charlotte Pike have been provided with permanent or semi-permanent housing in accordance with Metro government's coordinated entry process. 7002 Charlotte is the location of the controversial Brookmead homeless settlement where Metro already has signs up saying the camp will be closed by the end of this year. The bill that we talked about, the easement bill, is up for third and final reading and it would normally be routine, although there are two sets of zoning bills that are also up for consideration of the council tonight. If they're approved tonight, they would be within two days of these bills being before the council for a full year. If you want to follow the council meeting as it progresses, you can find the agenda and the staff analysis online. Just go to the Metro Council, BoshonNashville.gov website, then on the Legislative Information Center. You can also be placing the bill numbers on the screen when they come up for consideration so you can follow along and keep up with where we are on the meeting agenda. Let's go now to Vice Mayor Jim Shulman. He'll be gathering tonight's meeting in order shortly. Will the meeting please come to order? We welcome you to the Metro Council. Today is Tuesday, December the 6th, 2022. All members of the council, as well as the public, please rise for the invocation. Remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation tonight is brought to us by Sally Wells, president of the Native American Indian Association and a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indian. Uh, she is a guest of council member Sandra Sepulveda. Thank you for inviting me to be here in this great session that you're going to have. And I'm just going to say my blessings and I'm going to do it in my own languages to do this. And it's it's awful good to say all these things. And it's going to be about y'all. I'm going to ask God.
Uh, you all may be seated. Uh, without objection, we will suspend the calling of the roll and ask the clerk to record the names of those members present throughout the meeting. Is there a motion for adoption of the minutes of the meeting from November 15, 2022? I got a motion properly seconded. Without objection, the minutes of the meeting will stand approved as written. Mr. Clerk, any messages from the mayor? There are no messages from the mayor. All right. Um, a couple of things to note uh, for tonight. First of all, I'd like to recognize the police chief, John Drake, who is out in the audience. Police chief, thank you for being here. Um, and I know we have um, former council member uh, Dwayne Dominey here. Where is that council member? There he is. <clears throat> and the reason I... The reason I knew that is that I'd like to recognize his son, uh, Aaron Dominey, who is here tonight earning a merit badge on his way to becoming an Eagle Scout. Um, so. Aaron is a member of Troop 4 that meets at South End United Methodist Church. Thank you all for being here. All right, uh, Council Member Murphy, uh, you are recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We had come before Industrial Development no, Board or rather. Hold, no, hold on, not yet. You're early. I'm sorry, this is my point of personal privilege. <laughs> That's right. I got ahead of myself. That's right. Um, I just wanted to announce that my grandfather turned 100 this past week, and he is a World War II veteran, um, Purple Heart recipient, and kind of a big deal. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you all. And he is slowly catching up to Council Lady Henderson's grandmother, if you wanted to. Uh, I'm passing the mic to you. Council Member Henderson. Sure, I will take the opportunity. My grandmother, Beatrice Allen, turned 104. Last month, um, she grew up in Williamson County, one of 10 children um, on a farm there. Her father had a general store and her first interaction with Nashville was coming downtown to buy things for the store right here on our own public square. So um, thank you, Council Lady Murphy, I appreciate it. Speaking of birthdays, um, our own Margaret Darby's birthday is um, December the 19th. So remember that it's the Monday before the next council meeting. Don't hurt me, please. All right. Um, Nashville General Hospital, uh, their patients uh, are in need of warm clothing. Uh, they are collecting coats, hoodies, ponchos, flannels, sleeping bags, men's tennis shoes. They need uh, new items. If you have any of those things, you can bring those items to the Reg Register of Deeds office or you can drop them off at a General Hospital at 1818 Albion Street. Uh, now, pursuant to um, a memorandum that was sent to you from me on November 30th, 2022, we are taking nominations tonight for four members appointed by this council to serve on the newly formed Tax Incentive and Abatement Study and Formulating Committee. Two of those members can actually come from the body itself. Um, and uh, what we're gonna do is take nominations tonight and then we will select the four nominees at the next meeting. Um, so um, I am now ready to take any nominations from the floor. Council Member Stiles, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to nominate Council Member Toombs. Okay. Council Member Toombs is one of the nominations. All right, Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to nominate Charles Robert Bone and Fiona Halter. Okay. Okay, all right. All right, other nominations, Council Member Pulley. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to nominate Council Member Johnston. Okay, Council Member Johnston. Okay. Uh, Council Member Roten. I'd like to nominate Council Member Berkeley Allen. Okay, all right. Council Member Young. I'd like to nominate Council Member Van Rees. All right. I'm looking for other nominations. 
Anybody else? Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have four council members and two individuals. Anybody else for nomination? All right, Mr. Clark, we got the names. Okay, uh, nominations will cease, uh, and then uh, we will uh, take these individuals up. They'll go before the Rules Committee at the next meeting, and then we'll vote on them at the next meeting. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> last thing I've got is um, uh, still a lot of uh, very sad events going on around this country, including right here in Nashville over the last couple of weeks. Um, you should have received a notice from the police department today that reported that um, I think so far this year, 1,306 guns have been stolen from vehicles in Nashville. 1,306 guns have been stolen. More than 70% of all guns reported stolen in 2022 were taken from vehicles. Um, last week, uh, 29 guns were stolen from cars and trucks. So um, please uh, remember to uh, keep things protected, lock your cars, and don't keep valuables in your car. Um, also, um, as we uh, conclude, we only have one more meeting left in the year. It's been a, a, a long year. Uh, always uh, remember Ukraine in your thoughts and prayers. All right, we are ready to proceed. Councilmember Murphy, uh, is there a report from the Rules Committee? You're on. Thank you. Um, Industrial Development Board? Uh, we can start there, Industrial Development Board. Uh, we have an election to fill the vacancy for the unexpired term of Miss Winnie Forrester uh, for a term expiring September 19, 2023. There were two nominations. Thank you. We found that Mr. Andy Bakta and Mr. Joshua Haston, I'm sorry, Haston, are both qualified to move forward for an election. All right, so uh, both are qualified to um, to serve in that capacity. We are now gonna have an election to fill that vacancy. <laughs> and I'm looking at uh, the director, I meant to ask her, do we have ballots or are we gonna try to do this on the board? Yeah. Okay, we have ballots, okay. So um, we are ready to pass out the ballots. You're gonna be deciding uh, to fill the vacancy um, for the unexpired term of Ms. Forrester. Uh, it's a selection between Andy Bakta and Joshua Haston. Passing out the ballots, um, I think what you'll need to do is, um, I believe this is right, you'll need to put your name, uh, your district number or at large, and then you're gonna need to pick between uh, Andy Bakta or Joshua Haston. The names are on the board. Uh, once you fill those out, if you would, if you would hold them up, we'll collect them and then bring them to the clerk and then we're gonna read them out.
All right, uh, we have all, all the ballots in. Uh, Mr. Clerk, what you're gonna do is uh, you're gonna call out the individual council member's name and just confirm um, which, uh, how they voted. Uh, so proceed ahead. All right, council member Mendez voted for Joshua Haston. Okay. Council member Hurt voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Allen voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Suara voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Hall voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Toombs voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Gamble voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Swope voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Parker voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Withers voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Benedict voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Van Rees did not vote. Council member Hancock voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Young voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Hager voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Evans voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Bradford voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Roden voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Syracuse voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Welsh voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Cash voted for Joshua Haston. Council member O'Connell voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Roberts voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Taylor voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Hauser voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Druffle voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Murphy voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Pooley voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Johnston voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Nash voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Sepulveda voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Rutherford voted for Joshua Haston. Council member Stiles voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Lee voted for Andy Bakta. Council member Henderson voted for Joshua Haston. And council member Rosenberg voted for Andy Bakta. All right, um, the totals are um, Andy Bakta got uh, 15 votes, uh, Joshua Haston got 20 votes, and there was one not voting. Mr. Haston uh, is selected to the Industrial Development Board. Mr. Haston, are you here? If you would stand up. There he is, way in the back. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Bakta, we also appreciate you uh, submitting your name and, and being a part of this process. All right, so thank you. All right, Council Member Murphy, we've got a couple of other um, matters before that came before rules, elections, and confirmations. That is correct. We had the Metro Action Commission appointment of Pastor Michael Cousin for a term expiring on November 15th, 2025. And he was approved Seven in favor, mm, six in favor, so you're against. All right, and then what about uh, Miss Lauren Gators for Work Release Commission? We also are shocked and amazed that she has hung in for, I believe, over 40 years on this board um, for Metro, and so that is extremely noteworthy, and so we overwhelmingly approved her six in favor, zero against for work release commission reappointment expiring on January 1, 2027. All right, and uh, motion to approve on both those? Move to approve. Uh, Councilman Murphy has moved to approve uh, both uh, the appointment of Pastor uh, Cousins and the reappointment of Ms. Uh, Gators. Um, I've 
I've got a proper second. Any discussion on the uh, motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, you adopt. Uh, if I can get you all to stand, Pastor uh, Michael Cousin for the Metropolitan Action Commission and Ms. Lauren Gators for the Work Release Commission. Thank you both very much for your willingness to serve Nashville and Davidson County. Uh, next item on the agenda is the proposed amendment to Rule 8 of the Metropolitan Council Rules of Procedure. It's an amendment to Rule 8. Uh, Council Member Cash, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, committee report? Uh, rules, Council Member Murphy. We move to defer one meeting, six in favor, zero against, with and without asterisks. With or without asterisks? Hmm, yes. Yeah, I'm, I may go into that. Um, All right, so, Councilor Cash. So uh, this is about deferrals, um, and I'm fine deferring it, but I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, it, there were a couple of things that happened at the last meeting that drew my attention to Rule 8, and I uh, felt the need to put my English teacher hat on and felt that, that it could be improved. Um, so my intention with this rule change is not to change anything as much as clarify some things that I didn't feel were that clear and I don't think I was the only one. Um, the first thing, and the, the, the first, the main two things are in the first paragraph. Um, the first thing was that uh, there was a, a deferral of a bill in committee and then there was, uh, then when it got to the floor, it was not automatically deferred, but it was a two meeting deferral. But I think there was some confusion about whether or not an automatic deferral is, um, whether or not there, that a one meeting deferral is uh, creates an automatic deferral or whether a deferral, a, a time specific deferral creates, from a committee creates a one meeting deferral. Um, and I, basically I think here adding, um, the type of meeting that, the, that a committee, when a committee makes a one meeting deferral, uh, this automatic deferral happens. And I think that one meeting that refers to the committee action needs to be spelled out there and not just that the deferral from the full council that's automatic, okay? So I added the words uh, for one meeting in there that I think clarifies that part. The, the second part, um, is uh, adding the words without debate or discussion. There was another bill that I worked on or that I was uh, introducing and, and committee, another council member asked for a deferral. I was happy to do that. It created one meeting deferral. And then I uh, discussed, uh, then I discussed it, even though it was an automatic deferral. And then afterwards I was made aware that I'm really not supposed to talk about it when it's automatic deferral. Um, but you, the chair, thank you, you allowed me to. But my understanding is that's the intent of an automatic deferral, even though it doesn't say it. So I am not married to this change about saying that for an automatic deferral, we are not able to debate or discuss. But my understanding is that's what the rule is supposed to mean and how it's interpreted. So, uh, and if that's what it means, and that's what it should say. But we have some time, and I think the rules committee is aware of this kind of issue of do we want to say, spell out that it, we, we're not supposed to talk about it for the first automatic deferral, or do we want to be have more flexibility to speak if we need to? Um, so those are the two main changes. There are some other wording changes in the second paragraph that I think are just kind of spelling out some things um, that staff recommended. Uh, so that said, and I hope I've given uh, council members some food for thought to consider if we wanna make these changes. Um, I would recommend the first one and the second one I'm open to. But um, having said that, uh, move one meeting deferral. All right, so Councilmember Cash has moved to defer um, a vote on the proposed amendment to rule eight. Uh, one meeting properly seconded. Any discussion on the deferral motion? Seeing none, ready to vote. All those in favor of the deferral motion, one meeting, say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, this one's deferred one meeting. All right. <clears throat> 
Uh, we are now ready uh, for resolutions on public hearing. Before I get started, uh, we do have a Spanish interpreter here. Uh, Ms. De Ruiz is here. Uh, you are recognized. If you don't mind coming to the back microphone and just explaining um, uh, in Spanish uh, that you are here to help translate if necessary. Uh, Ms. De Ruiz, you're recognized. Uh, buenas noches, mi nombre es Sandra. Estoy aquí en nombre de LT um, Language Services. Voy a hacer la intérprete en español para la sesión de esta noche. Gracias. All right, thank you. Um, all right, we are now ready for resolutions. Um, we have one resolution on public hearing and we have bills on public hearing tonight. Here's how that works. I will call up the resolution and then the bills one at a time and then refer to the sponsor. Unless the sponsor moves to defer the public hearing, the sponsor will call for a public hearing. I will then ask for a show of hands for those who are here in favor of the resolution or the bill. And then I'll ask for a show of hands for those who are here in opposition uh, to the resolution or the bill. If anyone in favor of the measure wishes to speak, I will ask you to come forward, find the microphone, introduce yourself, and give us your address, and then you will have two minutes in which to speak. I will then ask if anyone opposed wishes to speak, and we'll do the same thing. After that process, I will close the public hearing and refer back to the sponsor. All right, we are ready for the first measure. It's a resolution on public hearing. It's item number one. It's RS 2022-1883 uh, by Council Members Roden, Syracuse, Pulley, Johnston, and others. It's a resolution authorizing the Metropolitan Government to enter into an agreement with private entities to acquire, share, or otherwise use surveillance technology and install surveillance technology onto or within the public right-of-way. Council Member Roten, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, committee reports, please. All right, I got a budget and finance committee. Uh, you've got that one. Um, the budget and finance uh, amended um, approve the amendment 10 in favor, zero against, and they approve the um, resolution as amended, nine in favor, two against, one non voting. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Syracuse, Public Health and Safety. Thank you, Vice Mayor. On the amendment, it was five, four, one against. On the bill as amended, it was six, four, zero against. All right, thank you. Transportation Infrastructure, Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Transportation recommended approval of proposed it. Amendment 11 in favor, zero against, and zero not voting. Uh, then recommended uh, uh, approval of the bill of the resolution as amended. 12 in favor, zero against, zero not voting. All right, thank you, Councilman Pulley. Back to you, Councilman Roden. I moved to open the public hearing. All right, I declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the resolution. All right, a show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the resolution. Okay, why don't we start with those in favor. Anyone wishing to speak, if you would come forward to the back microphone, uh, give us your name, address, and then you'll have two minutes in which to speak. And you may want to pick that one up. Or, or you can pick the whole thing up. That's fine. All right. Ready to go? Name, address, two minutes. Kevin Warner, uh, 18th Avenue South and Music Row. <clears throat> For anybody who opposes this, you must know, if you don't already, there is no personal privacy anymore in this country. There is no more privacy. Every time you pick up a cell phone, Twitter, Internet, Instagram, TikTok, all that other stuff, they're watching and listening. Where do you think all the ads come from that swamp your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your email account, the internet? They're all coming from the companies who run these algorithms. What do you like? Send them an ad. So there's no privacy anymore. There is no privacy. Now, I would love it if Chief Drake, if this passes, I would love you to put uh, the license plate readers on my roof, on the front door, on the back door, because he wants to fight crime. And I wouldn't mind because I don't break the law. It's simple. I don't break the law. I don't care when the wonderful men and women serving under Chief Drake are watching. I have a god-awful job as it is already. So I am firmly in favor of this. 
personal privacy. You know, it's time for communities across this country, instead of sitting around watching people run through their neighborhoods with assault weapons, it's time for them to realize they have allies among the police department. So I am 100% in favor of this. I don't break the law. Take my picture. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak in favor, if you would just uh, come on up. Name, address, two minutes. Hello, my name's Mary Bird. I live in District 35. Um, I go by Dee Dee. I um, at 542 Hickory Trail Drive. I am for this resolu this resolution and for a different reason. I had a family member who had there had to be declared a silver alert on her earlier that in this month, last month, and uh, she was found in Martin, Tennessee. And I firmly believe that she would have been found earlier if we had had license plate readers. Um, I also believe in LPRs because these are public right-of-ways. These are public roads. Um, there are public businesses on these public roads that need to be protected. There's also, I've had an experience with a domestic violence issue where there was a child involved, and I firmly believe that if we'd had LPRs, that that child would have been rescued sooner. And and the emotional distraught nature that was created when this accident occurred uh, could have been prevented. I, I just agree that we are a big city, we have big city issues, and we need to start acting like a big city and taking care of the citizens that live here. And I firmly support LPRs. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next speaker. Good evening, Twana Chick, 5967 Cane Ridge Road. Back in December 2020, I came home to find that I had been burglarized in spite of having two large dogs inside the house. I missed the burglar just by a few minutes. We got a description from a neighbor next door. Uh, that quickly led to having a license plate for the vehicle, which had been taken off of Murfreesboro Road. The suspect was wanted in uh, Wilson County, and the tag was known for... 10 days until he was caught. During that time, he did almost uh two dozen more events. He was caught because we had good communication with the construction companies in the area and neighbors. He had a history of doing aggravated burglaries. He had a history of theft from motor vehicle, weapons charges, and an assortment of other crimes. There were lots of victims that could have been prevented. We know that he traveled on Bell Road. We know he traveled on Hobson Pike. We know he traveled on Murfreesboro Road several times before he was apprehended. Um, so that would have led to him getting stopped quicker, and it's a piece of technology that I think we need to have in our database. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker, name, address, two minutes. Good evening, uh, and thank you, council members. My name is Jeanette Barker. I reside at uh, 2629 South Highlands Drive. Um, I'm speaking today, though, uh, on behalf of the Nashville Downtown Partnership in support of this resolution authorizing Metro to enter into an agreement with private entities to, of course, purchase and deploy license plate readers. The Downtown Partnership is, uh, for intents and purposes, the official voice for downtown residents, businesses, employees, and visitors. And we support this in any resolution, really, or bill that would move forward with a responsible and narrowly tailored LPR pilot program. With the responsibility of working to make downtown a clean, safe, and attractive neighborhood for all to enjoy, we really must and try to always prioritize community safety in our city's busy, especially in our city's busiest corridors. Our increasingly popular and utilized and visited urban core deserves to have the absolute best tools and tactics to preserve and promote a safe urban center. With LPRs being a known effective strategy for reducing, preventing, or detecting crime, and with legal language from what we understand that safeguards civil liberties and civil rights, we believe that the cost-benefit analysis uh, for this program is clear. A limited pi pilot program will allow Nashville to right-size LPRs for our community in a way that reflects our values, protects from misuse, while providing those 
those who are sworn to protect and serve our citizenry with a vital tool to solve the most uh, egregious criminal and property crimes. We appreciate your, your di diligence and thoughtful engagement. It is an important topic, it's a complex topic, and we hope that you move forward with the pilot program. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Chief. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Shulman and Council Members. I'm Chief John Drake. I've, I'm, I'm a native of Nashville. I still live in this city. And my address to use for this hearing will be 600 Murfreesboro Pike. I'm joined in the chamber today by our police department leadership team who are here to ask your help in helping us enhance the safety of this city. I wanna be very clear. Our police department wants to use license plate readers to identify criminal suspects who flee from scenes and vehicles, who are people that violated crimes such as homicides, carjackings, and non-lethal shootings. When a vehicle is stolen, that's a hardship for anyone. Shouldn't we do all we can to recover that vehicle before it's used in a violent crime? We want to identify those that are in those vehicles doing street racer events that are blocking our intersections and creating havoc in our city. We want to help find children who are missing and our senior citizens who are missing as well. I could go through and name incident after incident after incident while license plate readers would have helped. We have no interest and using them for any other purpose other than what I've stated for this. LPR technology has been a game-changing technology all across the nation and in Tennessee. LPRs are focused on license plates and not the occupants of vehicles. Anyone who says they're used for racial profiling don't understand the technology. I wanna say a word about missing children. It was October 6, 2021. It's a couple that went to the Inglewood Kroger, left the vehicle running, and with a one-year-old child inside. We searched for six hours trying to find this child before we finally found, uh, from after using an Amber Alert, the child was found in a vehicle abandoned in frigid temperatures, was, st was still alive and still okay. License plate readers would have helped us. I wrote a letter to you yesterday about Vishal Battelle. His family is here and you'll hear a little bit about that in just a minute from one of our senior uh, homicide detectives. Chief, you've, um, you've hit your two minutes and okay. as much as I hate to stop you, we, we try to do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Vice Mayor Schulman, council members. Is that better? Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Go. Good evening, Vice Mayor Shulman and council members. My name is Sergeant Chris Dickerson. And I'm with the Homicide Unit for Metro Nashville Police. I join my colleagues in asking you to approve the six month pilot LPR program. Our detective team is leading the investigation into last week's murder of Vishal Patel, whose family is here in attendance tonight. This occurred at 4890 Lebanon Pike. And thanks to information from witnesses, we were able to arrest the two 15-year-old suspects shortly after. They were still riding around in a stolen Kia SUV that we learned was stolen about two days prior in Kentucky. During the interview, we learned that if we had had LPRs in place, this could have prevented the homicide from happening. And Mr. Patel's family member would not have to endure this tragedy. I took part in those interviews, and I agree that the presence of LPR technology in Donaldson and Hermitage may have also prevented other acts that those two individuals were involved in that very same day. I am grateful that some apartment complexes in Nashville already have private LPR systems. One of them provided, police depart one of them provided the police department with crucial tag information with regard of the murder of Arthur Henderson that occurred at the Fallbrook Apartments on November 18th. With that tag information, we were able to corroborate the name along with the tag, and we were able to apprehend him as he traveled between Clarksville and Nashville just hours after the homicide, all because the Fallbrook Apartments were already equipped with the LPR technology. 
Just two years ago, last Saturday, two years ago, nurse Caitlin Kaufman was murdered on I-440. Some of you know I was then, still am the lead detective in that investigation. Early on, we did not have a lot of information to go off of, and I absolutely would have loved if we had LPR technology. Luckily, a private group of Nashvillians came forward and donated money that led to the arrest of the suspects. And I am, and I have confidence, and I can say it with confidence, that those same Nashvillians do approve the LPR pilot program. All right, that uh, time is up again. All right. Thank you very much. Honorable Vice Mayor, Honorable Members of the National Council, Jack Patel, 5704, Portsmouth Place, Brentwood, Davidson County, Tennessee. I want to second what Chief and uh, Sergeant just said. Last Thursday, I had to deliver, deliver eulogy to the 37-year-old Vishal Patel's funeral and his wife and daughter and 600-plus members of the community. It was, it was very very, very tragic and did not know what to say. And like Chief said, our sergeant said there was a robbery two days before of the same people. If LPRs were there, if, if we equip our officers and, and department with extra technology to catch these criminals, why not? I understand about first rights. Out of all people, I do. I'm made in India, right? I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. So I, I understand about the democracy and the rights and all that. That's, that's awesome freedom that we have. But at the same time, safety of our community and our, our, our families and members is very important. And I, we highly recommend getting LPRs. If it gets one criminal off the street and protects one life, that's one less eulogy that someone has to deliver. In this case, it was a 37-year-old mother with a seven-year-old daughter. I was there delivering eulogy, Honorable Vice Mayor. Seven-year-old was comforting her mom, saying, hey, mom, please don't cry. It was heartbreaking. And if there's a way to prevent it, and again, I'm not saying this is gonna prevent everything, but why not equip our, our men in blue with one more piece of technology that's available so that they can catch these people faster, sooner, and prevent one more tragedy so another 37-year-old doesn't have to be widowed. Another seven-year-old doesn't have to live for the rest of her life as a father without a father. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here. Next speaker. Good evening. Um, LD, I'm um, District 21, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like this, y'all. We got a bunch of paranoid uh, kids, and it seems like what I'm hearing is that if we had these for them, that the kids and their paranoia in these cars as they're committing these crimes maybe be upheld before they reach, you know, velocity. Okay, so you're talking about a car moving and you've been able to tag a car. Well, one thing I do know about is the use of cars. I'm in a community where I fight for like 50, 60 kids. And what I know about them is that they're paranoid of law officials. Um, they, they take heed to things and they grab them and they're theirs, but they're even scared to lose what's theirs. So what we're saying is we're gonna try to eliminate what they grab on to use and what they are able to use in a paranoid, schizophrenic type of way, and you're gonna give them something to fight with. Um, I look at it like this, that's a win. That's stopping someone who's using a vehicle or even being able to attend and use something that they really don't have any business using, and we got hundreds of them. We have hundreds of homicides already, so the number's up there, so we know who's getting it, we know what they're doing in them, and then they're saying, well, we could have stopped it. So it sounds pretty clear to us. As adults, um, I think once the clarity reaches itself, you got to say to yourself, call it what it is. We got a bunch of people who are acting the I word, and we're not gonna use those words in this council labor, we're gonna look at it as laboring. Uh, take that labor and turn it into something for these people so they can end the other kind of labor that we've been going through in this country. Nashville is a great, great place to grow up at. And if you hear what I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you have kids who are scared out of their mind and they're paranoid and they're committing these crimes under paranoid areas. I believe the arresting officers in this area or behind me in front of me will tell you how many times they've got a kid and that kid really didn't even know that he could have stopped himself. He's so scared. And we're talking about the criminals. We're not talking about individuals, guys. So uh, I think where we're at with them is give it to them and then let's keep on going with this meeting tonight so we can get to some real business. It seems pretty simple for grown adults, right? Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
The next speaker, name, address, two minutes. Yes. Uh, my name is Richie Reagan, and I'm from the Madison area. I um, just want to start out by saying my father was uh, from Mississippi. He was a small town in Mississippi. I remember one day I was with him, uh, went into a store, he left his car running, and we came back out. I said, why did you do that? And he says, oh, you know, when I grew up in Mississippi, we left our doors unlocked, we left our car running, and the first thing I want to say is we don't live in those times anymore. We live in 2022. And this, these technologies were created not because of the honest people, but because of criminals. That's why these technologies were created. They weren't created because the people were doing the right thing. I just want to make that clear. Uh, second thing, uh, three, three friends of mine this past Friday were struck by a vehicle in the Wedgwood, Houston area. Um, the cameras that, that caught the incident were like from businesses, kind of a corner of a store. It wasn't really good, and that car uh, is out there somewhere roaming around. Uh, they didn't even stop. They hit them, they're still investigating this. But three of my friends were, uh, were injured. Uh, went to Vanderbilt University Hospital. Um, if we had this technology, uh, we, would, we would catch the criminals. It's not for the honest people. It's for people, it's for that to protect us. It's to protect the honest people. That's the only point I wanna make. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, anybody else wishing to speak in favor of the resolution? General Funk. Good evening, Vice Mayor, members of the council. My name is Glenn Funk. I'm the district attorney. Speaking tonight in favor of license plate readers, these are this is an important technology that will help with keeping our community safe. License plate readers are already deployed in the Mount Juliet area, and they and those license plate readers from Wilson County have helped Nashville solve crimes. License plate readers are also already deployed in the Belmede section of, uh, in the, the city of Belmede in Davidson County, and those license plate readers have helped us solve crime. Just five to six weeks ago, license plate reader in Belmede, as a car was traveling down uh, West End, picked up a stolen vehicle. Units were called to the scene, stop was effectuated, Men got out, tried to run. Both of them were armed. Both of them had a large amount of narcotics in the car. The car was stolen, and one of them already had a criminal record, right? Who knows what type of violent crime could have happened that day but for the license plate reader triggering law enforcement to be able to help us get those folks in custody before they could continue crime. That's just one example. That's anecdotal. Dozens of crimes have already been solved in this county, around this county, thanks to this technology. And I'm excited the fact that Nashville appears to be, uh, hopefully with this vote, ready to move forward and uh, be able to make our community even safer. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, General. Anybody else wishing to speak in favor? If you would come on up to the front. Name, address, uh, two minutes. Hello, my name is Jack Bird, 3017 Beach Miss Way. So, grew up in Nashville, lived here, my business is here, and ironically enough, a big portion of my business is LPR. Uh, kind of, I think the, the problem with this is a lot of it is surrounded in mystery. People don't understand it, but these AI engines, they don't, they're unable to process anything but an alphanumeric code. That's all that they see. So part of the concerns around privacy and, and seeing people, it doesn't see anyone in the vehicle at all. The engine is fed a series of letters and numbers and can only read letters and numbers. That is absolutely it. So there are currently three agencies in Inside of Davidson County utilizing LPRs, public safety agencies are already using them. But four of the six counties that touch Davidson County are using them. We have these implemented all across the southeast. We have over 38 law enforcement agencies alone in Tennessee that utilize them. In Davidson County specifically, we have 68 locations with 130 cameras already in operation in the private sector. As uh, echoing Chief Drake, part of that 
and what we really aim for here in any of these implementations with this product is that you aim for it to be a public-private partnership. And so building on the already existing infrastructure that's there, this has cut investigations in half in so many other places. This reduces your investigation time by almost 210% in some instances. And in the staffing crisis that we're in with law enforcement these days, all the help we can get, it makes all the sense. So looking at it, I think there's no way that we cannot accept that this, this can't be utilized in anything negative as far as seeing any person or, or prosecution like that. The, the strength comes from cross-referencing this with a database in NCIC. If they're not abusing that, they can't abuse this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else uh, wishing, to wishing to speak in favor as we get the microphone set up? For those of you watching at home, we're uh, trying to get the microphone set up in the back. Are we good to go? Anybody else wishing to speak uh, in favor of the resolution? All right, uh, those who are uh, here to speak in opposition to the resolution, if you would come forward, I need your name, um, address, and then you'll have two minutes in which to speak. If you'd come on forward, um, that would be great. address and uh, two minutes. Hi, I'm Jill Fitchard. I'm the executive director of the Community Oversight Board. I live in District 33. I would like to begin by clearly stating my request. Um, the COB urges council to defer voting on this legislation by at least two meetings. Since council's approval of a pilot program for LPRs back in February, the COB and the community have kept in, have been kept in the dark about the pilot uh, program's progress. This is not to diminish or minimize the effectiveness of the investigative tool 
school to fully effect in the assistance of locating violent offenders. Um, my concerns are more about what we as a community don't know. For instance, the request for quotation that accompanies RS 2022-1883 contains an amendment to remove the requirement that awarded vendors will provide presentations on their technology and answer questions from the public. This presentation could have provided an opportunity for public input, but it was removed. There is a high degree of uncertainty about which vendors are vying to supply MMPD with LPRs, given where MMPD is in the procurement process. Uh, Vigilant Solutions, Wrecker, and Flock Safety are all popular options locally. Each of these vendors, however, come with different risk, approaches to public safety, and cost. Removing the requirement that awarded vendors provide presentations is a denial of a public voice in a process that already has limited opportunities for feedback. While the MMPD is fulfilling their legal obligation by hosting this public hearing on the LPR program, it is impossible for the COB to determine whether MMPD's policy will contain sufficient safeguards for the public. We have not seen any policy outlining how LPRs will be utilized by the department, and we're told that such policies may not even exist. Um, and also in section 13.0808 of the Metro Code, um, the, the council, the COB, and the public to determine whether the stipulations have been met, um, I don't know how that can happen without the review of any SOPs or policy from MMPD. And so you're being asked to make these three, rec these three determinations in the absence of information about policy, about cost, and about vendors. Ms. Fitcher, your uh, time ran out. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Well, we're, we're switching mics again. <laughs> Sorry. That makes too much noise. I'm Grace Renshaw. I've lived in Cherokee Park for 35 years, and I'm here to oppose the LTPR private pilot program because it's a way to ease Metro into permanently deploying F LPRs. So license plate readers are yet another vendor-driven program that allows Metro government to appear to do something about a problem, in this case crime, by buying a package solution from a vendor that promises far more than it can deliver. In Nashville, LPRs will be too limited in scope to make a meaningful difference in law enforcement citywide. The potential for both both inequitable deployment of LPRs and abuse of the data they collect is high. I'd like to have a clearer picture of all of the cost of deployment, including the startup cost and the ongoing staffing cost. I don't trust Metro government or the Metro Police to establish or enforce guidelines that protect people's Fourth Amendment rights. I would much rather see Metro invest in deploying more police personnel and better training for police than a system that will require either existing or additional personnel to monitor cameras instead of being out in the community policing. Some of you know that my parents were killed by a drunken driver in 1997. I will never forget the kindness the police showed me, nor their rapid apprehension of the man who killed my parents who was trying to leave town at the bus station. If I thought the system would help police and law enforcement, I'd support it in a New York minute. But I don't think that. I think it's a vendor-driven solution. I don't think you have explored the options at, uh, in enough detail, and I don't think we're ready for a pilot program. Please vote no. Thank you, Ms. Renshaw. Uh, next speaker. Name, address, two minutes. Good evening, council members and vice mayor. Uh, my name is Judith Puerjoon. I'm the campaigns and advocacy director for the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. Uh, I live in 37013. So I'm here on behalf of our members and our community, and I want to reiterate our opposition to this resolution. Automatic license plate readers rely on third-party companies to sweep up massive quantities of indiscriminate and unverified information with little public scrutiny and account or accountability. 
ALPRs make it possible for police and ICE to track vehicles' movement, and the data collected can reveal intimate information about where we live, work, travel, protest, worship, seek legal support, or healthcare. We know that in the past, ICE has used surveillance systems like these to track our, our community members. For example, in 2017, it was revealed that the Department of Homeland Security had a contract with the licensed plate reader database company Vigilant Solutions. This contract gave ICE the dangerous power to search the database for historical information that shows a license plate's movement over the past five years and made it possible for the agency to set up real-time alerts for certain license plate numbers to monitor members of our communities. We have seen countless examples of ICE using these databases to track our people, and we know that government surveillance and data gathering has been disproportionately weaponized to harm black and brown communities, putting them at risk of the consequences of our criminal legal system. It's very unwise to put in place the infrastructure to expand surveillance and facilitate the collection of community data when we can't guarantee or safeguard, safeguard how this information is going to be used in the future. It's impossible to know what the state or other actors will try to do with this information once the infrastructure is in place and the data has been collected. We need council to continue to focus on providing support for our communities so that they have the resources they need instead of dangerous surveillance networks. If we want safer communities, we need more well-resourced communities, not more surveillance. All right, the two minutes. So, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker. Good evening, my name is Andrew Krinks. I live on 14th Avenue North, uh, and this evening I'll be using my time to share the remarks from my friend and fellow community organizer, Edward Vogel. Here's what he has to say, and you might get some of this in your email as well, so look out for it. My name is Edward Vogel, and I live in District 33. I am here tonight asking the City Council not deploy license plate readers. I am a surveillance technology researcher, and I have dug into the realities of LPRs through public records requests from cities around the country who have contracts with Flock Safety and Vigilant Solutions. What these documents reveal should be troubling. First, Flock Safety offers a product called Talon to all of its customers free of charge. Talon is just an aggregation of the data from all of Flock's customers with a search function. What this means in practice is that a car can be followed from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., since Flock has more than 1,500 contracts across the country. That is terrifying. Second, in Vallejo, uh, California, not long after a contract was signed with Flock Safety, police officers were emailing with Flock representatives conspiring to change the data retention policy from 30 days to one year. Third, in Niles, Illinois, I received a video of a training session conducted by Flock showing police officers how to search for license plates while on patrol, not just letting the cameras identify cars on a hot list, but proactively entering license plate numbers to monitor where people have been. In Chicago, who contracts with Vigilant, we gathered evidence which shows that LPRs have had no impact on preventing theft, like the stealing of catalytic converters off of cars. Finally, these companies share very little data with their customers, which prevents any actual oversight or deep analysis regarding their effectiveness. Flock offers an online transparency portal for each customer, but they don't share the underlying data on the portals. This is nothing more than a PR move. These examples, not just hypotheticals, demonstrate that it's impossible to provide for proper oversight of these technologies. These companies have no business incentive to stop violence. The tools they sell are not designed to create safe communities because safety isn't profitable. Crime data is. Please vote no. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Krinks. Um, next speaker, name address, two minutes. My name is Melissa Cherry. I'm a lifelong Nashville resident and currently reside on Moorwood Drive in District 3. I want to thank the council members that voted for the legislation that required this public hearing. I'm here to speak in opposition to the purchase and deployment of license plate readers across Metro Nashville. Our community showed up for consistently for a whole year to explain why neither data nor experience support the claims that LPRs will make any of our daily lives safer. This technology utilizes what police departments call hot lists, which are entered manually, but broadcast across the country. 
MMPD's own mistakes have already shown the traumatic impact of incorrectly entered information. When they mistyped a license plate number, Antoinette Sala, a local woman, was accosted in a retail parking lot by armed M Mount Juliet police officers. She was given no apology or restoration, even after it was apparent that, as they quoted, quote, Nashville messed up again. Since conversations about the way MMPD's policies and actions harm our Nashville community restarted in 2017, they've killed more people each year. They've manipulated body camera footage. They've obst openly obstructed the Community Oversight Board and consistently escalated violence against residents that are, are unhoused and mentally ill. This leaves me with little faith that MMPD will react any differently or show regard the next time technology has a negative impact on our community. But consistently, you all have increased MMPD funding and expanded surveillance across with access without oversight. Most recently, their sighting of helicopters as a tool of de-escalation has allowed them an $8 million expenditure outside of the annual budget process. This council and our police department are highly unserious about our community's safety, much less our direct input. Mr. Chair, your uh, two minutes is up. Vote today as you will, and know that we'll get to vote next year. Uh, next speaker, name, address, two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Randy Hornick. I live at 220 Mockingbird Road. I'm not a lobbyist, I'm not paid to be here. One of my neighbors had a car stolen from her driveway. Others, including me, have had cars broken into. <clears throat> that is how I feel about what happened to them, and I speak, I speak to you as a close family member of two homicide victims. I feel worse that people have been deceived into believing they'll be safer once LPRs are approved. Of course, you already know that won't happen because LPRs won't go on every block or even in every neighborhood. But that combination of false promises and wishful thinking has been typical of this whole process. At a town meeting, I heard the DA's office misrepresent the case of the young nurse who was shot to death in her car. They implied the police were hamstrung by a lack of working cameras on I-440. The assistant DA conveniently failed to mention that the police solved the case quickly without cameras. We were assured LPR data would not be turned over to ICE officials, only to find out that's not exactly true. LPRs have been sold by some, as some kind of magical elixir for, cl for crime reduction. Not surprising, considering those making the greatest claims for them are the traveling salesmen hawking them like snake oil to city governments around the country. You can read all about it. <clears throat> Never mind that the actual track record of LPRs is less than stellar. That's well documented, too or that LPRs require we trust the police to abide by strict rules, some of which you've tried to put in place, even though experience with profiling, the shooting of unarmed citizens, and stonewalling the community oversight board shows us that the police regularly abuse tools and regularly flout rules they do not like. This council has a tendency to accept assurances that aren't credible, like that codes could enforce permits and, and behavior at Airbnb party houses. You saw how that turned out. Deep down, I think you know this is not the panacea that our neighbors have been led to believe. Please don't use our taxes to buy this pig in a poke. And I would like to thank Council Members Rosenberg and Mendez for their leadership on this and calling it out for what it is. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gracie. I live on Belcourt Avenue um, in District 18. And I'm here to encourage you all to vote no on this license plate reader bill today. You've heard um, a lot of my friends and colleagues talk about how the evidence does not support um, or justify the implementation of this policy. And I think all of you are very concerned, as a lot of national citizens are, about public safety, especially in an upcoming election year. And I would just urge you to think a bit more broadly about what public safety means. Um, thinking about investments in affordable housing and transportation and things that allow people to have access to community space and don't further surveil them and restrict their ability to live in these spaces to be. Nashville is becoming increasingly unaffordable and it's a pressure cooker environment. And 
adding license plate readers and incre increased surveillance technology is only turning up the heat in this area. And I would just really urge you all to think about how we can use public money to invest in things besides policing to increase the safety of our community members because people are hurting and license plate readers are not gonna help the people who are being harmed the most in this city. And so I would just urge you all to vote no and that's all I have to share with you tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next speaker. Good evening, my name is Jessica Marquez Munoz. I leave, live at 1811 7th Avenue North. Tonight you've heard lots of arguments for and against and many of them say that if you're not a criminal, you have nothing to hide. However, that's just not true. License plate readers and policies like this disproportionately affect black and brown and immigrant communities. The truth is that license plate readers treat everyone as prospective criminals and place our data at risk of being used for other purposes since it's collected on all vehicles and not just those that are hot listed. Moreover, studies do show that less than 0.2% of plate scans can be linked to criminal activity or vehicle registration issues. And I would like to echo that our dollars can be spent on better methods and better ways to prevent crime rather than be reactive with um, license plate readers. The excessive surveillance is not the answer to our public safety concerns. City, city leaders should work in partnership with the affected communities to develop community-informed approaches to effectively increase public safety. So I ask you to please vote no on resolution 2022-1883. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next speaker. Salaam alaikum. My name is Shana Ahmed. I am a Nashville native and my address is within the Antioch area. I was an MMPS graduate, a recent Vanderbilt graduate, and multiple other things, and my focus was in engineering policy and the intersection between the two. I come here urging to vote no on the implementation of LPR's pilot program in Nashville for multiple reasons. First, when this was brought to my attention, I did take the sweet time to go through numerous academic paperwork and trying to find the details of how it was within our council. And I will say I did not see clarification on what types of cameras, what kind of technology and things as such are going to be decided for our region. And delving even further into that, many of these cameras have maybe 20 to 40% margins of error, which can prove, as many people have stated before, many violent, harmful, and just long-term impacts to many people who might be falsely pulled over and hurt by the actions that these LPRs will put them through. Even further, something I have seen is going through the actual resolution is just the lack of clarification on the data side of things. Without having set data management, set data privacy, and multiple things as such, you open the doors for a lot of mismanagement. Uh, California audit does show the fact that in applying the system to multiple different areas, the fact that there was too much information at the same time, and that there was not enough people and manpower to be actually able to kind of clear up that information and like grow that information and kind of make sure that it is properly stored, assessed, and disposed of as stated beforehand, has shown strong levels of mismanagement in those areas and kind of has slowed down these systems within that. And even further, there is just the idea that there's a lack of communication of what those regulations are going to be. And to start off a system and a pilot program without that regulation doesn't prove you the ability to actually test whether or not it works. And finally, I wanna close with the fact that multiple papers have shown that this has no significant impact and many communities, even myself speaking on the behalf of part of the Muslim community are scared by it. So thank you so much and I urge you to vote now. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker. Assalamu alaikum, council members. My name is Kosad uh, and live in zip code 37211. I'm here today as a lifelong Nashvillian to urge the city council to vote no on resolution 2022-1883, uh, which would expand the use of LPRs. You've heard from many folks today um, on how harmful expanded surveillance is and how it will disproportionately target uh, black and brown communities, communities that have been historically uh, been on the receiving end of over-surveillance and over-policing. 
A vote in favor um, of expanded use will be music to the ears of ICE and other enforcement agencies that terrorize undocumented community members day in and day out with deportations, detentions, and separations of families. Uh, it only takes one traffic stop, one red light violation, one arrest for any of these things to happen. Instead of approving this cash grab uh, for corporations that pri prioritize profit over actual safety, let's invest in public goods such as affordable housing, transit, and our schools, especially during these times of economic upheaval in our city, state, and country. Uh, we don't want to be here a year from now telling you all we told you so. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak on this one? Uh, anybody else wishing to speak if you want to come forward? Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council. My name is Davey Tucker. I live at 610 Fatherland Street, 37206, and I'm also the Executive Director of the Metro Human Relations Commission. As you've heard, Turk, uh, but there are other organizations such as the No Exceptions, American Muslim Advisory Council, Stand Up Nashville, Nashville People's Budget Coalition, Casa de la Cultura, uh, open Table, Walk Back Nashville, Workers' Dignity, I can go on and on of organizations that represent marginalized people that are opposed to this legislation. On last night, <clears throat> the Metro Human Relations Commission voted unanimously to also oppose this legislation. These organizations and the people that they represent are not anti-police. They are hardworking, tax-paying citizens that happen to often live close to the margins. These organizations and the people are concerned about more police accountability and transparency. The effects of our current policing philosophy result in, by all measures, even MMPD's own data, it has a disproportionate negative impact on communities of color. Unless you believe that people of color are inherently prone for more criminality, someone must ask the question why. This disproportionate nature of our policing is either a result of biology or public policy. It's public policy. We all know that it is the latter. The COB was to bring accountability and transparency, but this has yet to materialize in and of itself. People are afraid of massive data collection relying on third-party agencies. Who, this technology has the ability to monitor targeted community members, can be used for deportations, but most of all, in equitable deployment. We all know that when this thing goes bad, we know which communities it will go bad with first, because the data already says that. Mr. Tucker, uh, your two minutes are up. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this? Seeing none, declare the public hearing closed. Councilman Roten, you're recognized. Thank you, move approval. All right, so um, there is a motion to approve, properly seconded back to you, Councilmember Roten. I'd like to move the amendment, please. Okay, so there is an amendment. Um, so uh, Councilmember Roten is moving an amendment to RS 2022, 1883, properly seconded back to you for an explanation. Of I the would amendment. defer to the administration to explain the amendment, please. All right, uh, Mr. Jamison. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The, uh, the amendment does two things. Uh, one, the RFQ originally attached, uh, when it's printed off, the software also adds unintentionally some computer code language that was not intended. It's interspersed throughout it. So uh, I want to thank uh, Michelle Lane at Procurement for uh, submitting a clean copy. So that's the main focus of the amendment. The second one is it does take the opportunity to specify that it is the police department as the department that's participating. Participating. Okay. All right. Back to you, Councilmember Roden. I renew my motion on the amendment. All right. So there's a motion to approve an amendment to RS 2022-1883. Again, properly seconded. Discussion. I've got a number of people in the queue on the amendment on the bill. Councilmember O'Connell on the amendment. Councilmember Rosenberg on the. Councilmember Young. Let me do it this way. Anybody on the amendment? 
Anybody on the amendment? <coughs> All right, uh, so there's a motion to approve the amendment RS 2022-1883. Um, it's been properly seconded. We're voting on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Amendments adopted. Councilman Roten, you're on your resolution as amended. I renew my motion on the resolution. Okay, so uh, now we've got a, a motion to approve RS 2022 1883 as amended, properly seconded. Now, Councilman Mendes, you're recognized. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Um, first, I want to say thank you to all the speakers on both sides for coming out tonight. Appreciate you taking the opportunity to share your thoughts with us. Um, second, I want to refer um, council members to a discussion that happened at Budget and Finance yesterday, and I don't, I don't, I don't think it's. I need to rehash the whole thing. But there was a discussion that um, part of the Metro Code since um, 2017 at 13.08.080 section D requires that for the pilot program to go forward, the council make a determination about three specific things that have to do with the cost benefit analysis, um, uh, safeguarding civil liberties, and um, whether what other alternatives might be. And uh, um, I, I would submit that the resolution before us does not purport in any way, shape, or form to make the required um, determinations and is fatally flawed. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna move for a deferral, um, but uh, it doesn't have the determinations required um, by the code that we passed in 2017. Um, you know, more to the point, um, uh, to me, and I'll keep it at this and not rehash stuff that I talked about earlier this year, um, the disproportionate impact on communities of color is a determinant factor for me in voting now, I think that outweighs the other benefits. I don't think if if this um, resolution had the determination language in it that's required, I don't think it. Um, I don't think we would meet it. Um, but I don't think it, so. Either way, it doesn't have the language, and on the merits, I don't think we're there. So, I'm going to vote now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Mendez. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Just. I want to share briefly that I had, since we passed the policy to let this go, I had money taken out of my bank account without my authorization after my license plate was misidentified by a license plate reader in a garage. I'm going to yield the balance of my time to Councilmember Sepulveda to make sure we get a minority perspective in here before the question gets called. Thank you. All right. Councilmember Sepulveda. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councilmember O'Connell. I just want to start off by thanking everyone who has made the time to be here tonight. And I wanna start off by addressing a couple of things. It has been stated that there was no need for a deferral since we are not close to the holidays and we have several items up on public hearing. I disagree with that. Colleagues, it is not any legislation and it is, it is not just any public hearing. Tonight we are talking about safety and surveillance of what could mean and what that could mean for marginalized groups. Some of you, understand this, some of you do not, and I wanna speak on my perspective. Organizing black and brown and immigrant people is hard. You have to translate everything and explain the legis and, and translate the legislation and even translate the legislative process sometimes. You might not understand that. Some communities only trust certain people from their own community and we have to reach out to them directly. Did you know it takes me twice as long as everyone here to write my newsletter? I have to translate everything. At community meetings, if someone attends who is not able to speak English, I have to translate, and that is just Spanish. I have had to rely on community members and Google Translate for anyone outside of my own community. So no, this is not enough time. No, it is not transparent. I honestly don't know what we are doing here. We are about to approve this without knowing who, will be, who we will be contracting with. Does that not sound alarming? Honestly, what are we doing here? The accuracy rate of hits is dangerous. It is inaccurate. That may not seem like a big deal to you, but when you look like me, when you look like some of the people here tonight, that can mean life or death. There have been black families put on the ground and held at gunpoint because of misreads. There have been immigrant families torn apart because ICE has stolen the has has sold ICE was sold the data and they have also subpoenaed it. Don't even get me started on privacy. 
There have been women stalked by abusers, people surveilled at their place of worship, people monitored at political rallies. This has all happened, and this is not a joke. This is what we are talking about. That is what the equipment has been used for. When this happens, it will be me and community members who are here to pick up the pieces, us, and that is exhausting. I am the youngest council member here and grew up on social media and the internet. This is dangerous equipment, dangerous, and we have no option of opting out. I will end my comments the way I have started and ended them all, from a quote from Sam Seaborn and exchanging one word. It is not about LPRs, it is about the next 20 years. In the, in the 20s, it was the 30s. In the 20s and the 30s, it was the role of government. 50s and 60s, it was civil rights. The next two decades are going to be privacy. I'm talking about the internet. I'm talking about cell phones. I'm talking about health records and who is gay and who is not. And moreover, in a country born on the will to be free, what could be more fundamental than this? Vote no. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Rosenberg. So um, typically I'd spend some time talking about the false promise of LPRs, the peer reviewed studies that conclude they don't reduce crime, the tales of abuse, the threat to personal security. They're basically the local government version of the border wall, ineffective red meat. But the LPR skeptics already know this, the cheerleaders' minds won't be changed, and those who are a little sketched but willing to give them a chance are willing to give them a chance. What this resolution is about, though, is council oversight. And the question before us is if we're going to exercise any or close our eyes and hope for the best. We don't know who the vendor will be. We haven't seen policies and procedures, and we have no idea how many of these things will be installed or how their locations will be determined. And there's literally no reason we need to pass this tonight. Procurement could keep working on an agreement prior to passage. MNPD could keep working on policies prior to passage. The administration could keep working on placement prior to passage. They just don't want to, because if we take the sucker's move and pass this tonight, they've got a blank check. They can do whatever they want for the next six months. These things all matter, but Paramount is the vendor because they're not all honest. One in particular we've been talking to shares all their data, all of it, with immigration enforcement, regardless of local policies, regardless of what the local police department wants, regardless of local policy and regardless of what the local police department wants. If we pass this, we'll just have to hope for the best. The Metro Code under legislation I sponsored says we must determine that, quote, the benefits to the citizens and residents of Nashville and Davidson County outweigh the costs, that the proposal will safeguard civil liberties and civil rights, and that in the judgment of the Metropolitan Council, no alternative with a lesser economic cost or impact upon civil rights or civil liberties will be as effective. We can't do that because we don't know the costs. No data have shown any benefits. We know civil liberties are frequently violated by LPR use regardless of policies, and no alternatives to LPRs have even been considered. But I guess the good news for those who want to pass this tonight is this resolution doesn't make that determination. So while we're not following the code, at least we're not making a fraudulent determination. Nevertheless, this resolution should be voted down. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Young. Previous question. Councilman Young has called the previous question. All right, so we're not voting on the resolution. We're simply voting on the previous question. All those in favor of the previous question say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Um, I think it's too close. Yeah, so we're on the board. All right, Mr. Clerk. And uh, the director is pulling out her, um, her sheet to make sure we uh, get the two thirds. Well, she's she already well she's looking for her sheet now she's got it have you got it okay all right Mr. Clerk uh, we'll be voting on the previous question Councilmember Toombs do you, oh ready. Uh, we are voting on the previous question, not on the resolution. If you're uh, in favor of the previous question, you'd vote aye. If you're opposed, you'd vote no. Mr. Clerk, open up the machines.
Switch PPP. Switch PPP. Switch PPP. Switch PPP. Switch PPP. Okay. Uh, everything's in except for Council Member Toombs is causing problems. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, while we're waiting, I believe we have 36 members present. Is that right? Okay. If we have to, we're gonna wait here all night for the machine to get fixed. It's two-thirds of it. Right, I think that's right. <laughs> All right, um, since everybody's vote is gonna be up on the board, Councilmember Toombs, do you mind just telling us which way you're voting? Aye, okay. Mr. Clark, can you somehow put that in the machine? Okay, everything's ready. Mr. Clark, close the machines, take the vote. There's uh, nays uh, 12, ayes 24, two thirds. Okay, so the previous question prevails, right? Um, all right, so we are now voting on the resolution. All right, so uh, the motion is to approve RS 2022-1883 as amended uh, for passage um, uh, because I believe there's gonna be no votes. Uh, we're back on the board, Mr. Clark. If you can, tell me when you're ready. All right, so we are voting on um, uh, passage. The motion is to approve RS 2022-1883 as amended, um, again, for passage, which, uh, proper motion, proper second. Um, so uh, we're on the board. If you wanna vote for it, you'd vote aye. If you're against it, you'd vote no. Mr. Clerk, open up the machines. Tombs, if you don't mind um, voting. Um, it's gonna show up on the board anyway. You're voting no? Okay. So Ms. Tombs votes no. Mr. Clark, can you put that in? Okay, close the machines, take the vote. Eyes 22, nose 13, one abstention. Uh, the RS 2022-1883 as amended passes, right? Um, we will now go on to uh, bills on public hearing. Before we get there though, uh, Council Member Taylor, you're recognized. Thank you. So there is a bill tonight that won't be heard, it'd be deferred on public hearing. And so uh, we've got a lot of public hearing items here. So if you're here for bill, Bill 2022-1570, Bill 2022-1570. Um, it's that's it's the, item 44. Item 44 your... in our calendar. If that's the only reason you're here, um, you can leave, but we'd love for you to stay with us tonight as we continue to deliberate many, many important items. So um, so uh, go ahead, What's the? you're just gonna move to defer this bill? Yes. Okay. If, if you want to do it now, the bill in front of Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to move to defer BL 2022-1570 uh, to the first meeting in January. Okay. So the motion is to defer uh, BL 2022-1570 to the first meeting in January. It's item number 44, properly seconded. Any discussion on the deferral? Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral say aye. Opposed, nope. This one's deferred. Uh, thank you for doing that. All right, so we're back on bills on public hearing. We are now on item number. Councilmember Hancock, you're recognized. 
Thank you so much. Um, I think that was a great idea, Councilman Taylor, and I would like to do the same if there's no opposition. Item number 15, Bill 2022-1525, has to be deferred to the first meeting in January because there was a lack of proper public notice. Okay, so uh, Council Member Hancock is uh, on item number 15, Bill 2022-1525, for lack of notice. Um, she is also moving this one to defer to the first public meeting in January. Yes. So there will be a public hearing on January 3rd. All right. Um, okay. So, so we've got other ones. This is um, actually probably not a bad thing to do because we clear off a lot of the stuff, but we're doing this piecemeal. Um, I'm looking at the director. Do you want me to read the caption? Okay. All right. I didn't do it on his. Okay, so I'm going to read the caption, and then uh, because there was no notices, it would automatically go over. But it's item number 15, Bill 2022-1525, uh, an ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from RS 7.5 R20 zoning for property located at 313 Delaware Avenue. It's approximately 130 feet north of Burwood Avenue. It's 0.45 acres. Councilmember Hancock, there were no notices, so it's automatically deferred to the first meeting in January. Okay. Okay, Councilmember Van Rees, you're recognized. Yes, I'd like to also defer uh, to the first meeting in January, item number 32, BL 2022-1558. Okay, do you want to do both that and number? And the 33, yes. Okay. Yeah, All right, so we'll take 32 and 33 together. <laughs> BL 2022-1558, and one is to amend title 17 by changing by RS 10. To SP zoning on a portion of property located at 3300 and 3344 Walton. Property is located at 3302, 3304, 3306, 3308, 3312. Walton Lane and Walton Lane are numbered. It's approximately 211 feet west of Slate Drive. And the companion bill is BL 2022-1558. 1559 ordinance to authorize building material restrictions and requirements for BL 2022 1558, a proposed specific plan zoning district. Uh, proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Councilmember Van Rees, uh, you want to defer this to the first meeting in January? Yes, sir. All right, so it's a deferral motion properly seconded on both 1558 and 1559. Um, again, properly seconded. Councilmember Allen on this. Okay, let me get let me get this one done. This is just a motion to defer both 1558 and 1559 to the first meeting in January. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Those two are deferred to the first meeting in January. Councilmember Allen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move to defer BL 2022-1483. That's item nine also to the first meeting in January okay. and its companion 1484. And its companion bill. Okay, so we're on item number nine and item number 10, BL 2022, 1483 by Council Member Sledge and Allen, ordinance to amend title 17. By Chenchim I, R to SP zoning on property located at 426, 446, and 464 Chestnut Street. Chestnut Street unnumbered, approximately 243 feet north of Barton Street. And the companion bill, BL 2022, 1484, it's item number 10, um, an ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requiring for BL 2022-1483. Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Councilmember Allen has moved deferral of both those bills, 1483 and 1484, to the first meeting in January. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, those are deferred to the first meeting in January. Okay, anything else that needs to be deferred? Councilmember Toombs. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, number seven, I need to defer that to the um, first meeting in February. Okay, there's a companion bill number eight. Yeah, and the number eight as well. Okay, okay. Okay, let me read the captions. Uh, BL 2022-1481, ordinance to amend Title 17 by amending specific plan on various properties located southeast of Buena Vista Pike, intersection of Buena Vista Pike and Cliff Drive, approximately 179 feet west of Crook Avenue, zone R8 and SP to add an additional parcel to the existing specific plan. And then the companion bill, which is item number eight, BL 2022-1482 by Council Member Toombs, ordinance to, to authorize building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022-1481, proposed specific plan zoning district, Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Council Member Toombs has moved both of those bills to the first meeting in February. Properly seconded. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
Those two are deferred to the first meeting in February. Then I also have number 25. Okay, and then item number 25. I would like to move to defer that one to the first meeting in January. There were no notices. Okay, so that's an automatic deferral. It's BL 2022-1551. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from CL to SP zoning on property located at 1603 and 1605 Hampton Street, in the corner of Hampton Street and Avondale Circle. That one's an automatic deferral to the first meeting in January. Okay, anybody else? Council Member Benedict. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I didn't catch all of those, so as I mark my agenda, can you run through the agenda number uh, for each one of those? Uh, Just yeah, so I you can want me follow do it, along. You want me to do it now, or I'll do it as I get through it, and I'll tell you that we did it. Um, I've got some folks that left that want to be here for their public hearing, but they left because they thought that they were in a certain place in the queue that now has changed because I think four things in okay. front of them. So I just want to make sure okay. that I, I understand what's just what numbers. Okay, okay. Let, me go, let me go through them. I'm sorry to ask that, but I That's appreciate okay. it. That's all right. So um, uh, we're gonna start with bills on public hearing. Item two is still on. Uh, item three is still on. Four and five are still on. Six is still on. Uh, item seven um, has been taken care of. Item eight has been taken care of. Item nine and item 10 have been taken care of. Item 15 has been taken care of. Item 25 has been taken care of. Item 32 and items 33 have been taken care of. And item 44 has been taken care of. It's on page 19 of my calendar. Good. Anybody else? It's not a bad idea to try to do that at the beginning. We may start doing that. So anyway, entire agenda that way. All right. <coughs> we're going to work on that. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, we're on item number two, BL 2022-1152 by Councilmember O'Connell. It's an ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from IWD to MULA zoning for property located at 897 Elm Hill Pike, approximately 430 uh, feet east of Fester's Lane. Councilmember O'Connell, I don't think notices come, came out with this one. Oh, again? I thought we were good to go today. I didn't see a... Can we get confirmation from planning? Yep. Ms. Milligan? Okay. Um, confirmed notices were not returned. Okay. Uh, well, then I guess we will defer this one as well. All right, so Councilman McConnell, this one goes to the first meeting in um, January. It's an ordinance to him in Title 17 by, oh, I've already read it, I think. Maybe I didn't. Uh, I'll read it again by change from IWD to MLA zoning for property located at 897 Elm Hill Pike, approximately 430 feet east of Fester's Lane. Yeah, no notices, so it'll be uh, heard on the first meeting in January. Item number three, Bill 2022-1371 by Council Member Swope. It's a disapproved bill, ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code by change from AR2A to CS property located 6663 Nolensville Pike, approximately 375 feet northwest of Concord Hills Drive. It's three acres. Council Member Swope, you're recognized. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't believe there's any committee reports to be had, so I would uh, move to open the public hearing. Okay, um, I think we need to have slides. Ms. Milligan? Oh, sorry. Uh, BL 2022-1371. This is a request to rezone from AR2A to CS for a property located on the south side of Nolensville Bike. Planning Commission recommendation was to disapprove. The property is currently zoned AR2A, which is agricultural residential, and the proposed zoning is CS Commercial Service. 
The land use policy for the property is a small bit of T3 suburban neighborhood evolving along the Nolensville Pike frontage and the remainder of the property is located within conservation policy. The conservation recognizing the presence of floodplain on the property. Um, the property across, from, across the street on Nolensville Pike is within a more intense policy. However, the policies on this site are uh, residential only and um, intended to preserve the sensitive conservation features. Uh, given that given that this rezoning would allow for uses that are not supported by the policy, staff recommend, or, sorry, planning commission recommendation was to disapprove. Okay, thank you, Ms. Milligan. Um, Council Member Swope, you recognized. Now let's open the public hearing. All right, uh, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Okay, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Okay, I got hands on both sides. Um, those in favor wishing to speak, come on forward. Uh, name, address, and then you'll have two minutes in which to speak. Hey, Twanachick, 5967 Cambridge Road. I used to live almost across the street with, from this. I'm really familiar with what area floods, and the only place that doesn't flood is where the existing structure is, and that's what this property owner is asking to utilize. I'm really quick to come up here and fuss when something is not meeting community standards. So I wanna point out on this one that we brought up um, that the there was trash in the creek, and I mean lots of trash. They got truckload, truck bed loads of trash out of the creek. They're also working with uh, Mill Creek Greenway and others to see what to do about the invasives along the creek bank. They've agreed to not build anything addition, just to use an existing structure to repurpose it. Um, so I just have to acknowledge that sometimes there's good conversations and things go well and it works out for everybody. Um, we need to start doing more of that when things are going right so y'all hear what's going right. If every property owner, every developer cleaned up their little slice, we'd be in such better shape. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chick. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this one? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor at 5317 Overton Road. I'll be really quick. Uh, this is my client. As Tawana just said, we did meet with the, uh, the community. Um, the owner of the property did all those things. Um, he, he pulled a lot of trash out. He's committed to making it a better property. He just simply wants to use the property for his specific small business use, which is addressed in Council Member Swope's substitute bill that you'll be seeing hopefully momentarily. Um, I thank you for your support. All right. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Anybody else wishing to be heard in favor of this measure? All right. Uh, those opposed, if you want to come forward. Okay. It's good. All right. Anybody else? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Council Member Swope, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, I'd like to move a substitute on this, which basically changes this from moving it from AR2A to commercial zoning. Rather, this substitute basically changes the AR2A to an SP zoning, um, specifically permitting the use of small appliance repair. Um, as Twana said, and as the client has said here, it, this area, uh, this, this three acres is probably 95% floodplain. Um, and the owners of the property have done an amazing job of cleaning it all up. This sits next to Kroger. Um, which is the reason for the original commercial zone request. Um, but everybody's happy with, and I think Dwan is happy with, and the Mill Creek people are happy with, and the Cane Ridge people are happy with, simply changing this to an SP to permit a small appliance repair shop in an existing space. So on that, I would move the substitute. All right, so Council Member Swope has moved the substitute on bill 2022-1371, and he's providing an explanation of it, uh, properly seconded. Any questions on the substitute? Council Member Zawara, recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Just a question, and it's a procedural thing. Uh, is changing the uh, classification after the airing, does that warrant another one, or will the people know that? the classification is changed after the public hearing is closed. No, the base zoning doesn't change on this, ever. It's still gonna stay AR2A. AR2A. 
So Councilor, uh, Council Member Swore, I think, were you asking whether there was another public hearing on this because of the change? Yes. Okay, I, I don't think so. No. All right, so it stays the same. Yep. All right. All right. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. All right. Um, anybody else with questions? Okay, we are on a, the substitute. All right. Uh, all in favor of the substitute say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Substitute's passed. Uh, Council Member um, Swope, you are on your bill as substituted for passage on second reading. And I would move 1371 as substituted. Okay, for passage on second reading, properly seconded. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, all those in favor of BL 2022-1371 as substituted for passage on second reading, say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, bill passes on second reading. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Uh, we're on item number four, uh, BL 2022-1432 by Council Member O'Connell, which can be taken with item number six, uh, which is 1479. 1432, an ordinance to amend Title 17 by applying an historic, uh, historic landmark overlay district on property located at 230 Representative John Lewis Way North and 223 Fourth Avenue North. It's 130 feet south of Union Street, zone DTC, and within the Capitol Mall Redevelopment District. And the companion bill, which is BL 2022-1472, 1479 also by council member o'connell in ordinance to authorize building material restrictions and requirements for item item number bl 2022 1432 uh, proposed ordinance requires certain materials to restrict in the construction of buildings council member o'connell you recognize thank you mr president I'd like to open the public hearing please uh, council member o'connell i believe there's a problem with this bill miss milligan oh dear <laughs> Um, yes. So this item, these, these, this item was actually withdrawn from consideration at the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, and so it has not appeared at the Planning Commission, uh. and notices have not gone out. And so we have withdrawn this item at the Planning Commission, given the withdrawal at the Historic Zoning Commission, which is a requirement. I, all right. In which case, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to defer this indefinitely. Okay, so the motion is to defer uh, both items, 1432 and 1479 indefinitely, properly seconded. Discussion? Okay. Seeing none, we're on deferral motion and uh, uh, motion to defer indefinitely. Those two bills, 1432 and 1479. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, those two are deferred indefinitely. Councilmember O'Connell, I can hear out of my left ear when Miss Milligan says things, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, we're on item number five, BL 2022-1471 by Councilmember Parker. This is an ordinance to amend section 16.24.030 and 17.04.060 of the mm -hmm. Metropolitan Code of Laws to amend the definition of families. Councilmember Parker, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I'd like to defer this to the... Uh, uh, the public hearing in January with a brief explanation, please. All right, so the motion is to defer to the first meeting in January, properly seconded, back to you. Thank you, so um, this bill, I've been working with uh, both codes and planning on a substitute. That substitute's gonna be before the Planning Commission. It's scheduled for this Thursday the 8th, so um, we wanted to give the Planning Commission the opportunity to um, weigh in on that substitute before we brought it to the Metro Council, so that's what we're doing here. All right, uh, the motion is to defer to the first meeting in January, again, properly seconded. Any discussion on this one? We're on a deferral motion. Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. This one's deferred to the first meeting in January. Thank you, council member. Uh, items number six has been taken care of. Item number seven has been taken care of. Eight has been taken care of. Nine has been taken care of. 10 has been taken care of. We're on item number 11. Uh, which can be taken with item number 12 by Council Member O'Connell, Bill 2022-1490 in ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing OR20 SP zoning for property located at 1622 Rosedale Parks Boulevard, southeast corner of Garfield Street and Rosedale Parks Boulevard uh, to permit 95 multifamily residential units and institutional uses. And then item number 12, BL 2022-1491 by O'Connell, an ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022-1490. Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Councilmember O'Connell, you're recognized on those two bills. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. Okay, declare the public hearing open on those two bills, one 1490 and 1491. Show of hands of those who are here in favor of those two bills. Okay, got a lot of hands up. Show of hands 
of those who are here in opposition to those two bills. All right, so we have hands on both sides. Uh, for those who would like to speak in favor, if you would come on forward. I need uh, your uh, name, address, and then you'll have two minutes in which to speak. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks for thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, appreciate all your time and work that goes into the job that you do. I'm Mick Nelson, 618 Bosco Bell Street in uh, East Nashville. Um, I am an affordable housing developer, as many of you know, also an affordable housing advocate. Um, I had the honor of serving on the Mayor's Affordable Housing Task Force as the co-chair and um, co-developing this project with Inspiritus. Um, if you've been part of conversations about Nashville's housing crisis over the last several years, you hear things about uh, there's a lot of underutilized faith-based faith organization-owned land throughout Nashville that would be great to put into the housing supply and opportunities to do that. You've also heard that it'd be great to have housing close to downtown in amenity-rich neighborhoods um, on transit corridors. And also you've heard it'd be great to have those developments have social so services housed within them so that the residents who live there and those in the surrounding neighborhoods could take advantage of those social services. And what I'm really excited to share with you guys tonight is that because of the generosity of the Lutheran Church, support of the Barnes Fund, and we thank you for your support in voting in that last April, and the dedication of, uh, of the owner in Spiritus, that we're prepared to make that happen here on Rosa Parks. What we're asking for you tonight and for your support on is rezoning this property so that it is in line with the, the vast majority of the other parcels along Rosa Parks between Buchanan and Jefferson Street. So I kindly ask you for your support tonight and thank you for all your good work. All right, thank you. Next speaker, name, address, two minutes. Good evening. I'm John Moeller, uh, 1628 Rosa Parks Boulevard. I'm the president and CEO of Inspiritus, and I am delighted to be able to tell you a little bit about the work that we do. For over 100 years, this organization and its preceding organization has been invested in the state of Tennessee, providing life-giving uh, social services uh, to the residents of this great state. And we look forward to uh, continuing the legacy of the church that was there for 90 years. We made a commitment to the congregation and to the denomination that we would continue to offer services in that community, on that site, uh, to low-income individuals here in Nashville. Uh, those services, uh, we've spent the last 12 years listening to the community, and today, those commu uh, as a result, we are now offering one of the busiest food, second harvest food pantries in the city on that site. Uh, listening to the residents, we've also had the good opportunity of uh, adding about 200 raised bed gardens in public and assisted living um, uh, facilities across the city. We have a youth art therapy program. All those programs that we operate today will grow and be able to operate on the ground floor. But as we listen to the residents in the neighborhood, uh, they continue to feel squeezed out and we are listening to them to make sure that they continue to have a, a healthy place to, uh, to live and uh, to be a grandparent and the housing that we're looking forward to offering in that space um, is affordable housing for seniors and adults with disabilities. Um, so we are profoundly committed to this neighborhood, to this community, and to our church body that has given us this profound opportunity to serve. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker, name, address, two minutes. Hi, council members. My name is Sheila Dial Barton. I live in council uh, in District 25. I wrote this down so I'll be concise. I'm speaking in favor of the rezoning of the parcel at Rosa Parks for preliminary SP for many reasons. Uh, I've lived in Nashville for over 25 years. And during that time, uh, the entire duration, I've worked as an architect for both nonprofit and for-profit developers to provide a mixture of housing options for Nashvillians. As many know, Nashville and our nation are experiencing a housing crisis, but more specifically, an affordable housing crisis. Um, this project provides housing for seniors that are low income uh, when so many of other projects in Nashville are unable to do so for many reasons. Uh, affordability aside, the Nashville Planning Department's community character policy encourages and has recommended approval of the proposed density, height, and setbacks for this specific site for many reasons, including density is encouraged along Rosa Parks Boulevard. The project
project is located on a motel, motel, multimodal corridor. Um, and the project is within walking distance of a grocery store and many neighborhood amenities, which we know is vital to seniors uh, for these amenities. In summary, this project is a shining example of good placement in our city, a nonprofit developer wanting to provide affordable housing for seniors, and a great partnership with the Barnes Fund. Thank you for your consideration, and I ask for your approval on this rezone. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Beth Ostrowski. I'm a professional engineer, um, traffic engineer with KCI Technologies. I live at 5539 Knob Road. Um, this project actually does not generate enough trips to warrant a traffic impact study at this time. However, due to some questions from the neighborhood, we were brought on to assist and, and answer some questions. Um, some of the comments that I expect that you'll hear in just a minute involve the trip generation and the traffic impact for this site which I believe will be negligible. Um, a traffic impact study will be completed with this project at the final SP phase. Um, it is not complete at this time, but per conditions it will be completed later. Um, a, th a few important things to note regarding traffic. Access is going to be provided not along Rosa Parks, but instead along the alley in particular. The alley is going to be widened associated with this project um, two and a half feet onto the side of the development. Um, also the development will be building parking to meet its demand. That demand is going to be determined based on the age of the residents, the income level of the residents, access to transit, proximity to the urban core, availability of sidewalks, and nearby services. Um, that, that parking will be set up to prepare the development to be successful. The development wants to be successful and it plans to provide parking to match its needs. Um, and just to reiterate one last time, um, the TIS will be completed with final SP. Uh, please vote yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. I'm Kay Bowers and I live at 4033 Albert Drive in Nashville. And I'm co-chair of NOAA's Affordable Housing Task Force. A zoning change for the property at 1622 Rosa Parks Boulevard, owned by Inspiritus, formerly Lutheran Services, will pave the way to provide up to 95 units of affordable rental housing for seniors. And most importantly, it provides for the continuing continuation of important community service programs that have been operating in the community for decades. According to statistics from AgeWell, 53% of our 65 plus population who are renters are cost burden. Over 28,000 older Nashvillians live below the median household income for seniors at $49,000. Historic African-American congregations in North Nashville tell us that their members who have lived near their churches for decades continue to be pushed out, and many of them are renters. This senior affordable housing project provides an opportunity for seniors on very low incomes to be able to remain a part of the community to have public transportation just outside their doors and be close to the services that they rely on. The Planning Commission has appro approved the request with conditions. The Barnes Fund has awarded Inspiritus grant funding and tax credit financing plans are in, pl in progress. Many of us in, with NOAA working with others in the community have had conversations with many of our faith-based uh, congregations who really want to find a way to use the resources they have to help provide for affordable housing needs in Nashville. Recently, we had a summit called Built on Faith. Over 100 plus people attended that and now we have some things in the works and conversations are going. So we want to tell you this is very important and it's not being done with someone new. The Lutherans have been here for over 100 plus years. So they know us and they are our community. So I'm excited to be able to ask you to please vote yes on the zoning request. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. 
Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Derek Lyle. I live at 1625 Fifth Avenue North. I live two blocks behind the proposed development. I own other property in Salem Town uh, where I'm working on a townhome development. And it's safe to say I'm heavily invested in this neighborhood, uh, personally and professionally. Uh, I'm here tonight to tell you I am unequivocally in support of this development. Nashville needs housing units of all types, but Nashville desperately needs affordable housing. This property is located on a major thoroughfare inside the downtown loop with incredible access to the rest of the city. Nashville Next, the planning staff and the planning commission have all said that this property is deserving of density. I'm asking this council to affirm that as well. If not on this property, then where? If not in this neighborhood, which neighborhood? Some neighbors will tell you that they're supportive of affordable housing, but are more concerned about their personal investments in their own homes. Let me remind you that this neighborhood was affordable long before it was filled with million dollar homes, and that the women's mission has been here since well before many of them, and it hasn't stopped property values from going up. Let us remember that this isn't just a neighborhood for new newcomers who wanna shut the door behind them. This has been and should remain a neighborhood for all people of all backgrounds and all income levels. Shouldn't the folks that grew up in this neighborhood and raised families in this neighborhood be allowed to grow old in this neighborhood as well? even if they can't afford a million dollar request. So again, I'm saying yes in my backyard and asking you to support this zoning request. All right, thank you. Next speaker, name address, two minutes. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Sam Warlick, I live at 508 Madison Street. Uh, I'm not gonna give a resume because I'm not part of the project team or anything, but I live down the street from this project. I've been to the community meetings. Uh, I think it's incredible. I think it's like so cool and beautiful that we get to do this, to have this church in a changing neighborhood that loses their congregation and for them to make it their vision to build something there that continues their mission. And it comes to be almost 100 units of affordable housing for seniors and the disabled, I think is incredible. I mean, what drew me to the neighborhood to begin with was that it was a diverse place, a walkable place, uh, a place that represented every side of Nashville. And I think neighborhoods lose that when we don't do anything to ensure that people can stay where they live, where they grew up. I think the fact that we get an opportunity, that you get an opportunity to vote on this and ensure that people of all stripes, of all backgrounds can stay in this neighborhood is truly amazing. I also wanna shout out Council Member O'Connor, my council, O'Connell, my council member, who has done an incredible job with the conversation and the community on this. Yeah, that's a little, it's nice. Uh, I just think it's awesome. I think that this is a vote you can be incredibly proud of. I think it's the best vote you'll take tonight. Unequivocally ask for your support. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, I'm Janet Arning. I'm the executive director of Empowerment Services at Inspiritus. As a native Nashvilleian born to a much different Nashville, I understand those who will come to the mic tonight uh, in opposition. And while I understand, I do not agree. I've spent the last 32 years working in nonprofits in Nashville for those who sometimes find themselves in need of a little help. I've had the privilege to walk with our neighbors in North Nashville to get to know them and their families to help when I could and listen when I couldn't. I've been on the front row seats of the struggles and joys of our neighbors living in MDHA's Cheatham Place community and beyond. On this site we want to redevelop, we've gathered each week since 2010 with women in the community to break the bonds of isolation, to break bread together, to learn from one another. It's a multi-generational support community for women. It's rare in this neighborhood and it's a light for many. We partner with MDHA to provide individualized raised bed gardens so families could grow their own nutritious food. We've, we've exposed youth in the community to the art making process, all the while processing feelings and emotions to create resiliency in the youth in this community. We have run one of the largest food pantries in partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank, employing and empowering people from Cheatham Place to have a say in how services are delivered. And all the while, I've seen those unhoused in the community increase. We've seen the alley behind us be developed from a crack house to a million dollar house. We have seen the mission and the opposite corner be redeveloped, and all of this is good. It means our city's thriving, but it also means those who have called North Nashville their home are no longer able to afford to live there. 
While all the new growth is good, we must not leave our most vulnerable neighbors behind. We must make space to them, and in spirit us, we have the will, we have the vision, and we have the energy to do it. We ask that you approve for this rezoning for seniors and those with dis disabilities who will be able to continue called North Nashville home. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Evening. My name is Angela Weiss, and I live at 1540 Delta Avenue, which is Cheatham Apartments. Uh, I am now a resident here of Nashville from Mississippi, and I moved here and um, joined the group, the ladies group, and they have done wonderful things for our community. Uh, a place that I can call home, uh, and they are my family now. I have no family here. And I'm asking you to say yes to the, the rezoning because me, I will be one of those patrons at, you know, at this community. Uh, I would not only that I be a citizen, senior citizen, but I'm also disabled. And so it would be a, another blessing for me if you all approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Gloria Olive. I live at 1536 Delta Avenue, which is Cheatham Apartment. And uh, I've been around with in spiritual and Lutheran service for 11 years. And I see the changes that they haven't really made. I also work at the food bank and I see people coming in they work and then they complain about struggling with housing, you know. So I wish y'all would really just support the people in what they are trying to do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next speaker. How you doing? My name is Samuel Davis, and I live at 1558 Delta Avenue, which is Cheatham Place. And I, you know, ride the bus every day. And I run into homeless people every day, and they tell me they need somewhere to stay. They talking, and people are not really listening. It's really a sad situation. I've been in Nashville 30 years, and I've seen the growth. I've seen the good and the bad. I've seen people get put out of their place because they didn't have money to pay their rent. And I'm saying we need to get more affordable housing. The Spirits is a good place. I've been dealing with Miss Janet now about 10 years and she's a good person she do a lot of great things we need affordable housing because nashville is one of these places where everybody's coming here and they're looking at nashville if you don't have housing for the people to stay where they gonna stay at everybody needs somewhere to stay black white if they get us straight we need somewhere to stay and that's real that's what we need and i think this and i'm gonna say this and make you think about it god gave us help so we can have somewhere to stay when we die he gave us all that we ain't got to pay a dime why we got to do live for him I'm not telling nobody what the Bible say or not say, but we all need affordable housing because it's really that situation you got affordable. I mean, inflation is real bad now. It's really rough, and we need for people to pass this on it. And that's all I want to say. All right. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Bill Gittens, and I live at 1204 Rock Creek Trace. I have volunteered at this Inspirited site when it was a breakfast program, and I'm still volunteering uh, at their food bank. This site is to be utilized as affordable housing for senior citizens and disabled people. The neighborhood is being gentrified, and affordable housing is at a premium. This project is needed and will be an example of diversity, which is the strength of this city. I ask for approval of this zoning change. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, uh, Rick Roberts, uh, pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church. And I don't think I can say anything more than all the other people have been saying about the need for affordable housing. I just want to... Pastor, you may want to pick up the microphone. Move this up? Yeah. Well, okay. Can we start over? Uh, you can start over. No. 
Rick Roberts, pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church in the Donaldson community. And I don't think I can say anything more eloquent than everybody else has already said about the importance of affordable housing in our city. What I'd like to speak to just very briefly in favor of this motion um, is what in spiritus, what the ministries at St. Paul Lutheran Church over the last 20 years that I've been here has made such an impact on my life, you know, and in the lives of many people uh, in our Lutheran community and in our Nashville community. And um, they've been a beacon, you know, of light and hope for so many people. And this, this new project could, could continue to let that light of, of God shine to give people more hope and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Jeff Zeitlin. I live in the community and I also build in the community. And I am so proud of Freddie and, our, and the neighborhood for uh, having the opportunity to do affordable housing uh, that we have lost in the neighborhood. I want to talk about the people that are getting, going to get ready to talk against the project. Most of those people are not against the idea of the project. There's just uh, answers that are reasonable answers to be uh, understood that are still need to be addressed. So whether it's def this project is deferred or whether we continue through third reading between now and then, we just ask the church and the community to continue the dialogue so that this can be a model of how we can create affordable housing in Nashville and everybody work together to solve a problem. And I'm, I'm just proud of the community of, of what we're doing and thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. My name is Edward Henley. Um, I'm at 1208 Third Avenue South. Um, we started off the, the um, comments of those speaking in forward with one co-chair of the Affordable Housing Task Force. I'm the other co-chair. I'm very proud to be standing before you. Also just wanted to um, extend my support for this project. I think it's a great example of what happens when um, the collection of all of, of a community comes together, uh, multiple levels, institutions, individuals, um, and practitioners come together to lend their, to lend what they have to a project that ultimately serves the things that we need in our community. I think the um, Barnes Fund already putting forward funds for this. I think we have an opportunity this evening to um, further what the Planning Commission has approved and ultimately do what we should as a city, showing that our collective support for affordable housing, especially those that are most in need, um, is exemplified by projects like these. And I think it's going to be a great beacon, um, a great testament to what our city can do um, in addressing this challenge. And so I hope you all will support this project this evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next speaker. I am Pastor Ann Bassett, and I have been a volunteer with Inspiritus for longer than I can remember, and it has been my joy and my duty to be a part of that program. It helps um, women and their families go from surviving to thriving. The fact that many of the, the residents of Cheatham Place were able to come here and had the courage to speak in favor of this and to address you just shows you the impact Inspiritus is having in this community. This is a program that helps, um, feeds people physically, but it also feeds them emotionally and spiritually as well, to the point where they're not just only surviving, but they are thriving, and then they become co contributing members of their community. They're now volunteering at the food bank that's there on the site. Um, they're supporting each other in all sorts of adversities that they may experience in various parts of their lives. And so I, too, do want to encourage you to pass this and to develop affordable housing for this community and to support Inspiritus and the wonderful work that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak in favor? Okay. Uh, those who are opposed, if you'd come on up. Thank you for... Uh putting this on and letting us have a chance. My name is Andy Frere. I live at 1724 4th Avenue North. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit on behalf of the Salem Town Neighborhood Association, which I'm a member of and have been participating in the meetings with the developers. Um, as we have communicated to Inspiritus, 
uh, with all the opinions and, and perspectives we've heard, there isn't a single person in our neighborhood that doesn't believe that Inspiritus has a strong mission with a meaningful purpose. Um, they are clearly well uh, respected, large organization based out of Atlanta and have grown uh, to that by providing value in communities they serve. We think they could make a meaningful impact and better visibility and edits to the existing uh, preliminary SP need to be made. Uh, when you deferred the SP from being presented at the November hearing after attending the first meeting they hosted, Inspiritus was tasked with providing neighborhood with more details. They have not supplied any uh, of those details that to alleviate the neighborhood's concerns. Those boil down to two things. One, increasing the density from 14 units to 95 units, and two, increasing the mass sizing to approximately 90 feet total, 75 feet at the street, six stories tall. Salem Town neighborhood has a 35 foot maximum. Property to the south is one story, property to the east is one story, property to the west is two stories, and property to the north is three stories. At the conclusion of our meeting yesterday, a motion was passed by the members of the Salem Town Neighborhood uh, Neighbors Association um, to send you a collective statement as, as, as a neighborhood of roughly 25 people that attended. All but one uh, chose to uh, voted uh, in favor of this. And what we're asking for is, uh, we feel that uh, we've made repeated attempts at, uh, to see conceptualized and or mass drawings to better visualize our concerns and that the Neighborhood Association is not in favor of this project. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wishing to be heard? Okay. Declare the public hearing closed. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move approval of brief comment. All right, so there's a motion to approve. It's uh, 1490 and 1491 together. Properly seconded, back to you. Thank you, and I appreciate the priors for being here and uh, um, the community conversation has been um, more intense than I think uh, was maybe represented in public hearing. This is my neighborhood. I've been there for 15 years, uh, and I did want to just briefly read um, the statement from the letter. I know Derek Hovel, who is the president of the Salem Town Neighbors Neighborhood Association, couldn't be here this evening, and I told him I'd read this. It says, Salem Town Neighbors Neighborhood Association feels we've made repeated requests to see conceptualization and or massing drawings to better visualize our concerns above. SNNA is not in favor of this project. So. This is tough. I'd like to get to the point where <clears throat> my own neighbors, um, many of whom are new, many of whom are, have been there a long time, uh, come to a better consensus around this because I think you've heard about the importance of the project. Um, you know, I live here, our family walks by this location on a regular basis, we drive by this location on a regular basis, and I have been a transit user uh, right in front of this location uh, for years. And I think it is the appropriate place, but I think we do have um, some open questions. I know the project team has committed to uh, several changes uh, that are conditions that should be applied by third reading, and I think that's one of the challenges is this process is new to some people. The tool that they pursued to get to this um, rezoning request is a regulatory SP, which means it's kind of like, hey, we're asking the community, can we do you know, five to six stories and 80 to 95 units here, and um, there's not a lot of visualization of that. So there's a kind of a rough site plan, and I think there's a lot of interest in the neighborhood and um, something that feels a little more visual, uh, like we often see by the time you get to a final SP. So we're gonna continue working on that. I have already requested that we do another community meeting between now and third reading. And I know there are several conditions that will speak to the period that might occur between if the bill passes and a final SP that would happen later next year. So we've got more work to do. I'm committed to doing that work and hope that by the time we get this approved, we've got more answers in hand and more support uh, along with it. So appreciate people's support tonight. And we're gonna keep working on it, thank you. All right, so Council Member O'Connell has moved passage of uh, Bill 2022, 1490 and 1491 uh, for passage on second reading. Council Member Hart. 
be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am um, standing in support of this. You know, as I saw all of these people come out and uh, ask for our support, I have worked in that community directly um, for over 25 years. And Mr. Giddens has worked with my sorority for over 40 years in feeding people. When I tell you the work that Inspiritus has done and this Lutheran church, when no one wanted to be in that community, when people were going the opposite direction, they were there making sure that people had a shelter and they had food. And I am so thankful for them maintaining and sustaining themselves in that community and now expanding to provide housing for people who desperately need it. I understand and appreciate uh, the newcomers in Salem Town and the, the concerns that they have and I appreciate the councilman working with them and making sure that their concerns are addressed. But we definitely need housing. This is a housing crisis in this city. And for us to have developers who are willing to provide housing and the need for senior housing is especially needed in that area. So I stand asking my colleagues to stand with me and Council Member O'Connell and vote in favor. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Suara. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I wouldn't take long, but I wanted to speak in support as well. And I think what caught my attention with this particular housing uh, is the fact that it's for the elderly and the disabled. I think oftentimes when we talk about even housing projects, we need affordable housing. Sometimes we don't cater to every group that we need to cater to. And then when we have a, a, a project that is targeting uh, a group that needs it the most that are on fixed income, uh, uh, that sometimes may not even be able to get into some of the housing projects that we get, I think it, 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 it requires our support and I would ask for everyone to vote in favor. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Council Member Stiles. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to say thank you to the sponsor. This is a, a fantastic bill. And also to piggyback a bit off of Council Member Zwar's points in regards to providing for our seniors. I think we, in general, do not do a great job of honoring those that have come before us and uh, the lives that they have lived. And I think this is wonderful to have a project where they can age in place, stay in their neighborhood, and continue to enjoy uh, amenities that are coming to the neighborhood. So again, uh, thank you, Councilmember O'Connell. All right, anybody else in the queue? Anybody else wishes to be heard? All right, uh, what we have is a motion to approve on second reading bill 2022-1490 and 1491. This is for passage on second reading. Um, all those in favor of passage of those two bills say aye. Opposed, no. Both those bills pass on second reading. All right, we are now on item number 13, Bill 2022-1496 by Council Members Benedict Withers and Mendez. It's an ordinance to amend Title 17 by applying a contextual overlay district for various properties located east of Stratford Avenue and south of Fernwood Drive. Council Member Benedict, you are recognized. There you are. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So there's a substitute to this that changes the boundaries. But we open the public hearing first, right? Okay, I'd like to open the public hearing. All right, declare the public hearing open. Uh, show of hands of those who are here in favor of 1496. I see a hand right there. Anybody else in favor? They're in. Oh, they're walking in. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, looking for a, a show of hands in favor of Bill 2022-1496. All right, I see a couple of hands in favor. Okay, there's another one. Uh, a show of hands of those who are here in opposition to Bill 2022-1496. 
Anybody in opposition? Okay, I don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak? No? Okay, to close the public hearing closed. Councilmember Benedict, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So um, I appreciate the support from Council Member Withers and Council Member Mendez. I had a little bit of time away earlier this fall and they helped with a community meeting and helped here on the floor with this bill. Um, as a result of community meetings, there was, uh, there I have a substitute that I'm going to move and that substitute removes Porter Road from this overlay and um, that's as the result of the community input. Uh, it was interesting at the planning commission meeting, I asked for their approval and they did approve this and they recognized that some changes may be needed and I appreciate that they allowed this to go through and gave me the opportunity to make those changes um, <laughs> while we reviewed this bill here in council. So with that, I'll move the substitute. Okay, so Councilman Benedict has moved the substitute on bill 2022-1496 and explained it um, properly seconded. Any uh, questions on the substitute? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the substitute say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Substitute's adopted. Councilman Benedict, you're on your bill as substituted. I'd like to move approval. Okay, so Councilman Benedict has moved approval of 1496 as substituted for uh, passage on second reading properly. Seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, this one passes on second reading. Uh, we're on item number 14, BL 2022-1505 by Council Member Toombs. Uh, this is an ordinance uh, to amend Title 17 by change from RS10 to R10 zoning for property located at 1906 Manchester Avenue. It's approximately 418 feet southwest of John Mallet Drive. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Request to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Okay, thank you. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. <laughs> Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. All right, declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember Toombs, you're recognized. Thank you, move for approval. Councilmember Toombs has moved for approval of the bill on second reading. It's 1505, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. This one's adopted. 1505 passes on second reading. We've done item number 15. Item number 16, Council Member Hancock. Uh, BL 2022 1526. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from RS5 to RM15 zoning for property located at 335 Forest Park Road, approximately 525 feet south of Elm Street, 7.67 acres. Council Member Hancock, you're recognized. Committee reports, please. Uh, no committee reports. I think we're ready for a public hearing. All right. I'd All like right. to input the public hearing. Hearing. All right, uh, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of this measure. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to this measure. Councilmember Hancock, I don't see any hands. Declare the public hearing closed. You're recognized on your bill. I'd like to move for approval with a brief comment. All right, uh, the motion is to approve properly. Seconded back to you. So this is changing zoning from RS5 to RM15 for 7.67 acres. Currently on this property is an apartment complex that would be compliant with RM15. It is surrounded by um, apartments and condos that are also RM15. And it has been there since 1974. Um, I think the zoning was just never properly changed. It's in T4 neighborhood evolving um, national next policy. And so I'm doing this rezoning to get them in compliance with their current development and what's in the works around them and um, what's in the National Next Plan. And I'd like to ask everyone to vote in support, please. All right, so the motion is to approve BL 2022 1526 for passage on second reading. Again, it was properly seconded. Uh, any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, this bill passes on second reading. Uh, Council Member Toombs, I'm coming back to you. Is that for my number 25? This is um, <clears throat> for you to consider. I think uh, it's a motion to rescind. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, tell me which bill we're actually on. Number 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tw uh, item number 25 is um, 2022-1551. Okay. 
Okay, so let me read it and then we'll explain what we're okay. doing. We're on item number 25. We had already taken this one up. It's bill 2022-1551 by Council Member Toombs. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from CL to SP zoning on property located at 1603 and 1605 Hampton Street, the corner of Hampton Street and Avondale Circle. Zone CL, it's 66 acres. Um, it was our understanding that no notices had been sent out, but apparently they did get sent out. Yeah. So, Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on item number 25, bill 2022-1551. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move to rescind the deferral um, to the, the first meeting in January and, and move forward with the public hearing. Uh, a deferral would actually mess up the financing for this project. Um, Okay, so what we did because of no notices, it just it was moved to the first meeting in January. Yes. You want to rescind the actions of the of yes. what we did, so that you can actually have the public hearing yes. tonight. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so the motion is to rescind our actions, moving it to the first meeting in January, so that it'll be back on. It'll be back properly before us right now. Okay, so I've got a motion to rescind by Council Member Toombs, properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion to rescind? Okay, it requires two thirds vote, but we'll try it by uh, voice vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion to rescind by Council Member Toombs say aye. Aye. Oppose no. Uh, so we rescind our actions. Council Member Toombs, you're on BL 2022 1551. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Request to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open on BL 2022-1551. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of this bill. Okay, a show of hands of those who are here in opposition to this bill. Don't see anybody either way. Declare the public hearing closed. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on BL 2022-1551. Thank you. Move for approval. Okay, the motion is to approve. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Council Member Allen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice. I just I just want to ask a question of the of the sponsor. I mean, since we've sort of discovered this nifty thing of deferring things all at the beginning, which seems like a great idea, but then everybody left. So if I can ask the sponsor, I'm just a little nervous about reinstating a public hearing and then not having anyone here to speak about it. So can you sort of offer some assurance that, that there wasn't a crowd here and they left or, or that you've communicated with them? So I, just, I, I would hate yeah. for us to, you know, do that. So thank you. So this project was presented during a, during a community meeting. Um, so notices were sent out to everybody within a thousand feet of the project for them to attend the community meeting. And it was discussed with the developer. Um, there was no opposition discussed during the meeting. I haven't received any emails or phone calls about this project voicing any opposition. Um, this is actually gonna be a, um, a uh, some special like pilot financing where this is going to be a mixed income project. Um, so it's actually a really good project. And if we were to continue on with the deferral, they wouldn't be able to get that finance. Okay. All right. You've heard the explanation. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this bill? Okay. We're on bill 2022-1551. The motion is to pass on second reading. All those in favor of passage on second reading say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That bill passes on second reading. All right, we're now back on item number 17. This is page nine of my calendar. Item number 17, bill 2022, 1543, by Council Member Parker. There he is. And this can be taken with um, item number 18. Uh, BL 2022-1543, an ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from RS5. Test fee zoning on property is located at 504, 508, 512, 516, and 520 Edwin Street, approximately 129 feet east of Jones Avenue. And the companion bill, which is BL 2022-1544 by Council Member Parker. Ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requirements on BL 2022-1543. Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Council Member Parker, you recognize both on both those bills. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open on 1543 and 1544. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of those two bills. All right, thank you. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition to those two bills. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. 
All right, to close the public hearing closed, Councilman Parker, you're recognized on your bills. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd move the bills for approval. All right, uh, Councilman Parker has moved both 1543 and 1544 for approval on second reading, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Those two bills pass on second reading. All right, we're now on BL 2022, 1545, and 1546. They can be taken together by Councilmember Toombs. Uh, ordinance to amend Title 17 by amending a specific plan on property located 2433 Point of Vista Pike, approximately 721 feet west of East Lane Zone SP. Uh, that's item 1545. Uh, item number 20, BL 2022, 1546 is the companion bill. That's an ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022-1545, proposed specific plan zoning district, um, and it's the proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on both those two bills, 1545 and 1546. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Request to open the public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of those two measures. Okay, thank you. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition of those two measures. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak? Nope. Declare the public hearing closed. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on those two bills. Thank you. Move for approval. Uh, I got a motion to approve both 1545 and 1546. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, 1545 and 1546 pass on second reading. Uh, BL 2022, 1547 by Council Member O'Connell. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by amending specific plan on property located at 827 19th Avenue South, the corner of Chet Atkins Place and 19th Avenue South, zone SP.72 acres. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. Declare the public, public hearing open. Um, a show of hands of those who are here in favor of that measure. I see a hand over there and a hand in the back. Uh, a show of hands of those who are here in opposition to that measure. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. Declare the public hearing closed. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to close the public hearing and move approval. Uh, you Second got a motion to, motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion on BL 2022-1547? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, that one passes on second reading. We're on item number 22, BL 2022-1548 by Council Member Parker. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing RS 10 to R10 zoning for property located 515 East Trinity Lane, approximately 446 feet east of Jones Avenue. Council Member Parker, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Councilman Parker, I didn't see any hands either way. Declare the public hearing closed. You're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move approval. All right. The motion is to approve 1548 on second reading. Properly second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nope. 1548 passes on second reading. Next item is BL 2022-1549, which we can take with 1550. These are Council Member Van Reese's bills. BL 2022-1549, ordinance to amend Title 17. By change from CS and RS20 to SP zoning for property located at 3699 and 3671 Dickerson Pike. It's approximately 150 feet southeast of Bellshire Drive. It's 13.71 acres. And item number 24, BL 2022-1550. The companion bill, an ordinance authorized building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022-1549. Um, proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Council Member Van Reese, you're recognized on both those bills. Uh, let's open the public hearing, please. Let's open it. Uh, we're opening the public hearing. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of 1549 and 1550. I see a hand right there. A uh, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to those two bills. All right, ma'am, would you like to speak? I can see you back over there. Do you want to speak on this one? Those in favor? Nope, good. Okay, declare the public hearing closed. Councilman Van Rees, you're recognized on those two bills. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, move approval. All right, so the motion is to approve both 15... Um, 1549 and 1550 for passes on second reading. Properly seconded, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of those two bills say aye. Opposed, no. 
uh, you adopt. We're now, uh, we've taken care of item number 25. We're on item number 26, Bill 2022 1552 by Council Member Parker. Orders to amend Title 17 by change from IWD to RM20 ANS zoning. Property located at 842 Cherokee Avenue, approximately 169 feet north of Chickasaw Avenue is 0.5 acres. Council Member Parker, you recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to open the public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands to those who are here in favor of the measure. Show of hands to those who are here in opposition to the measure. Seeing nobody in opposition, those in favor wish to speak. Declare the public hearing closed. Councilor Parker, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move approval. Motion is to approve. Properly seconded. Any discussion on 1552? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, nope. 1552 passes on second reading. Item number 27, Bill 2022-1553 by Council Member O'Connell. Ordinance amend Title 17 by change from DTC to SP zoning on property located at 500 President Ronald Reagan Way at the northeastern, northeastern corner of Rutherford Street and Lee Leah Avenue. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. Declare the public hearing open on 1553. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. See some hands in the back. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Got hands on both sides. Okay, so um, those in favor wish to speak, if you would come on down. <laughs> Need your name, uh, address, and uh, two minutes in which to speak. Good evening, uh, my name is Larry Powers. I'm here representing the owners of the property and I'm at 504 East Kingston in Dilworth, uh, rather Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I'd like to just briefly describe the project and explain why we feel that these ambitious plans are appropriate for Nashville and appropriate for Rutledge Hill neighborhood and most importantly, appropriate for this site. Uh, the property is uh, just about 3.5 acres right across the street from the Sobro uh, neighborhood or a subdistrict. And in our view, this site presents a rare opportunity to do more than simply provide housing for the current demand in the market or the anticipated demand in the years to come. At 3.5 acres or just under that, we feel this site presents an opportunity to provide a public open space, uh, that would serve as an amenity to the Rutledge Hill neighborhood, but quite frankly will be remarkable enough that it will draw from beyond the Rutledge Hill neighborhood. This site, we believe, presents an opportunity to deliver ambitious, iconic architecture, and our plan proposes to seize on these opportunities of creating public open space and seize on the opportunity of providing iconic architecture. Uh, our plan starts with a one and a half acre public park with a rolling lawn and an overlook perched above the city looking down at the skyline and the river. We see this as a regular destination for neighborhood residents. And as I said before, I believe this will draw from beyond the neighborhood as it's our understanding that going back several decades, this site has served as an informal vantage point for the 4th of July fireworks. And we would love to see that that we would love to see our park be that destination once again. Uh, we are proposing three mixed use towers around the perimeter of the public park. They are designed by nationally renowned architect in Gensler and the buildings are thoughtful in their massing and their materials and their scale. And this plan is possible because we are uh, undertaking significant excavation and the property at significant expense. In order to provide the public park of 1.5 acres, we are excavating down one and a half, sorry, five floors below grade. All right, we're um, two minutes. Uh, lastly, I just wanna point out that we've had six or seven public meetings on this site. We appreciate the community feedback on it. It has, the site plan has benefited from the community input and we very much appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. 
Good evening, members of the council. My name is Woods Drinkwater. I'm an attorney here in town. My address for this hearing is 154th Avenue North, Suite 1100. Um, I represent the developer in this SP process as well as some litigation. Um, this project has already been reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission twice. First, as a request for an overall height modification, and second, for this SP. Uh, if you take time to review these plans, I think you'll understand why it's been approved by the Planning Commission twice. This is a unique three tower design with a one and a half acre publicly accessible but privately maintained park with five levels of underground parking. It's a dramatic and ambitious development. Uh, members of this council may be aware that there's been some litigation related to this um, proposed development site this year. Um, a few members of the community have objected to this building's um, overall height and uh, sued, in fact, to stop the overall height modification and transfer court. Their objections were overturned and that is presently before the Court of Appeals, which is why the developer is seeking an SP on this site. Um, the developer could have built what's referred to as a Texas wrap here. You've seen these around town. They're sidewalk to sidewalk. They're unattractive. Um, they don't really engage the community like this site will. This is a ambitious and imaginative design, and I uh, hope that you will show support for the unique and ambitious architecture in Nashville and vote yes in support of this um, proposed SP. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Anybody else in favor? All right. Those opposed, if you would come on forward. Need your uh, name, address, and you'll have two minutes in which to speak. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. My name is uh, Steve Snyder. I, my wife and I bought a property at 20 Rutledge, which is in the City Lights building, directly across from this subject property several years ago. In doing so, we reviewed the downtown code, the zoning that governs this location. And just to highlight, that downtown code, as was mentioned, this site is in the Rutledge Hill subdistrict. It's not in the Sobro subdistrict. The Rutledge Hill subdistrict and what prompted us to invest in the community was the fact that the Rutledge Hill subdistrict is to be characterized by primarily a low rise and should act as a transition from the height of the core and Sobro neighborhoods. This project, if approved, would be over six times in excess of the current height limits that govern Rutledge Hill. Um, six times in a neighborhood that currently is low rise to mid rise at most. The, uh, the developer has suggested through his council at the, Latin, the previous comments that they've chosen to use a specific plan. That's really spot reassessment. A specific plan under the downtown code, under Nashville Next, has to be consistent with the general plan, which is the downtown code. Consistency suggests it should honor the height limits that govern the Rutledge Hill subdistrict. It also is supposed to be under the specific plan or in a section, a context which is sensitive to the development which is sensitive to the context of the neighborhood. This is a high development as acknowledged it's a lovely development it's in the wrong location please council members enforce the downtown code as written with the height limits that govern the Rutledge Hill the Rolling Mill Hill subdistricts of the downtown code the Planning Commission staff suggested those height limits were adopted at a time when the high rises were supposed to be focused in Sobro and in the Gulch and the Planning Commission staff suggested that's now obsolete. If that's the case, the downtown code should be modified. These spot reassessments should cease. Thank you, and please reject this plan. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Um, hi, my name is Melissa Adams, and I live in a house uh, built in 1799 on at 621 2nd Avenue South. I was here a few months ago um, in regards to a similar a project of similar size slated for directly across the street from where this project is. Um, I have also now had a chance to speak with Councilman O'Connell because when this project first came up over a year ago, I could, like I had mentioned to you all and uh, Councilman O'Connell, I could not get him to return any of my calls. I have also spoken with the Planning Commission because my concern is this. 
The Planning Commission and Councilmen are saying that they, are, they do not have to adhere to these height restrictions, and that is not correct. There are supplemental policies in place in Rutledge Hill. Councilman O'Connell knows that. The Planning Commission knows that as well. And what they are doing is they are disregarding the protection of the neighborhood and going along and giving these developers what they are wanting and, and leaving the residences with no other alternative than to sue. And this is absolutely not acceptable. The Rutledge Hill neighborhood clearly states in the planning zone, in the planning guidelines, it is current it is one of Nashville's earliest residential areas and still contains several notable historic buildings, as well as the Richard Fulton Government Office complex, the Children's Theater, many homes built in that same period. It is intended to develop as a vibrant, mixed-use neighborhood with a heavy residential emphasis, emphasis and primarily low to mid-rise buildings. As with other primarily residential neighborhoods, there is a need for more publicly accessible open space as the population increases. Downtown code DCT, DT6 DN policy is applied to the majority of the area and civic CI policy is applied to the Metropolitan Government's Fulton Campus. Goals and supplemental policies of Rutledge Hill. Buildings should Ms. be Ms. Adams, yes, uh, sir. two minutes have run out. Okay. okay. Well, Council Vice Mayor Shulman, may I finish reading this because this is very important. We, as citizens of this city, get two minutes to come before you all and address these serious matters. When behind closed doors, they are continuing to tear down the history of this city, building luxury, high rises, and residential properties that are not fitting any of this city's needs. And the people that made this city the it city, all they are doing is allowing the developers to come in and build what they want so that they can meet the cost of these properties. As I spoke with you, Vice Mayor Shulman, you were the one that understood that allowing this project would forever change the historic landscape of Nashville, and you suggested that I call the media to let them know. Councilman O'Connell is not treating this as though it was his neighborhood. The Planning Commission, Joni, who I met with, said the same thing, that I would like this sky rise. This sky rise blocks the views of the fireworks. It doesn't allow people to see it. I've lived on 2nd, I am born and raised in Nashville. I've lived on 2nd Avenue South for almost 16 years now. I know where the fireworks are. I know where you can see them. It not only blocks my view, it blocks the view that the fire department currently has with their family on 4th of July, and it does nothing but put up another luxury development that no one in this city is looking for. The only one, the only ones looking for this are the developers and the, the investors that are coming into this city and buying it up and losing the heart and soul of what has made Nashville, Nashville. Okay. Well, what I need for you to do, um, and Bobby said, I let you go further. Um, Thank you. you can obviously send whatever information you want to all council members, okay? Okay. But I appreciate you, okay? Thank you very much. And one last thing regarding the structural integrity of my home, because Councilwoman Johnston wanted to let me know that she heard me. But what you don't understand, Councilman Johnston, is there was a building that has already gone up and blasted my house and has compromised the structural integrity of it. It was renovated all the way back to the studs. I have cracks all throughout my home now. And when I picked up the phone to call the local company that was responsible for it, they heard me and they have yet to call me back and that's been several years now. Right. So I appreciate your concern, but in the end, no one does anything about it. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. I just, I just ask you to please oppose this because they can build something beautiful that has more reflection of the historical significance of 2nd Avenue South continuing down to 2nd Avenue North. All right. Thank you. God all right. bless you all. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak uh, in opposition?
Okay, declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember O'Connell, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, these, this project as a companion to second Peabody have been, um, I think, a tough conversation for the community and it shows how quickly the community has changed uh, that city lights did not qualify for a height modification just about a decade ago, not quite. And uh, now we're at a point where I think the, the intensity of demands there in an area that is between a, a stretch of uh, along KVB with frontage there that offers the potential for unlimited height down to Rutledge Hill. The transition is tough to define and I will say um, both of these projects have now almost uh, completed the process twice where they initially pursued height modification at planning staff recommended approval in both cases, the commission approved the height modification in both cases. After that, uh, subsequent to um, litigation, they pursued standard rezoning in both of those cases. The planning com planning staff recommended approval, planning commission also recommended approval, and which is why the bills are here. I would not have brought either of these bills to council as disapproved bills by the planning commission. Um, there has been a pretty intense community conversation about whether or not this is appropriate. I think um, there, I have heard from a variety of stakeholders, including some residents of City Lights who are for this, other urban residents who are for this. It did not get to consensus. Those are always the hardest projects because I, I generally prefer to bring things in that have full community support. We don't have it here. Um, I think though in looking at how much scrutiny these projects have gotten by planning staff, by the full commission multiple times over, um, this one like second Peabody uh, deserves the consideration of this council and encourage you all to support and uh, move approval. All right, so Councilmember O'Connell has moved approval on second reading of Bill 2022-1553, properly seconded, discussion on the motion. All right, seeing none, we're, oh, Council Member Evans, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to ask a question since I have nothing to do with the downtown code, but kind of the or understanding of the downtown code is, is it planning's perspective that the downtown code should be adjusted um, for the height concerns, uh, I guess, of the downtown area based on the feedback from some of the residents? Who wants to answer that? Councilman O'Connell or planning? Planning? Uh, so the downtown code as a doc, so there are um, a few different things that we're talking about. There's the land use policy, which is, this is a T6 policy. Um, that is sort of the guiding document for um, decisions such as a rezoning like this SP. There's the downtown code, which is the zoning that's on the property right now. And the downtown code has been amended and modified many times since its adoption. Um, and so it has changed. Um, uh, there have been height increases within parts of the downtown code. And then the third sort of piece of this is the SP, which is a rezoning to change the zoning from downtown code to SP. So it would no longer be part of the downtown code. Um, the downtown code has a process right now where you can ask for modifications to height. Um, the downtown code sets a base height and then you can earn additional height through a bonus height program. And then if you want to go above the bonus height program, you go through something called an overall height modification. Um, and that goes to the planning commission. This site went through a overall height modification with the same project and that was approved at the planning commission. And so this SP now, which is a rezoning to change it from downtown code to SP is the same project, just a different process. Is that? Thank help? you for clarifying. Yes, that's very helpful and I understand better now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, council member. Um, council member O'Connell. Thank you, and I'll just add to Councilmember Evans by way of response uh, from my perspective. I, I think there are a couple different ways to look at this, and I had multiple conversations with planning staff about this, um, it, where I think in both of these cases, one of the most important things that you heard this project team speak to was exceptional design, and I will say, I mean, neither of these projects uh, proceeded as originally proposed. In the first case uh, of Second and Peabody, right next door to this, the first design was rejected 
completely by planning and did not go forward. Um, as the, the design improved, I think they recognized that, okay, yeah, this is not just gonna be sort of another glass box tower. This has to be something uh, far more exceptional than that. In the second case too, uh, buildings were relocated, height was adjusted, some of this directly in response to community feedback. And I think planning, planning's perspective on this was rather than looking at this as a broader discussion about a community plan amendment for this area that um, the, the process of going through height modification actually allowed for um, more, uh, in some ways, leverage about the, uh, the, height, the the way you get exceptional design. So I, you know, it, it was a pretty intense conversation, also just with planning about how to um, think about this from a policy perspective. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Anybody else want to be heard on this one? Okay, where we are is we're on BL 2022-1553. It's item number 27. Council Member McConnell has moved passage of this uh, bill for um, passage on second reading. It was properly seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of 1553 for passage on second reading, say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, bill passes on second reading. We're on Bill 2022-1554 by Council Member Toombs. Uh, this is an ordinance amendment title 17 by changing from R8 to RM9 ANS zoning. Property located at 2721 White's Creek Pike, approximately 400 feet south of Revels Drive. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Of course, open a public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands to those who are here in favor of this measure. Okay, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to this measure. Anybody in opposition? Uh, those in favor wish to speak? Oh, the public hearing closed. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, move for approval. Uh, the motion is to approve on second reading, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of passage on second reading say aye. Opposed, no. Bill passes on second reading. Item number 29, Bill 2022-1555 by Council Member Parker, an ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from RS5 to R6A zoning. Property located at 109 East Moreland Street, approximately 378 feet east of the corner of Dickerson Pike and East Moreland Street and within the detached accessory drilling unit overlay district. Council Member Parker, you are recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to open the public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of this measure. Okay, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to this measure. Seeing nobody in opposition, those in favor wish to speak? Nope, declare the public hearing closed. Councilman Parker, you're on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor, move approval. Motion is to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of 1555 for passage on second reading say aye. Opposed, no. This one passes on second reading. Uh, item number 30, uh, which can be taken with item 31. These are by Council Member O'Connell, BL 2022 1556. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from MUIA to SP zoning for properties located at 1401 Church Street and 112, 116, 118, 120, 124, 128, and 132. 15th Avenue North at 3.85 acres to permit a mixed use development with non residential uses and a maximum of 1,350 multifamily residential units. And the Companion bill, which is BL 2022-1557, ordinance to authorize building material restrictions and requirements for BL 2022-1556. Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Councilmember O'Connell, recognized on both those bills. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to open the public hearing, please. Okay, declare the public hearing open on 1556 and 1557. Show of hands of those who are here in favor of those two measures. All right, show of hands of those who are here in opposition of those two measures. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. Nobody come in forward. Declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember O'Connell, you're recognized on your two bills. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move approval. Okay, so the motion is to approve both 1556 and 1557 for passage on second reading. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of those two bills say aye. Opposed, nope. Uh, those two bills pass on second reading. Uh, we've handled 32 and 33. We're on item number 34, Council Member Parker, BL 2022 1560. Uh, that's an ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from R6 to MULA zoning for a portion of property located at 1019 Tom Thomas Avenue, approximately 250 feet west of Gallatin Pike. Council Member Parker, you're recognized on your bill. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of that bill. Okay. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition to that bill. Let's see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. Nope. Close the public hearing closed. Councillor Parker, you recognize on 1560. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move approval. Got a motion to approve. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of BL 2022-1560 for passage on second reading say aye. Opposed, no. That one passes on second reading. We're on BL 2022-1561, which can be taken with BL 2022-1562. These are by Council Member Lee. Uh, ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Government, uh, Metropolitan Code, by changing from AR 2A to SP zoning for properties located at 12610 Old Hickory Boulevard and Old Hickory Boulevard unnumbered. It's approximately 655 feet east of Hobson Pike. And then the companion bill, which is 1562, Ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022 1561. The proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Councilmember Lee, you're recognized on your two bills. Yes, sir. I'd like to open up the um, public hearing. Okay. Declare the public hearing open on 1561 and 1562. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of those two measures. All right. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition of those two measures. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. Nope. Okay. Declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember Lee, you're recognized on your two bills. Yes, sir. I have an amendment. I'd like to go ahead and put the amendment on, and then I'd like to have some conversation about the bill, if that's all right. Yep. Bill 2022-1561, that's the one you want to put an amendment on. So yes. Council Member Lee is moving an amendment on 1561, properly seconded. Back to you for an explanation of the amendment. The amendment actually is some language that the community uh, wanted to see in writing. It deals with um, the loading bays, how many loading bays that there will be. There will only be six loading bays per um, building. It also deals with the time that any uh, tra uh, truck traffic can be done. There can't be any between 10 and 6 in the morning. Um, it deals with the storm warning, the water maintenance agreement uh, with Metro Water that wanted to be recorded prior to the grading permit in, uh, issuance and that, uh, yeah, no truck, I said that, the loading bills. And they've also um, put a, a um, what do you call it, a raised medium with the purpose of restricting uh, left turns um, of the trucks onto the site. So those were things that were discussed in the um, community meeting that the community wanted to see. And so those are the things in the um, amendment that we'd like to add. And I would like to uh, move the amendment, please. All right, so Councilmember Lee has explained the amendment. She's moving the amendment to 1561, properly seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Opposed, no. Okay, so I have, um, sounds like one no. Any other no's? Okay, so the amendment goes on. Um, so Council Member Lee, uh, you've got um, BL 2022-1561 as amended, along with 1562. Back to you. Yes, sir. I would just like to say that um, this whole thing, uh, and you all, and you all may have gotten some letters regarding this, so I wanted to kind of explain. They have had many community meetings on this. The owner of this, this is not a huge, um, a huge complex going up. It's a family owned um, warehouse. Um, it is smaller. Um, they cut some of the bays down after being in the community meetings and hearing what the community wanted. Um, they have agreed to do some landscaping buffers. Um, the whole area out there now is already a warehouse area, so it won't be like I'm just putting up a warehouse. Um, and this particular part, uh, the, the, the landscaping will help the whole area. Um, and the, the owner is, he used to live in our community, so he's a community person. It's going to be a family-owned um, business, and so he's still open to talking with us. So I would really appreciate, I think, for this area, 
Um, no, it's not a big restaurant or something that our area would love to have. It's a smaller warehouse in a warehouse district. He has worked with the community to try to get the things that they are wanting to see in that area and is still very open to doing what he can do in there, still in contact and that type of thing. So I would appreciate um, you to vote on this and I make a motion. I don't think I've done it now. I make a motion to move my legislation, please. All right, that's what I needed. A motion to approve BL 2022-1561 as amended and BL 2022-1562 for passage on second reading. Properly seconded. Any uh, discussion? Council Member Stiles, you're recognized. Just, I do need to be a, a no on this bill. I did receive a lot of emails from my constituents that live across the street, so thank you. Okay, all right, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of Bill 2022-1561 as amended and 1562 for passes on second reading, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Okay, so I have one no, bill passes. Those two bill passes on second reading. We're on item number 37, bill 2022-1563 by council members Hauser, Rosenberg, and Stiles, an ordinance to amend title 17 uh, by change from SP to SP on properties located at 77 and, 7730 and 7734 Highway 70 South at the corner of Highway 70 South and Harpeth Valley Road. It's 3.42 acres to permit a hospital use. Council member Hauser, you're recognized on the bill. Yes, I'd like to open the public meeting, please. All right, declare the public hearing open. Uh, show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Okay, a show of hands of those who are here in opposition of the measure. All right, so we have hands on uh, both sides. Um, so um, uh, we'll start with those in favor. If you would, just go ahead and line up. Anybody who wishes to speak in favor, if you'd come on up, uh, need name, address, and then you have two minutes in which to speak. Vice Mayor Schulman, members of the council, my name is Tom White, 511th Avenue North. I represent the applicant in this matter. You've seen the show of hands of those that are here in support. We originally had lined up 14 speakers. Uh, we've discussed the matter. We're gonna limit our speakers to five. Appreciate your courtesies. Uh, at the outset, I wanna thank Council Lady Hauser for the significant number of hours she's given on this project, both in neighborhood meetings and on the phone correspondence. It's been remarkable. This council always appreciates council members that deal with their constituents and have a number of meetings. With respect to this matter, it's somewhat unusual. This is one SP replacing another SP. Again, somewhat unusual. Uh, if you look at the matter as it came before the Planning Commission, there's no policy issue here whatsoever. It's just a straight one SP to another. With respect to the Planning Commission itself, the staff recommended it. The Planning Commission unanimously approved the proposal. The comments by the members of the Planning Commission could not have been any more laudatory for this type of proposal. It's a freestanding emergency department. The prior use as approved on the property was a restaurant. The restaurant had never opened. It had been boarded up for a number of years. If you adjust the restaurant use versus that of the emergency freestanding department is this. Basically, the traffic is decreased to almost one third of what it would have been under the restaurant. Number two, there's only one entrance and exit to the site, which is on Highway 70. The prior one had an entrance on 70, an entrance on the side road, Harpeth Valley Road. The impervious surface decreases from 51% to 37%, and with respect to the Planning Commission Department recommendation was extremely clear. It was far more consistent with the conservation policy for the neighborhood. I can't imagine a better location in Nashville for an emergency department freestanding other than basically coming to the downtown area, either Centennial or St. Thomas West, traffic times, it could be a really difficult thing. Thank you for your courtesy, urge you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Next speaker, former council member, Sherry Weiner. Hi, y'all. Former vice mayor. That too. Yeah. You enjoying it up there? <laughs> <laughs> y'all knew I would do something right. Yeah. So I'm Sherry Weiner. You, you just wasted Sherry. four seconds. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, you'll add to the end of this. Thank okay. you. Um, so I'm Sherry Weiner, the former District 22 Councilwoman, woman, um, pro tem and acting vice mayor of this body. I live at 208 Aspenwood Lane, which is right behind this property. Um, thanks to you, I am currently the chair of the Fair Board of Commissioners. And um, yeah, I wanna thank you for that one. You enjoying um, that? I'm sorry? You enjoying that? As much as you're enjoying this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So 
So here's why I support the 21 year, as a 21 year resident, here's why I support the property. The proposed SP, as Tom shared, reflects increased green space, it reduces the building size, it reduces the traffic, and it reduces the number of patrons compared to the current SP that the same neighborhood supported in 2015. Upon the request of several of the neighbors, Councilmember Hauser and I went and sat with NDOT and asked them and TriStar if they would agree not to allow any ingress or egress off of Harpeth Valley Road so that our neighborhood remained secure. And everybody agreed. So it is now moved further down the street. Here's what this is not. This is not an 11, this is not a hospital. It is an 11 bed ER. It is not proposed for the middle of our neighborhood. It is proposed for the front of the neighborhood on a commercial strip. It is across the street from a Taekwondo, from a MAPCO, and from a, a gun range. It is also right adjacent to, on the other side, a vacant Shoney's. This is a much better use than what was going to be there, which was a restaurant as a tourist destination. It doesn't take my audiology degree for us to know that it's noisy. We live at the intersection of 70 and 40, and we hear thousands of cars day in and day out. We hear sirens day in and day out. This is not going to change the auditory landscape of our neighborhood, even appreciably. It's going to be business as usual. The opponents have complained of increased unhoused folks in our neighborhood. Guys, Bellevue's not in a bubble, they're already there. And it's unfortunate and it's sad, and thankfully we have the things in place to hopefully help them, but this is not gonna make it worse. This is not gonna change it at all. Your, uh, your time ran out. <laughs> Seriously? <clears throat> okay, two more points. All to right. your point. Um, my give father deference to the former vice mayor. Thank Go you. Ahead. Um, my father-in-law woke up with chest pains one morning when the nitro didn't work and we called 911 and he didn't make it on the way to Vanderbilt. And I can't say that this would have saved his life, but at least he would have had a fighting chance. The last thing I'll share is I was picking up my grandson from um, my daughter's house and we're driving up Westmead, and the um, friend of somebody in this room had a heart attack on the side of the road. And I saw her and stopped. All she was doing was walking down the street with her friend. And I stopped and performed CPR on her and um, until the ambulance came. And this can happen to anybody, anytime, anywhere. And our neighbors, my neighbors that live in this neighborhood right behind this proposed facility don't have the opportunity for anything more than one ambulance right now. This will make a difference. It will save a life. And that's what the most important thing is here. So thank you and I sure hope you support it. Have fun the rest of the night. I'll be at home. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything in the rules about calling former vice mayors up to handle this. Um, <laughs> name address, two minutes. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Scott Sehek. I'm the CEO at TriStar Centennial Medical Center. I reside at 9602 Romano Way in uh, Brentwood. Um, I've been the CEO at uh, TriStar Centennial for the last six years. Um, over this time, we continue to see with all the growth here in Nashville, the surrounding communities, uh, Bellevue, uh, tremendous amount of emergency department visits that, that come into the downtown area hospitals. Um, we continue to see year over year uh, growth in emergency department and visits. Um, this year, it's anticipated it'll be over 314,000 emergency department visits that will come into the downtown area. Uh, currently, there's no emergency department care uh, in the community of Bellevue. Um, at this location, uh, TriStar Centennial Medical Center uh, would like to open a freestanding emergency department. This will become a campus of TriStar Centennial Medical Center. It'll be fully supported uh, by the entire medical staff, all the 
subspecialties um, at the hospital as well as uh, the hospital uh, employees. Um, one of the things very important, uh, this will allow residents in the community and the surrounding communities to get care locally. Um, it will keep uh, fire rescue um, in the community as well and, and that will allow fire rescue to respond to other 911 calls um, you know, very rapidly. Um, I'd like to mention TriStar Centennial is a top 100 hospital or a top 50 cardiac hospital. We're also a, um, a LeapFrog uh, A-rated patient safety facility uh, for the last uh, 10 consecutive years. Uh, so we've been a quality provider looking to provide uh, quality health care um, in Bellevue. So uh, ask for uh, your support of this this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> um, I'm Dr. Michael Hasty, 6104 Gardendale Drive, Nashville 37215. I'm the medical director of the TriStar Centennial Emergency Department, and this Bellevue ER will be part of Centennial. This ER was approved unanimously by the state board that grants certificates of need and by Metro Zoning. In fact, one member of the zoning called this the perfect location for an ER. Even those opposed to this zoning change support placing an ER in Bellevue. So I wanna take this time to address some of the concerns that the neighbors have regarding the ER at this location. <coughs> one concern is about ambulances creating noise in the neighborhood. When you call 911, the ambulance comes to your house or wherever you are running lights and sirens until they get to you. And once they pick you up, almost every time they take you to the ER without lights and sirens once they figure out that it's not an emergency. So if the ambulance is leaving the neighborhood with lights and sirens, you need the ER quickly. And having an ER at the end of the neighborhood would be much better. Another concern is about people coming to seek narcotics. Over the last 10 years, we've done a lot of work in the ER to limit narcotic use, and state law even now restricts how many pills we can prescribe. This has decreased legal narcotic prescribing, but unfortunately has increased the use of heroin and narcotic overdoses. This ER will not create new narcotics problems in the area, but it could save the life of someone suffering from an overdose nearby. Lastly, there's a concern that this ER will increase violence in the area. This year, the American College of Emergency Physicians did a survey of ER doctors and found that 85% of us believe that violence in the ER has increased since 2018. Most of these assaults are by patients against their ER doctor. Most of these assaults create an unsafe or questionably safe work environment. This study is our professional organization advocating for its members. This will not make it worse for the people in the neighborhood. The pandemic has been really hard and it's made worse when people have to come to the ER and they're overcrowded and resources are stretched. Establishing this ER in Bellevue will alleviate some of the strain on the current system in the downtown hospitals and it will not bring extra violence to the neighborhood. Your, um, your time is up. Thank you. Okay. I ask Thank that you. the council approve the zoning change. Next speaker. My name is Kyle Nelson, and I live in the neighborhood behind the proposed uh, freestanding ER. Uh, my husband, my daughter, my son, and I have lived there for over 16 years. I was president of the Neighborhood Association for eight years. I was involved in several of the potential developments of this property and worked closely with uh, council member Sherry Weiner during this time. I have not seen a nicer nor better suited development for this property. I represent those in my neighborhood and community who have used ER services in the past, will likely need them and use them in the future. I am here on behalf of my 22 year old daughter, Sierra, who had a brain injury at three years old. Because of this, she does not walk, talk, and is unable to care for herself. She has epilepsy, is wheelchair bound, and requires 24-7 care. She aged out of school this year at Harris Hillman after 14 years and is home with me full time. On my street, we have three centenarians. Across the street from me, Mrs. Malone is 100 years old. Her neighbor next door is 100 years old and her husband is 102 years old. Two doors to my left is a single mom with two daughters. One of them has Down syndrome and a heart condition. 
They have all used ER services in the past five years. My family has called upon ER services four times with my daughter. ER is not something you think about until you need it. I am in favor of this freestanding ER in my neighborhood and my community. This is a needed service and it is at the correct location. Please vote yes. All right, thank you. Hello, I'm Sherry DeVault. I'm at 3868 Central Pike. A little odd, I'm on the other side of the county. Why is this ER so important to me? I have a mother who, when I did live in Bellevue, walked out of the house at night without my knowledge and slept on the sidewalk after she'd fallen down the stairs. Why did I need an ER? I think you know. But since then, my mother is now at the Meadows, which is a Bellevue Community Senior Living Center. Not just her, but all of the senior residents in the several senior residence facilities need care quickly. We know when something happens, minutes count. And as I was sitting here listening to people talk, what do I see on the wall? Something that we know can save a life within seconds. An ER, five minutes from your home, is really important. That's why I support a freestanding ER in Bellevue, although I live in Hermitage. But I have one other thing to say. I fell myself not long ago and I broke my arm. I was fortunate that there was a Mount Juliet freestanding ER and I was able to use the services. Did you know that if I would have gone to Summit, I would have been there for more than two hours? The wait time is horrendous in many of our downtown locations. It was easier for me to go to the ER. I was in and out of the freestanding ER in Mount Juliet in 45 minutes with a cast on my arm and done. These ERs stand for themselves. They are a community support and Bellevue is in need desperately of this type of service. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. It's really hard to be here this late, I know, for everybody, including you all. My name is Mary Harden. I live at 8036 Pine Forest Drive. I live behind the ER. And I agree, you know, with everything that's been said. I will cut some of the remarks that I had for that, for that so that um, I can move on to letting you know that my next door neighbor uh, died a year ago. Her son now lives there alone. Um, the ambulance got there, but she was a, it was a body by the time that they got there. We do only have one ambulance. We have an elderly couple that lives next to her. Um, you know, one of them can't get down the stairs. You know, we know that Bellevue is a taxpaying, voting, and getting older by the day, you know, area of town. And we do now have a high school coming in. There are going to be football games. There are going to be injuries. We really don't have those services. On a very personal level in this past year, um, and I get, you know, kind of shaky when I talk about that. I don't like to talk about my personal health in public, and I think we all kind of get that. And no, it's not a HIPAA issue. I think, you know, you, we hear that all the time. I can tell you about my health. I'm a breast cancer survivor. And no, I've never been the same since. Uh, it's it's taken a lot from me. It's taken a serious toll on, on my body. I had surgeries, I had chemo, I had more surgeries. Um, I am a regular visitor at NER. That's the bottom line. So in one of my post uh, surgeries this year, my husband thought it was his turn to go to the ER. It wasn't, it was still my turn, but he needed to go to the ER and I couldn't take him. So my brother, while we're waiting for services, um, knowing we're not gonna get them very quickly, drove from West End over from farther away than St. Thomas 
out to my neighborhood, even though Sherry Weiner's still yelling at me for why I didn't call her. Newsflash, after surgery, you're not thinking, oh, I'll call Sherry, <laughs> you know? And so my brother came all the way out to get my husband, who was having a major blood pressure event that they said he could have stroked out all the way to St. Thomas. Thank God, just in time. My husband's a teacher. We don't need any less of those these days, you know? It's stressful. And what I'm saying is, this is really where it does need to be. It is in the front of my neighborhood. Um, we were zoned to have a, a restaurant with alcohol there. I much prefer an ER that will have some green space that is facing Highway 70 without any entrance to a restaurant that was going to serve alcohol to 330 people with live music. That's what it's zoned for. So. Just asking you all to to approve it for, for that lesser purpose that they're asking for now. I feel like a lot of people have done their homework on this, including, you know, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Council, Councilperson. I, I appreciate the work that everyone has done on this. And I just wanted to say on a personal level, this is very, very needed. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. All right, anybody else wishing to speak in favor Okay, uh, those in opposition, if you would come line up. Yeah, anybody who wants, who wants to speak in opposition, if you come on forward, that'd be great. Name, address, two minutes. Evening, y'all. Um, thanks for being here so late and for everything you do for us. Chris Cobb, uh, 7751 Indian Springs, Bellevue. I live in the neighborhood uh, directly behind the proposed uh, ER. The truth is this is a terrible location for an ER uh, simply because the parcel fronts a neighborhood. Just over 250 of us have, of us have homes in this neighborhood. Uh, 147 of these neighbors have sent emails to, to you, to council, in opposition to this project. The majority of people who live nearest the project oppose it and have taken the time to voice those concerns to you. You've heard people speak in support because they want an ER in Bellevue. Uh, there are many, many developable, developable sites in Bellevue um, that are more appropriate than this. Ultimately, this location was chosen because the land was very inexpensive and the land was inexpensive because it is in a uh, high-risk FEMA floodplain. Um, there are plenty of other locations in Bellevue where the project could be built that is not hundreds of feet from homes and is not in a floodplain. Um, CM, How CM Hauser has expressed concern over flooding at this location. In the following correspondence to Stormwater regarding a February 2022 flooding event at this location, um, she implored the division to address increasing hazards of flooding by saying, and I quote, thank you for inspecting. We have heard of several situations like this in recent months. It is becoming more the norm rather than exception. What does stormwater need to do to be able to handle the heavier rainfalls? What needs to change in our planning requirements to protect property? I'm seeing literal rivers flowing into yards of homes that have been built in vulnerable areas without proper provisions to handle rain. Look forward to your suggestions. Whatever I can do from council, let me know, and I will. Yours in service, Gloria, end quote. The area that flooded in the instance in reference includes the roads on either side of this parcel, Highway 70 and Georgie Horn. Yet, we are still considering building the freestanding are here. We've been told the proposed use is better than the current zoning, mainly because of the uh, reduced number of vehicular trips per day. Uh, but this isn't an issue of trips. Uh, it's about whether you would prefer a restaurant in your neighborhood or an emergency room. The specific reasons that so many neighbors oppose this project have been detailed in the emails that you've received, and many of them have already been mentioned tonight by the proponents of this project. To most of us in the neighborhood, uh, the choice is obvious, and I'm asking you to please put yourselves in our shoes. Um, what if this was your neighborhood? Uh, HCA has obviously spared no expense supporting the rezone, hiring high-powered attorneys and lobbyists, and having paid employees attend these meetings and wear stickers and shirts. But tonight, the people who live in the neighborhood, the majority of the people who live in the neighborhood need you to represent them and what they want. We need you to please put people over the profits and vote as though this is your neighborhood. Sir, so you're um, the two minutes have run. Oh, I'm, I'm almost done, thank you. Um, one more sentence. Please vote as though uh, this ER would be within hundreds of feet of your home. Uh, please vote no so a more appropriate location for this project may be found. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'm Linda Nelson from 7416 Hallows Drive. I've lived at 7416 Hallows Drive. This is my 40th year. 
as a resident. Uh, Bellevue residents are requesting this proposal be denied because it causes unjustifiable health and safety hazards at this location. This unprecedented standalone emergency department located in a Nashville neighborhood will negatively impact residents and mid-state commuters. The existing parcel is situated on a hazardous roadway with limited commitments thus far by state and metro and current property owner for a developed plan to ensure safety of daily commuters, increasing volume of in inexperienced drivers with the opening of the new high school and address the void of lighting and security measures for pedestrians in this residential area. The future of this decision, if approved, signals significant disregard for residents who will be impacted exponentially by creating new hazards, which have been documented to all of you, and this proposal has basically been moving quickly. We asked to defer it to allow other parcels in Bellevue to be serious contenders to meet the community's needs. Thank you for hearing the real concerns behind all the profitability of a private company before voting in permanent hazards to a gateway thoroughfare into Davidson County. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this? Okay, declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember Hauser, you're recognized. Yes, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, approve this with a comment, please. All right, so Councilmember Hauser is making a motion to, to pass on second reading bill 2022-1563, properly seconded back to you, Councilmember Hauser. Yes, first I'd like to thank everybody that came out, those who were supportive and those who expressed concerns. I understand how difficult it is to get up and speak in public before folks that you may not know, knowing you're also on camera and that it's late. So thank you all for coming out. I do appreciate it and you have been heard. I think one of the things that we need to also appreciate is our planning and NDOT, because both the planning and NDOT have gone to extra lengths to make sure and address every single concern that has been expressed. They have done extra studies, extra reports to make sure that every single thing was addressed. They were the ones that the packet of information on your desk that shows the reduction in traffic, the reduction in noise, the reduction in impervious surfaces, which to those that spoke about flooding, that means there's less covered up with concrete, which means the ground can absorb the water. So this project is better on every single aspect that could possibly be measured related to what is currently zoned. Now, when I talked to neighbors who were opposed to this, they said, yeah, but it's not there now. Well, baby doll, it is already approved for that. The fact that it's not already built, it still can be without any input from neighbors. This project is better in every single aspect. When we took this to the planning commission, every single planning commissioner spoke in favor of this project and why it was so much better for this neighborhood as well as for Bellevue. You've heard people talk about the need for emergency services in Bellevue. And this is true, not only because we are at least half an hour away from any other emergency services, but the fact that we have a large senior population. The Meadows was mentioned. There are several senior facilities very close to this. The high school was mentioned. Teenagers do stuff and they get hurt. <clears throat> and it's really good to have an emergency facility close by those individuals. So I ask you to please approve this bill. It's needed, it's the perfect location. It is feet from I-40 on 70S. This is not a nature preserve, folks. It is a gravel lot that until TriStar tore it down had a half-built building that had been vacant for seven years. TriStar has the willingness to be a good neighbor, make this work for the neighborhood, and they have the pockets deep enough to make sure this is maintained well and taken care of properly. I move that we please vote yes. All right, so Council Member Hauser has moved approval of BL 2022-1563 for passage on second reading. It's been properly seconded. Council Member Hurt, you're recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a longtime resident of Bellevue, I am a strong advocate for bringing more health care services to the area for residents. In addition, I'm originally from Memphis and have a sister who worked in the ER at the Regional One Hospital, formerly known as John Gaston and the Med, for 47 years. I also worked for Meharry Medical College for 17 years and know firsthand that the training for ER staff starts before they get to the ER. The culture and the practice is patient care first. We have a huge concentration of senior and assisted living facilities, schools and daycares that serve residents and students from Bellevue and from as many as 30 additional zip codes. When someone's grandparent or child experiences a medical emergency and family is nearby to help, they'll be reassured that their loved ones will be safe thanks to having an ER so close to their nursing home or school. I can also attest to the fact that we are a quickly growing community within Davidson County that is in desperate need of dedicated emergency care. We are a community that is so often left out of many conversations, projects and services within Metro Nashville, Davidson County. Most of us don't even have the ability to utilize Metro trash pickup services and we only have one ambulance to serve our entire zip code. While other communities of similar size have upwards of four ambulances. This freestanding emergency department could be transformative in helping all the Bellevue office to feel more in line with the growth it has and continues to experience. Please support this freestanding ER in Bellevue. Right, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there are a lot of arguments that we can spend, uh, that I could do three minutes on, um, but I'll just say instead that um, this is not in the middle of a neighborhood. Again, it is at a Bellevue's largest interstate exit. Like literally you turn off and it's right there on the right. Um, there were 147 signatures, but there were up to four or more signatures from the same house. There was not a majority of that neighborhood opposed. Um, and this is really just a no brainer. And thank you all for supporting Bellevue by supporting this. All right, thank you, Councilmember Council Murphy. Thank, thank you, I just wanted to touch on uh, real quickly that the comments that I've made before on this floor is access and choice to healthcare is something that Tennesseans do not have um, widely available to them. Uh, different types of health care, different types of providers is vitally important when the state legislature has refused to ensure and cover people and give them health and help them get health insurance and access to care. And while this may not be the 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 type of health care that some neighbors may want or, or want in their backyard. This is the type of health care choice and options that Tennesseans and Nashville residents need. And as somebody who has a fabulous hospital 2.5 miles from their own house, I know that this will enhance everyone's quality of life in Bellevue. And so again, access and choice, y'all. This isn't just about zoning and land use, but this is about the, the fundamental human right of health care. Right, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Swope. Previous question. Council Member Swope has called the previous question. Uh, we're on the previous question. All in favor of the previous question say aye. Yes. Opposed, no. Previous question prevails. Um, we are ready to vote on BL 2022-1563 for passage on second reading. It's properly seconded. All in favor of that bill say aye. Yes. Opposed, no. Bill passes on second reading. All right, uh, next item is item number 38, Bill 2022-1564 by Council Member Benedict. Uh, it's an ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from MULA to SP zoning for property located at 2830 Gallatin Pike, southeast corner of Gallatin Pike and Lytton Avenue, and located in the Gallatin Pike Urban Design Overlay. Councilmember Benedict, you recognized on the bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of BL 2022-1564. I see some hands in favor. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to 1564. Anybody here in opposition to 1564? Seeing nobody in opposition, you all want to speak? Nope. Declare the public hearing closed. 
Councilor Member Benedict, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to move approval. Uh, Council Member Benedict moves approval of 1564, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That one passes on second reading. Item number 39, BL 2022, 1565 by Council Member Stiles, an ordinance to amend Title 17. By changing from AR 2A to MULA in a zoning for property located at 5088 Hickory Hollow Parkway, approximately 727 feet south of Mount View Road. Council Member Stiles. Here. We're on BL 2022, 1565. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to open the public hearing. Okay, to clear the public hearing open, a show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Okay, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Seeing nobody in opposition, those in favor wish to speak? Nope. Uh, declare the public hearing closed. Council Member Stiles, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. I'd like to move for approval with a brief comment. All right, so there's a motion to approve on second reading properly. Second, back to you. So this is an exciting project. We've had the three community meetings where they've come and presented, and, and this is an opportunity to create home ownership opportunities through having our first set of condos um, in the district on Hickory, Hickory Hollow Parkway and also potentially including a restaurant or a grocery store, which are really great amenities. So I'd be very grateful if everyone voted yes. All right, so the motion is to approve uh, BL 2022-1565 passes on second reading. Again, it's been properly seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, this one passes on second reading. Uh, item number 40, Bill 2022-1566 by Council Member Hager. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from CS to R6A zoning for properties located at 305 and 308 Bridgeway Avenue, approximately 99 feet west of Keaton Avenue. Council Member Hager, you're recognized. Move to open the public hearing. Okay, declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Don't see anybody either way. Declare the public hearing closed. Council Member Hager, you're a Move for your approval. Bill. Council Member Hager moves for approval of 1566 for se on second reading, properly seconded. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, all those in favor of BL 2022-1566 for passage on second reading say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That one passes on second reading. Item number 41, BL 2022-1567, uh, ordinance to amend Title 17. By change from SP to MULA and S zoning for property located at 6220 Nolensville Pike, approximately 395 feet south of uh, Bienville Drive. Council Member Rutherford, you're recognized on your bill. Open the public hearing, please. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish to speak. Okay, declare the public hearing closed. Council Member Rutherford, you're recognized on your bill. Move approval. Council Member Rutherford moves for approval of uh, Bill 2022-1567, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of 1567 for passage on second reading say aye. Opposed, no. Nope. Uh, bill passes on second reading. Um, item number 42, BL 2022-1568 by Council Member Parker. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from OL and RS10 to RM20 ANS zoning for properties located at 525, 527, 529, and 521 East Trinity Lane, approximately 455 feet west of Oakwood Avenue. Council Member Parker, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to open the public hearing. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. A show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Seeing nobody on either side, declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember Parker, you're recognized on your bill. Move approval. Uh, 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 Councilmember Parker moves approval of uh, 1568 on second reading properly. Seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of 1568 for passes on second reading say aye. Opposed, nope. Uh, 1568 passes on second reading. Item number 43, Bill 2022-1569 by Council Member Syracuse. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from CS to MULNS zoning. Property located at 2425 Atrium Way, approximately 459 feet northwest of Wanda Drive, 2.62 acres. Council Member Syracuse, recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Open the public hearing, please. Declare the public hearing open. A show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Okay, a uh, show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Don't see anybody in opposition. Those in favor wish, those in favor wish to speak. 
Um, declare the public hearing closed. Uh, Councilmember Syracuse, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move approval, brief comment. All right, the motion is to pass 1569 for passage on second reading, properly seconded. Back to you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just want to say this is a uh, motel that was completely renovated and is now going to be converted to apartments, and it's uh, a, a, a very good affordable housing opportunity here, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. Move approval. Thank you. All right, so Councilmember Syracuse has moved approval of 1569, properly seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. This one passes on second reading. We handled number 44. We have one other bill on third reading and public hearing. It's item number 45, BL 2022-1532 by Council Member Bradford, an ordinance extending the boundaries of the Urban Services District within the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government to include certain properties located in Council District 13 and approving the plan of services. Council Member Bradford, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I believe all committee reports are in, so I'll open the public hearing. All right. Um, yep, everything's in. Um, we're going to open to the public hearing. We're on BL 2022-1532. Show of hands of those who are here in favor of the measure. Show of hands of those who are here in opposition to the measure. Don't see any hands either way. Declare the public hearing closed. Councilmember Bradford, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move for approval. Uh, Councilmember Bradford has moved for approval of uh, VL 2022-1532 for passage on third reading. Properly seconded. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, all those in favor of the bill on third reading say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. VL 2022-1532 passes on third reading. It is now... 1030. Um, we would like to take a 10 minute break to give staff just a second to take a break. So um, we would like to be back here at 20 till 11. Okay. 20 till 11. You got 10 minutes and then we'll start on the consent resolutions. I can call on you. Um, on consent agenda is resolution 2022-1880, which is item number 48, 1884, 1885, 1887, 1898, 1890, 1891, 1892, 1893, and 1894. Is there anything that needs to come off of consent? Councilwoman Benedict. Thank you, Pro Tem 1892, item 56. 57. Really? Yes. Hmm. 1892. Okay. Hopefully I don't read something extra. I don't know. So 1880, is that number 48 for you? Okay. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that needs to come off of consent? No, 1892. My numbers are off. For oh, some okay. Reason. Could you please, um, get, do we need to pull it off consent if I would like everyone voting in the affirmative to be added? Well, Councilwoman Benedict already asked for it to come off. For 57? Uh, yes. No. 1893. Oh, 1893? Does it need to come off if she wants everyone? I think so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anything? Eight. Yes. If we could pull 1894. 1894? Yes. Okay. Councilwoman Styles. Uh, thank you, Pro Tem. A quick question. If we wanted to get people to sign on, do we have to pull it off? Yes. Dadgummit. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, in that case, 1880. 18. And I'm pulling off one for council members to pull with us, sorry. Eighteen ninety four. Eighteen ninety four is already pulled. Oh, okay, awesome sauce. Does anything else need to come off of consent? What? 
All right, I will read the remaining items that are on the consent agenda. Is there something? Okay. All right. Uh, resolution 2022-1884 approves the Edward Brin Memorial Justice Assistance Grant from the Office of Justice Programs to the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department to support a broad range of activities prevent, to prevent and control crime based on state and local needs and conditions. Uh, sponsors wrote in Syracuse. Resolution 2022-1885 sponsors wrote in Syracuse approves an intergovernmental agreement between the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department and the University of Mississippi for extra police services. Resolution 2022-1887 sponsors Hancock and Roten authorizes the Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency to enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of at valorum taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 6 616 North DuPont Avenue known as Birch Birchstone Village. Resolution 2022-1888 sponsors wrote in Syracuse and Suara appropriates $200,000 from the Office of Family Safety to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive community partnership fund grants. Resolution 2022-1890, sponsors wrote in Syracuse, approves an application for an emergency management performance grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Metropolitan Office of Emergency Management to subsidize the emergency management program. Resolution 2022-1891, sponsors wrote in Syracuse, approves an application for the DWR ARP non-collaborative grants, state water infrastructure program grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metropolitan Nashville Water and sewer services department to modernize and upgrade the dry creek water reclamation facility and that concludes the items that are on the consent agenda does anything need to come off okay committee reports i was here <laughs> council member roten thank you pro tim um resolution 2022 1884 11 in favor zero against 2022-1885, 11 in favor, zero against. 2022-1887, 11 in favor, zero against. 1888, 11 in favor, zero against. Uh, 1890, 11 in favor, zero against. 1891, 11 in favor, zero against. And I think that's it. All right. Councilwoman Hauser, I skipped over you. Yes, the um, Affordable Housing Committee, on RS 2022-1886, six in favor, zero against. And on RS 2022-1887, six in favor, zero against. 1886. Okay. Okay. Council Mayor Syracuse, Public Health and Safety. Thank you, Pro Tem. I think all these were on consent. 1884, 1885, 1888. 1889, 1890, and 1891. Public Health and Safety voted six in favor, zero against. Thank you. And Councilwoman Murphy rules. Thank you. Um, I think some of these got pulled, but they should have stayed on consent. 1880, okay. 1892, 1893, 1894, all six in favor, zero against. All right, can I get a motion? Move for approval on all consent agendas. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Only one thing got bumped off. Only one thing got bumped off of consent. Oh, they all did. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Okay, we're back on um, resolutions that were not on the consent agenda. First one up is item number 46, RS 2022-1827 by Withers, Roden, and Hurt. Resolution approving a term sheet describing the terms and conditions of the agreements and transactions required to finance, construct, and operate a new enclosed multi-purpose stadium on the East Bank subject to the subsequent approval of final agreements and authorizing the Metropolitan government to pursue other matters related thereto. Council Member Withers, uh, you recognized on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Could I get committee reports, please? Yep. Uh, public Facilities, Arts, and Culture. That is, who's, who's got that one? Oh, Council Member Bradford. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So, Public Facilities, we voted nine in favor, none against on the First Amendment. We did not make a recommendation on the Second Amendment. 
the resolution as amended one time. We voted nine in favor, none against for one meeting deferral. For one meeting deferral. Okay, thank you. Back to budget and finance. Council member Roten. Uh, budget approved a one meeting deferral, 12 in favor, zero against. Okay, did you all act on the amendments or not? We did not. Okay, all right, back to you, Council member Withers. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move a one meeting deferral with just a very brief comment. All right, so the motion is to uh, defer one meeting uh, properly seconded back to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, deferring this uh, so that it will, uh, one meeting so that it will uh, come back before us on at our next meeting on December 20th. Uh, this allows uh, the um, East Bank Stadium Committee's public comment meetings to continue. The next one is actually tomorrow at 6 p.m. at the Bellevue Regional Community Center. So I look forward to seeing many of you. Uh, in a few hours, but um, with that, I renew my motion to uh, defer one meeting. <laughs> So the oh, motion, and, and Mr. Vice Mayor, if, if I may as well, I know we've we've had some discussion so far on some of the amendments. Um, all amendments that are presented, uh, we'll just take them all at one time uh, on December twentieth, okay. if that's okay. All right. All right. So the motion is to defer one meeting, RS twenty twenty two eighteen twenty seven, properly seconded. Discussion on the deferral. Okay, we're ready to vote on the deferral motion. All those in favor of the deferral uh, for, uh, for one meeting of RS 2022, 1827, one meeting deferral, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. This one's deferred one meeting. All right, let me make sure I've got all this stuff. Did this one come off? Okay. All right, we're on item number 47, RS 2022, 1880, by Councilmember Stiles and Allen, a resolution recognizing the 30th anniversary of Saloa Mail. Councilmember Stiles, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Just really quickly, I wanted to move for approval and I wanted to institute the Murphy rule so we try and get everyone on there. All right, we need a committee report. Uh, rules. I'll take one of those soon. There All right, go. Council Member Murphy. Uh, I gave it during consent since this should have stayed on consent. Six in favor, zero against. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to you, Council Member Stiles. To move for approval, please. Okay, so motion to approve, properly seconded, and you want uh, everybody voting in the affirmative on the resolution. Yes, please. All right, uh, without objection, we'll do that. Any discussion on the resolution? Seeing none. All those in favor of RS 2022, 1880 for passage, say aye. Opposed, no. This one is adopted. Okay, next one is item number 50. There where I am. Uh, RS 2022 1886 by Council Members Toombs and Roten. Uh, resolution authorizing the Metropolitan De Development and Housing Agency to negotiate and enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 334, 336, and 336A Ewing Drive, known as Ewing Heights. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report. Okay, affordable housing. And I got budget and finance, uh, Council Member Roten. Uh, budget and finance approved 11 in favor, zero against with one uh, abstention. Okay, and Council Member Hauser, you've got affordable housing. We approve six in favor, zero against. Okay, back to you, Council Member Toombs. Thank you, move for approval. Okay, so I got a motion to approve uh, RS 2022, 1886, properly seconded. Council Member Van Rees has to abstain. All right, any discussion on the resolution? Seeing none, all those in favor of the resolution say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, and one abstention, Councilman Van Rees, resolution passes. Okay, we're now on uh, item number 53. RS 2022, 1889 by Councilmember Roten, Syracuse, Evans, and Sawara. Resolution approving a grant contract between the Metropolitan Government acting by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health and the Mental Health Cooperative to provide outreach assessment linkage to care for individuals identified by the Nashville Fire Department's EMS as part of the High Impact Area Opioid Overdose Response Program. Councilmember Roten, you're recognized. Move approval. Uh, let's get committee reports, public health and safety. Councilmember Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Public health and safety recommended approval. Six in favor, zero against. All right. Right, budget and finance, Council Member Roten. Budget approved, 11 in favor, zero against, with one abstention. Okay, uh, so I got a motion to approve on Council Member Roten. Properly seconded, any discussion? And then we have one person that needs to abstain, is that correct? Council Member Hurt left tonight, so. Okay, all right, and then we're, we're good to go. Um, Second time, no. RS 2022, 1889, Council Member Roten has moved for approval of the resolution, again, properly seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Resolution passes. Fifty-six. 
Okay, RS 2022 1892. Uh, that's item number 56. Council Member Benedict Bradford Van Riesen Weathers resolution recognizing the LGBTQ community and remembering the victims of the Club Q shooting in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Council Member Benedict, you're recognized on the resolution. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Um, I have got uh, rules confirmations. Council Member Murphy. Six in favor, zero against. Council Member Benedict. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move approval with brief comment. Uh, Brief comments. Okay, so Council Member Benedict has moved approval of RS 2022-1892 um, to approve the resolution properly seconded back to you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. This resolution honors the five souls who were lost on November 19th, as well as the 18 injured and countless witnesses who were traumatized at Club Q in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Since the Club Q shooting, 16 more people have been killed and 27 have been injured in mass shootings in Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and California. We have a pandemic in this country and we know that we do, yet we do nothing to change that. Just today, MNPD released a statement that, quote, an alarming number of guns continue to be stolen from Nashville vehicles, end quote, with over 1,800 guns stolen year to date. This is a number that has only increased due to gun rights laws that help put more dangerous weapons into the hands of more dangerous people. Most mass shootings are with automatic weapons like the AR-15, which was used in Colorado Springs at Club Q. The AR-15 is a weapon that is specifically designed for mass killing. It is not a gun that is designed for hunting or other sport firearm use. There is a growing climate in this country and in this state that is creating a danger for marginalized communities such as our LGBTQ fellows. In the past couple of weeks, a Supreme Court justice and a Nashville area congressman came out to target marriage equality and transgender rights. This rhetoric is leading to more brazen attacks by former outliers that are too often becoming commonplace in our society. Just this morning, it was reported that over the past weekend, four LGBTQ events were targeted by hate groups, some of which were armed. This has to stop. This hate changes no one and it is not helpful to anyone. And worse, it is harmful. It is harmful to many. Thoughts and prayers are not enough. As we honor those who we lost and were injured at Club Q on November 19th, let's honor them by praying with our feet instead of with our thoughts. Take action to stop these senseless and preventable massacres. These victims and their families are begging us to take action. With that, I move approval. And should it be the will of this body, I ask that everyone voting in the affirmative be included as a sponsor to the resolution. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilmember Benedict. Without objection, everybody will be included as a sponsor who votes in the affirmative. Uh, discussion, uh, Councilmember Bradford, okay. All right, anybody else want to be heard on the resolution? Thank you, Council Member Benedict. Uh, we are voting on RS 2022, 1892. It's um, been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Resolution passes. Uh, next one is are we on 57? Did that one get bumped? Uh, RS 2022 1893 by Councilmember Hancock. Resolution congratulating Metropolitan Water Services, the recipient of the 2022 Tennessee Solar Energy Industries Association, the Solar Champion Award. Councilmember Hancock, you recognize? Um, in support of the great award, the 2022 Tennessee Solar Champion Award that our staff worked very hard to earn. I would like everyone without objection voting in the affirmative to be added as a sponsor so that when we present this, they can see us unified in our support of them. Okay, without objection, we'll do it. Did we get a committee report on this one? Did it come up on consent? It did, so we got already have the committee report on it. Okay. Okay, all right. So uh, Council Member Hancock has moved for passage of RS 2022-1893. Properly second, everybody voting in the affirmative will be listed as a sponsor. Uh, no discussion. Um, all those in favor of 1893 for passage say aye. 
Opposed, no. 1893 passes. RS 2022 1894, resolution recognizing the 10th anniversary of the American Muslim Advisory Council. Um, Councilmember Sepulveda, Tombs, Styles, uh, and others are the sponsors. Councilmember Tombs, I'm going to give this one to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report. Uh, rules confirmations, Councilmember Murphy. Six in favor, zero against. All right, Councilmember Tombs, back to you. And I believe this was pulled to invoke the Murphy rule, uh, and I would move for approval. Okay. So Councilmember Toombs has asked everybody voting in the affirmative on this one be listed as a sponsor. Um, Councilmember Toombs has moved for approval, approval of RS 2022-1894, properly seconded. Any discussion, seeing none. All those in favor of RS 2022-1894 for passage, say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, resolution passes. All right, uh, that completes all bills, uh, all resolutions on the consent uh, and regular uh, resolution calendar. Uh, we're on bills on introduction and first reading. There are several bills I think that need to be, need to come off of this. Um, let me see, let me make sure I've got this one. It looks like item number 61, Council Member Benedict, BL 2022-1581 needs to come off, is that right? Okay, that's correct. Okay, so item 61 comes off of consent, uh, off of the regular first reading, um, sorry, the first reading calendar. Item number 80 by Council Member O'Connell, Bill 2022-1600. Does that come off? Okay, item number 80 comes off. Let's see, item number 98 by Council Member Syracuse, Bill 2022 1618 comes off of consent, uh, off of the regular first reading calendar. And item number 99 by Council Member Roberts, that comes off, Bill 2022 1619. And that's all I've got. Anything else needs to come off of first reading? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll take all other bills on first reading at the same time. I need a motion to approve uh, all other bills on first reading. I got a motion properly seconded. Any discussion on the first uh, on bills on first reading? On the. Um, we good. Okay, okay, so uh, except for the four, we'll take all bills on introduction, first reading all at the same time. I got a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're voting on uh, all bills on introduction, first reading. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Bills on introduction, first reading, pass. Now we're gonna take up the exceptions. Item number 61, BL 2022-1581 by Council Members Benedict, Sledge, O'Connell, and Weathers. This is an ordinance regarding Metropolitan Code Section 17.12.040 and 17.28.103 to regulate the location of electric utility meters in residential areas and to amend the requirements for underground utilities for new residential developments. Council Member Benedict, you're recognized on the bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. If I could defer to Director Darby for an explanation. All right, uh, Ms. Darby. Do you want an explanation about what it is that you intend to do here? That is uh, correct. The council member would like to pass this on first reading and defer the public hearing until February. Oh, that's right. Thank that's you. That's what you want to do. All right, that's the motion. Um, so uh, pass on first reading and defer the public hearing to the first meeting in February, properly seconded. Any discussion on that one? Ms. Darby, you have any questions on that one? All right. <laughs> All those in favor of the uh, motion, um, it's been properly seconded. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, this one uh, passes. First reading and uh, hearing, the public hearing will be the first meeting in February. Uh, next item is uh, item number 80, Bill 2022-1600 by Council Member O'Connell. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from CF to SP zoning for properties located at 1503, 1509, 1511, 1515, and 1517 McGavick Street, 1.87 acres located at the southwest corner of 14th Avenue South and McGavick Street located within the Art Center Redevelopment Overlay District of the Music Row Urban Design Overlay District. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I need to suspend the rules, please. Okay. So, um, 
Council Member, Sir, uh, Council Member O'Connor wants to suspend the rules because you have to, I think you have to do that to um, get an SP and I'll explain, screen. yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> did you go to the rules committee on this one? Uh, Ms. Darby advised that I was not required have to. to. Okay, because of the nature of it with the SP. All right, so um, Council Member O'Connell is moving to suspend the rules. Let me let you explain why you need to suspend the rules. Sure, thank you, Mr. President. This is an unusual um, scenario where the um, the buyer and seller of the property had some timing issues, but the planning process is already underway. This will be heard by the Planning Commission on Thursday, so the we will have what I hope is our approval for this. Um, if something goes wrong there, obviously I'm not gonna bring a disapproved bill, um, but the in order to keep the bill tracking, in order to allow the property to close on time, just needed to file this bill a little earlier than usual, so I apologize to colleagues for um, the timing circumstance, but procedurally, this will eventually look like everything else. It will go through the Planning Commission. We will have a recommendation. Um, it will have the traditional three meetings. All right, so Council Member O'Connell is moving to suspend the rules to get, um, what are we trying to get in front of us? Just the, the bill on first because it, has, it, it doesn't have a planning recommendation right now. Okay. That's why. Okay, now I've got it. Okay, so that's why Council Member O'Connell is moving to suspend the rules. Any objection to suspension of the rules? Seeing none, rules are suspended. Council Member O'Connell, you're on your bill. Thank you. I'd like to move approval of the brief comment. All right. So, uh, Council Member O'Connell is moving Bill 2022 1600 for passage on first reading, properly seconded back to you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to reiterate, from this point forward with the bill filed, it will go through the traditional um, planning commission process and come back to us, and we will consider it just like any other zoning bill, but appreciate colleagues' support on first reading. Uh, to support the timing issue. Thank you. All right, so Council Member O'Connell has moved the, uh, moved passage of Bill 2022 1600 for uh, passage on first reading. Again, it's properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor uh, of the bill on first reading say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill passes on first reading. Uh, item number 98, Bill 2022 1618 by Council Member Syracuse. It's an ordinance to amend Title 17 by applying a contextual overlay district to various properties located east of Pennington Road and northeast of McGavick Road, zoned RS 30. Council Member Syracuse, you recognize. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm going to move for indefinite deferral. Okay, so Council Member Syracuse is moving for indefinite deferral. Properly seconded. Any discussion on this one? Seeing none, uh, ready to vote on the motion for indefinite deferral on 1618. All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion to defer indefinitely passes. We're on item number 99, BL 2022-1619, ordinance to amend title 17. By change from R6 SV zoning for property located at 6111 Cowden Avenue. It's approximately 215 feet west of uh, Marsha Avenue, it's 29 acres. Councilmember Roberts, you recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to pass this tonight and defer the public hearing until February 7th. All right, so it's a motion to pass on first reading and have the public hearing uh, on the first meeting in February. Okay, that's the motion properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes. All right, we have one. Um, Late filed bill, this is by uh, Council Member Taylor. Council Member Taylor, you're recognized on your late filed bill. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to suspend the rules. Okay, let me. I'm just, I'm looking for your bill in my packet so I can actually read it. Hold on. Reread it. Okay, it's an ordinance to authorize building material restrictions and requirements for BL 2022-1570, proposed Pacific Plan Zoning District for a portion of property located at 3138, property at 3140 Parthenon Avenue. The proposed ordinance requires certain materials to be restricted in the construction of buildings. Um, Council Member Taylor, um, this is a late file. Do you want to try to get it in on first reading? Did it go to the Rules Committee? Indeed it did. Council Member Murphy, did you all have an objection to a late file bill by Council Member Taylor? 
I would like to publicly commend Councilman Taylor for going through a thorough grilling about the definition and exact nature of his emergency. And he was a very good sport about it. And you all should take notes from him if you have an emergency, expect to be thoroughly grilled. Thank you, Councilman Taylor. We did not have an objection. All right. Councilmember Taylor is moving to suspend the rules to get this matter before us tonight. Is there any objection to suspension of the rules? Seeing none, rules are suspended. Councilmember Taylor, you're on your late filed bill. All right, thanks. I would like to move for approval and give a brief explanation. All right, so Councilmember Taylor has moved for approval of the late filed bill, properly seconded. You're recognized. Thank you. So. Uh, Earlier tonight, we uh, deferred a bill uh, on public hearing uh, so we could track this bill with that bill uh, for the materials restriction so they could pass together. Uh, and they both have to have a public hearing and so we can have those public hearings together as well. And so I would like to go ahead and get this added today as uh, uh, to the calendar and hopefully move for approval so then when we take up the legislation, they're both on public hearing at the same time and they track together well. All right, so uh, Council Member uh, Taylor has moved approval of late filed bill. When is the public hearing? In January, first meeting in January. Okay, so you move for approval of um, uh, the bill tonight and it'll show up on public hearing in the first meeting in January. All right, that's the motion properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion to approve? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Opposed, no. Um, it passes. All right, we're now on bills on second reading. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through the items that are on the consent agenda for second reading. Um, so item number 109, BL 2022-1469 is on consent. Uh, BL 2022-1573, which is item number 116, is on consent. 1574 is on consent. 1575 on consent. 1576 is on consent and 1577 is on consent. Anything needs to be bumped off of the second reading consent calendar. <clears throat> okay, so um, here we go on the second reading consent calendar, item number 109, BL 2022-1469 by Council Member Cash. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by amending the Primrose Neighborhood Urban Design Overlay to clarify several defining characteristics of the neighborhood for various properties starting at the corner of Brightwood Avenue and Primrose Avenue. Again, that's by Council Member Cash. Next item is item number 116, BL 2022-1573 by Council Member Sledge, Roden, Hurt, and Pulley, an ordinance approving an agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Market Street Management, LLC, concerning the construction of public infrastructure improvements on the Fairground Campus. Item number 117, BL 2022 1574 by Councilmember Rosenberg. Ordinance of providing the honorary street name designation of Valor Memorial Lane for a portion of Macquarie Lane. Item number 118, BL 2022 1575, Van Rees, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to accept new sanitary sewer mains and sanitary sewer manholes for property located 211 Walton Lane. Item number 119, BL 2022 1576, Robert Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to abandon existing public water mains and to accept new water mains and sanitary sewer manholes for property located at 223 Osceola Avenue, also known as Chelsea at Osceola. Item number 120, Bill 2022-1577 by Council Member Sledge, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance to authorize the Metropolitan Government of to accept a new water main for property located at 101 Factory Street. Anything needs to be pumped, pulled off of second reading consent. All right, I need a couple of committee reports in uh, budget and finance. Council member Roden, you've got 1573. Budget and finance um, approved, 12 in favor, zero against. All right, thank you. Council member Withers, you've got a couple. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. The uh, Planning and Zoning Committee met and considered ordinances bill 2022-1469.
1575, 1576, and 1577, and we recommended approval of each of those seven in favor, zero against, zero abstention. All right, thank you. Council Member Bradford, you've got 1573. 1573, we voted eight in favor, nine against, to approve. Okay, and Council Member Pulley, you've got the rest of them. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, transportation recommended approval of RS 2022 1573 through 1577. 12 in favor, zero against. And I recommend uh, I move approval of the uh, consent agenda on resolution. All right, Councilmember Pulley has moved to approval of the second reading consent agenda, properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of all those bills on second reading consent say aye. Opposed, no, you adopt. All right, <clears throat> go back and we'll pick up the ones that were not on second reading consent. <clears throat> Item number 110, BL 2022-1528, by Council Members Sepulveda, Tomb, Stiles, and Suara, and others. It's an ordinance amending Title II, Title VI, and Title VII of the Metropolitan Code of Laws to amend the membership of various boards and commissions. Council Member Suara, I think you're handling this one. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Any community reports? All right. Uh, government Operations, Council Member Benedict. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Government Operations and Regulations Committee de uh, voted to defer this one time. Six in favor, zero against. All right. Council Member Murphy, rules confirmation. Defer one meeting. Six in favor, zero against. All right. Council Member Swarm, you're recognized. Um, yes. Uh, Council Member Superbida is not feeling very well. Keep her in your prayers. I hope she feels better. Uh, but she does want me to, well, by rule, defer for one meeting. All right, so this is going to be deferred uh, one meeting. That's the motion is to defer one meeting. Again, properly seconded. All those in favor of the deferral say aye. Opposed, no. This one's deferred one meeting. Um, we're on number item number 111, BL 2022 1529. Uh, this is Withers, Roten, and Hurt, Ordinance Amending Chapter 5.12 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated Section 67 4 1415, by increasing the hotel occupancy privilege tax in the amount of 1%, directing the proceeds to be used for the construction of and future capital improvements to a new enclosed stadium and debt service. Councilmember Withers, you're recognized on the uh, bill. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I know we do have an amendment on this as well, but... Um, you, you've got a couple of committee reports uh, due. Yeah. Uh, public facilities, Council Member Bradford. Public facilities, we voted nine in favor, none against for the amendment. And nine in favor, none against to approve. Okay, thank you. And Budget and Finance, Council Member Roten. I'm sorry, there you go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, we approved... The bill as amended 10 in favor, two against. The amendment was put on in the last meet at the last meeting, and I do not have what that exact vote was on my report here in front of me. It's okay. okay. Uh, so the amendment was approved. Um, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Back to you, Council Member Withers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move approval, but also to uh, would like to move the amendment. All right, so um, let's get the amendment on, uh, or at least uh, attempt to get the amendment on first. Uh, Council Member Withers is uh, moving an amendment to BL 2022-1529, properly seconded back to you for an explanation of the amendment. Uh, if I could please call on Director Darby to explain it, because it's late and I might forget some aspect All of right. it. All right, uh, Ms. Darby. Um, certainly. So uh, because the term sheet itself states that it's a non-binding term sheet, this adds language to a recital that the term sheet is also non-binding within the legislation, and it changes the um, effective date from a date certain to um, requiring that the effectiveness will not occur until after approval of the uh, final binding documents to construct the stadium has been approved. All right. Council Member Withers. Thank you. And I, I think that... Uh, Appreciate the explanation from Director Darby. I, I think that the um, reassurance that we are, that this is non-binding, uh, as well as the reassurance that this would not take effect until all of the truly binding documents are agreed upon, uh, I think should give comfort to those of us on the body as we continue to deliberate this uh, going forward. But with that, I would... Uh, renew my motion to approve the amendment. All right, so Council Member Withers is uh, moving um, uh, the amendment on BL 2022-1529, can properly second it. Okay, so discussion on the amendment. I've got people in the queue. Council Member Parker on the amendment? On the bill? 
Council Member Swope. Bill. In the bill, Council Member O'Connell. Council Member Sawara. Yeah. Anybody on the amendment? All right, so we're voting on the amendment, uh, Bill 2022 Council Member Withers has moved the amendment on that bill. Can properly second it. We're voting on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Yep. Opposed, no. Amendment passes. Council Member Withers, you're on your bill as amended. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, renew my motion to approve um, this um, hotel occupancy tax was approved by the state. It has a very limited scope. I know we hear a lot of public comment about couldn't you do other things with the funds and, and I wish that there were other things that we could do with the funds sometimes, but the state le uh, legislation that passed uh, to enable this tax is very specific that it can only be used for a new stadium and specifically an enclosed stadium. So um, there is not a whole lot on this that the Metro Council uh, can change through additional amendments, although as I understand it, uh, we can still certainly entertain those on third reading. Um, but it is important, I think, to go ahead and pass this tonight on second. We will still have a deliberation on third reading uh, in two weeks. Okay, so Council Member Withers is moving approval of Bill 2022-1529 as amended for passage on second reading. Properly seconded. Uh, discussion, Council Member Parker, you recognized. Um, thank you. Director Darby, could you clarify, this is, um, it's not zoning legislation, but it is amendable on third reading? Yeah, it's a tax ordinance, which is also another item that's amendable on third reading. Okay, thank you. Um, that was my question. All right, thank you, Councilmember Parker. Uh, Councilmember Swope. Call the question. Previous question's been called. We're not voting on the uh, bill, we're, or we're voting on the previous question. All those in favor of the previous question say aye. Yes. Opposed, no. no. Previous question prevails. All right, so we are now voting on um, BL 2022-1529 as amended. Council Member Withers has moved um, that for passage properly seconded. Uh, we're on um, the bill as amended. All those in favor of BL 2022-1529 as amended for passage on second reading say aye. Yes. Opposed, no. I heard a couple of no's. Just um, Councilmember Mendez is a no. Who else is a no? Councilmember Benedict. Anybody else? Welsh. Councilmember Welsh. Councilmember Parker. Anybody else? Okay. So bill passes as amended on second reading. All right. Item number 112, BL 2022, 1530, by Council Members Cash, Mendez, uh, Bradford, Benedict, and Allen. Ordinance to amend Chapter 1320 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws to restrict obstructions within the public way or public right of way. Council Member Cash, you're recognized. Committee reports, please. All right. I've got government ops. Government operations gave no recommendation last time. Government operations, who has got that one? Council Member Benedict. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We approved as amended, seven in favor, zero against. All right. Uh, Council Member Cash, you're recognized. Uh, there is uh, an amendment. It's friendly to me, but uh, Council Member Henderson is the sponsor. All right. Uh, uh, Council Member Henderson uh, for the amendment on Bill 2022-1530. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, and I appreciate uh, Councilman Cash uh, co-signing onto the amendment with me and um, his willingness to uh, defer uh, for um, uh, one meeting to confer with the department. Um, what I wanted to make sure we were doing, colleagues, is I look through this section of the code um, for Public Works and NDOT. We have had over the years historically a lot of old out-of-date fees um, for which we do need some updated fee studies. And I was just a little worried that we were, um, uh, you know, the, the, the work of this uh, ordinance is very important, but in, in proceeding with it, we were sort of reaffirming um, uh, some of these uh, outdated fees. And so I had asked the administration if we could please move to throughout this section of the code going forward, just standard language um, that allows uh, the department, um, uh, the, the discretion per fee studies um, to update these such that we are not um, codifying 
um, these fees, like you know, ten dollars to put a dumpster in the right of way, et cetera. So um, that is the intent of this amendment. Um, and with that, I would move the amendment. All right. So Council, answer any questions. Councilman Henderson has moved an amendment to BL 2022-1530 properly seconded. She explained the amendment. Questions on the amendment? Councilmember O'Connell on the amendment? Okay. Any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment to BL 2022-1530 say aye. Aye. Opposed no. Amendments on. Councilmember Cash, you're now on your bill as amended. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is basically a bill that uh, addresses long-term uh, lane closures or obstructions in the right-of-way, st uh, st street lane closures, bike lane closures, sidewalk closures, um, often due to construction. Uh, basically, if it's seven days or more, the applicant, the permit applicant needs to go to, um, a, to NDOT and get a, an exception, uh, uh, be granted an exception, and they uh, NDOT has like a three specific um, types of exceptions. Uh, so it's a narrower uh, type of except, a narrower um, uh, range of of granting something long seven days or, or more. Um, there is a committee, an exception committee with a number of different like types of professionals that will review these uh, requests for exceptions. Um, there, there will be a plan that's required, like for example, in um, sidewalks, uh, they'll need to have like scaffolding so that there's still a route for pedestrians to travel, um, traffic plans, stuff like that. Um, the uh, I want to uh, walk bike Nashville uh, kind of uh, forced the issue or or lobbied for uh, us to address this better and there was a policy change I think in late August early September um, and the le and so there was a policy change and the legislation a couple of months later came out of that which I was happy to sponsor. All right, so Councilmember Cash is moving approval of BL 2022-1530 as amended for passage on second reading, properly seconded. Um, Councilmember O'Connell, discussion on the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate Councilmember Cash bringing this and I appreciate the advocacy that led to it. I think it's worth taking a walk down memory lane closure, however. Uh, in BL 2016-240, which became known as the Don't Block My Walk Bill, uh, resulted in a bicycle and pedestrian work zone safety regulations. Let me read a couple sections of this. Each applicant submitting a permit application to the director, which will result in the blockage of a sidewalk, bicycle lane, or other public bicycle or pedestrian path for more than 20 calendar days, shall submit for approval by the director a traffic management plan that addresses reasonable accommodation for pedestrians and bicyclists before the issuance of a permit by the director. There's a whole section on the traffic management plan that is there. There are the requirements and event of traffic management plan disruption. There are the requirements for permit display. Before commencing any activities that result in the blockage of a sidewalk, bicycle lane, or other pedestrian or bicycle path, the party requesting a public right-of-way occupancy permit authorizing the blockage must display said permit at a prominent publicly accessible location near the construction site entrance and must simultaneously display the following information. The range of dates during which the permit is valid, the name and contact information of the party requesting the permit, the reason for the blockage, and a phone number and email address that citizens may use to direct questions, comments, and concerns regarding the blockage to the director. When we passed this bill and had this policy in place, I actually issued a bounty for signs that somebody was putting those permits up. In a period of several months, I received exactly one piece of evidence that this was ever displayed. It is often not the quality of our legislation, it is the quality of the execution that matters to people. We have basically already passed this bill. We passed a version of it in 2016. You know, here we are six years later passing the bill again. I sure hope that this time we execute. All right, thank you. Council Member, Council Member Cash. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate the, the work that Councilman uh, O'Connell brings up that happened in the last, in the previous term. Um, and you ag agree and, com and uh, I'm frustrated that sometimes we have to revisit and we have to 
continue to push for enforcement. And I do hope that uh, this turns out differently. Um, I, I think it will. Is it going to be, um, is it going to eliminate all um, obstructions in the right of way? No, it's a shorter period before they have to apply for an exception. Um, and I wanna also add that the mayor's office and NDOT worked really hard on this. Um, for months and worked with you know developers and, de and the development community and worked with uh, Walk Bike Nashville, as I already mentioned. Um, and uh, Mr. Jameson, you were a part of, uh, you were on the, um, working for the council in 2016 and have been a part of the mayor's office. Would you like to um, share what, how you think this is different? <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Mr. Jamison. Am I required to comment? Or you're not required I, to comment. You're not required to comment. I think if you're right. You, I know you and I have talked about the differences and you explained it to me well, but that was a few weeks ago. But I, I subscribe to the school of thought that if you're ahead, you should just stop talking. Thank you. All right. I think uh, uh, we move. call that a warm wind blowing, not a cool wind, a warm wind blowing. <laughs> uh, move the bill. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, the motion is to pass on second reading, BL 2022-1530 as amended. It's been properly seconded. Nobody else in the queue. All those in favor of the bill say aye. Aye. Those no. Bill as amended passes on second reading. Item number 113, Bill 2022-1533 by Council Members Rosenberg, Roden, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance accepting an easement on certain property located at 7034 Charlotte Pike, uh, owned by Lowe's Home Centers. Um, who's handling this one? Council Member Roden? Council Member Roden. It's, I didn't know I was handling, but I guess I am. So here we go. So um, move approval. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of committee reports in. Uh, let's go through it. Budget and Finance, Council Member Roten. Uh, budget and Finance. Um, the amendment was uh, passed 11 in favor, one against, and the bill as amended, 12 in favor, zero against. All right, Planning and Zoning, Council Member Withers, 1533. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Planning and Zoning um, voted in favor of the bill Seven in favor, zero against, zero abstentions, as well as the amendment um, that was offered by Councilmember Rosenberg. Uh, we all um, voted for that seven in favor, zero against, zero abstentions, and the same for the bill as amended with the Rosenberg um, yep. amendment. I think there's a later amendment that was not available at the time that we met. All right. Uh, public facilities, Councilmember Bradford. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The first amendment, we voted eight in favor, none against, one not in voting. For the late filed amendment from Druffle, we voted nine in favor, none against. As the bill as amended, as amended, we voted nine in favor, none against. All right. Transportation Infrastructure, Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, transportation and Infrastructure considered this, and the proposed amendment by Council Member Rosenberg was not offered. The proposed late amendment by Councilmember Druffel, we recommended approval, 12 in favor, zero against, and then recommended approval of the bill as amended, 12 in favor, zero against. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Pulley. All right, so back to you, Councilmember Roten, uh, bill 2022-1533. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I, uh, <laughs> Council Member Rosenberg and I spoke earlier tonight, and so what I'm gonna be doing, and someone can correct me if, if I do this wrong, um, Council Member Druffel has a late filed amendment that I believe Council Member Rosenberg is okay with. And it was some changes that were made by the administration to fix some language. Uh, I think it's late filed, so I need to move to suspend the rules. Well, so let's do this. Uh, apparently, Councilmember Rosenberg has an amendment on the bill as well. Is uh, it's, it's my bill now, and I'm not offering that amendment. You're not offering that amendment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Okay, so Council Member Druffel has a late filed amendment. Council Member Druffel, you're recognized. Yeah, I move to uh, suspend the rules. Okay, so Council Member Druffel has moved to suspend the rules to get a late filed amendment in on the bill. Council Member Murphy. 
I mean, having, Sergeant Murphy, I believe. <laughs> yes, Sergeant Murphy. <laughs> having seen what uh, Councilman Taylor went through, Councilman Druffel was Johnny on the spot with a, a, a an acceptable emergency uh, that this will expedite housing, and so we felt it was an approvable emergency. All right. So, Councilmember Druffel, uh, you're moving to suspend the rules to get this amendment, this late filed amendment, before you. Before Thank you, this uh, Johnny on the spot, uh, alias. Um, yeah, I, the, the, really the language is just to clarify what circumstances the easement's allowed. Uh, there's a little bit more to that, but it's really just clarifying language. Uh, Councilman Rosenberg was fine with this um, and, and uh, moved for approval. All right, so you got to move to suspend the rules first. I'll move to suspend the rules. Okay. Moving to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspend the rules to get the late filed amendment in? All right, so there's two objections, so um, we can't hear the amendment tonight. Okay. Move to defer one meeting. All right, so Councilman Roden has moved to defer uh, one meeting, properly seconded. Discussion on the deferral motion? Any discussion on the deferral motion? Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor, um, and I apologize. I was, I was speaking with Ms. Hayes just as this, as this began, but um, would Councilman Druffel, as it pertains to the deferral, would you support the timely filed amendment of Councilman Rosenberg so that this can move forward at this time, or you would prefer to wait the next meeting so that you could advance your amendment? I, I, in committee, uh, it seemed that the both amendments were compatible with each other. And so I know that yours offers a little bit more precision, but um, I just wanted to offer that in the interest of moving it forward or just inquire vice mayor Council as it relates Member. to my support of the deferral or not. Council Member uh, Truffle. Yeah, I, I, I would defer uh, to Mr. Jamison a little bit on the language because we were trying to clean up the language and gave a little bit more um, uh, precision as, as Council Lady Henderson suggested. Mr. Jamison. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So Councilman Rosenberg's amendment essentially said this goes into effect once the uh, current occupants have been provided housing. So uh, first uh, stumbling block was what does it mean to provide? Does it mean we just made it available to them and if they don't take it, that's still being provided or not? Also needed and, and worked with Dave, uh, Councilman Rosenberg on do we have an agreed cutoff date? In other words, if we have every member uh, of the encampment housed uh, and then someone else comes in later and, and moves on to the site, would that not frustrate? So uh, favorable discussions with Councilman uh, Rosenberg to have um, an as of December 6th date applying to the occupants. And then we wanted, with his permission, to specifically reference the encampment strategy under the continuum of care. That's important because that provides a variety of terms and conditions that are specifically defined. But most importantly is what it makes sure of is this is a matter of policy, of HUD policy. You have to extend housing opportunities before you relocate an individual from public property. And uh, um, HUD guidelines, also the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, specifically state within their guidelines, encampment should not be closed unless there is access to low barrier shelter or housing. So by specifically referencing the encampment strategy, we thought we were uh, <coughs> clarifying Councilman Rosenberg's objective with a bit more specificity with an agreed upon deadline, avoiding this providing ambiguity. He was comfortable with it. He shared that with me. He shared that with Councilman Dreffel. Um, that will be the policy even if no amendment goes on. And so we would not see the need for a deferral uh, tonight. But if, if either amendment uh, were to be passed, we think Councilman Druffles has more clarity and we understand Councilman Rosenberg to be in favor. Councilman Mary Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. That clarifies um, regarding deferral support or not. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Council Member Roten, we're on your motion to defer. I withdraw the motion to defer and move approval. All right, so um, so now we've got a motion to approve BL 2022-1533 for passage on second reading, properly seconded discussion. Uh, Council Member Allen. Thank you. Um, I can't tell if this is a zoning bill. Is this amendable on third? I don't think so. It's not a zoning 
it seems like we're losing the opportunity to put some clarifying language in. Did, is that what we wanted to do? Again, I guess I get, would ask the administration again, I understand that your, your language is a clarification of the amendment. It, it seems like in the end, it's ultimately made this a better bill or, or was that just to fix the amendment? It does clarify it, but it doesn't alter the requirement under HUD guidelines and under the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness that the continuum of care subscribes to, that we do not uh, apply until the uh, current residents have been offered um, housing. Okay, so that provision is in in here simply because of the reference to the HUD anyway, so we're not losing anything by it in, not... It is in the policy. There's it, no reference to the HUD because we didn't have our late filed uh, adopted, but it is in the policy of, of application. Before we can go forward, you have to make the housing available or the, I'm sorry, the encampment should okay. not be closed unless there is access to low barrier shelter or housing. And we're required to adhere to that policy. Correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, Council Member Hauser. <laughs> Um, to to speak to the second amendment the Dreffel put because I know the neighbors as well as those in the encampment need some definition and saying the definition of as of a certain date December 6th whatever date we choose those are the residents and it's people who just move in afterwards we're not they're not part of this that we have chosen a date which closes the door and this is very important because this doesn't mean this just goes on and on and on and on without having a date that says this is the folks that live there today, not after, that gives us an ability to eventually close this and return it to a park and make sure that all those individuals do have housing. So the administration bill that Drupal has signed on to gives us what is needed to actually eliminate the camp, make sure all those people do have housing, that that has been provided. So this, this is a very essential definition. All right, Council Member Sawara, and then I'm gonna come back to Council Member Dreffel. Thanks, Mayor. I, I just wanted to ask um, if we can put the Rosenberg Amendment back on there. I know that the Dreffel was, uh, that was voted down. Uh, but I do think for me the clarification that we would do that I know by policy we're required to, but having that language in there I think is still very important for me. And so I just wanted to know, is this something that we can, uh, uh, if somebody will move the Rosenberg Amendment, since Rosenberg is not here, can I move it? I mean, she can do it, right? You can move the amendment. Then I would like to move the Rosenberg Amendment. All right, so Council Member Suarez has moved uh, Council Member Rosenberg's amendment. Properly seconded discussion on Council Member Rosenberg's amendment. And I guess uh, somebody needs to explain exactly what Council Member Rosenberg's amendment does. So we have it in front of you. Mr. Jamison, do you want to do it or um, Ms. Darby, who's better? <laughs> who, who actually has knowledge of what the Rosenberg amendment does? Um, so this amendment is um, similar to the other one, but uh, it, it's, it states that the, it changes the effective date of the ordinance so that um, uh, it only takes effect upon the date as determined by the director of MHID that all occupants at 7002 Charlotte Pike have been provided with permanent or semi-permanent housing in accordance with Metro Nashville's coordinated entry process. All right, so Councilmember Swar has moved uh, Councilmember Rosenberg's amendment. It was properly seconded. Discussion on the amendment. All right, and I've got people in the queue. So anybody who wants to talk about the amendment probably needs to raise their hand. Councilmember Swope, you're recognized. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, a clarification, Ms. Darby, if you would. Uh, the Rosenberg amendment basically dictates that until everyone in the camp currently has housing, and is placed in housing, nothing else can happen. Is that correct? I don't agree that it says that if they're, they have to be placed in the housing. It says that they are provided with permanent or semi-permanent semi housing, and I think that that can be interpreted to mean provided with the opportunity for permanent or semi-permanent housing. But it doesn't say provided with opportunity. It says provided. 
provided, but I think that the word provided can mean provided with the opportunity. I think it's a slippery slope, um, and I'm going to vote no against the Rosenberg Amendment for that reason, because if you get if you get 79 people out of 80 to move, and then one person just refuses to, you're still in a stalemate. So I'm a no on this. So other people on the amendment. I've got uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I. I uh... I also be voting no on the Rosenberg Amendment. I, Councilman Rosenberg agreed with the Druffel Amendment because he recognized that we could make it better. He's not here to say that right now. I, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but that's the impression I get from this discussion. And we'd be better off defeating this amendment and if, if nothing better at the moment, defer this for one more meeting so we can add Councilman Druffel's uh, amendment if that's what the council desires for more clarity. All right, Council Member Welsh. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I think it's really important that we remember that um, with these ARP funding and things uh, for um, addressing homelessness, we're supposed to be going through a housing first um, format and, and approach and procedure and process. And that means we actually have permanent supporting housing with everything that people need to be successful in place before we just uh, shut down encampments and do other things. That is what Housing First is. That is what coordinated entry is. And this Druffel, the Druffel Amendment, um, offering housing is not actually giving people housing. And so basically you can say, I offered you a house and if you don't like it, well, you still have to get out and then you're still homeless and we just close. All we're doing is closing down encampments and not actually providing housing. And the, this is about actually providing housing. We shouldn't be rushing to close down encampments just to close down the encampment when people don't have housing and the supports they need to be successful. And that's what his amendment is about. And I think it's important that we have these housing options and it's very clearly stated, you're not just offered housing, you are actually put in housing. Well, so again, remember, we're not even on Council Member Druffel's amendment, we're on Council Member. But that's what uh, Council Member Rosenberg's amendment does. Okay. It's not a suggestion. It's getting people in housing as housing first and coordinated entry um, requires. All right, Councilmember Benedict, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm gonna go back to the definition of provide. I just did a quick Google. The very first definition says make, ab make available for use. So I just, I know that some, two of my colleagues said that they were going to vote against the amendment because it, that definition maybe isn't clear enough, but the very first definition that I see online is make available for use uh, for the word provide. So with that, I'm gonna support the Rosenberg Amendment and I hope that my colleagues do as well, understanding that that is the definition as uh, Director Darby explained as well. Thank you. All right. Anybody else on the amendment? Council Member Allen. Thank you, I, I wanna check again, does this amendment leave open the possibility of people continuing to move in and continuing to need to be provided housing? Director Darby, I guess that's directed to you. Yeah, it, it, this amendment does not have um, a, a date certain like the other amendment did, uh -huh. the late filed amendment. Um, it has the, uh, the trigger point is that Upon that, it would take effect upon the date as determined by the director of MHEAD that uh, housing had been provided, permanent or semi permanent housing had been provided. So, whenever a person made that determination, that's when this would become effective. And, and let me I, let me just look at it. And so, um, provided for who does it say? That's my question. The occupants at the uh, that 7002 Charlotte Pike. And so, if another occupant turns up when everybody else has been taken care of, she would still have to determine that that person had been provided. Is that where, we, where we've landed? It, yeah, it doesn't say that all occupants on a certain date, it says the date that she makes the determination. Gotcha, that, that, I mean, just to go back to what Council Member Hauser said, that, that seems problematic to me. I, I'm, I'm more comfortable with the, the ambig ambiguity of the word provide, but I'm still a little disturbed about the, the lack of a date certain on the, on, on what an occupant is. So I, 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 I do think it's very important that we ensure that these people, that the people who are there now are offered 
uh, housing, but I don't know that we want to open it up for, to infinity, which it seems like we just did. Councilmember Druffel. Yeah, uh, I just want to clarify because uh, we had the uh, Director of Homeless uh, Impact Division with us earlier, and she clarified, and, and to uh, answer, answer first of all, uh, Council Lady Welch's, uh, there was a combination of about 35, to, this is background information, uh, about 35 to 40 in the encampment. Uh, we have a combination of, of gap housing and permanent housing that's going to be given as it, 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 she couldn't define exactly, but they believe they had at least 60 potential housing options for those 35 people. So there was a significant support for that. That included support services and, and all the aspects with mental health, et cetera, that was around. And I, I'm just paraphrasing, I believe, uh, April's earlier comments. So this, this is significant in that it does allow uh, pretty significant uh, support services and transition. Uh, it also, if you look at uh, uh, Rosenberg's amendment, uh, the director of, uh, like we discussed, the Homeless Impact Division can make that determination. So if, and, and, and uh, Ms. Darby, if you could help me, I, I would imagine if, if, if that person determined it was December 10th and they determined that was the date that they had provided all options, then then she could claim that's the date that we stop uh, looking at new people. But I also would paraphrase some of her comments, just because that's the date doesn't mean that they aren't gonna start work, stop working with people, right? We have a ton of nonprofits and people that are actually actively involved with this process. Uh, I had a chance to sit in uh, probably seven or eight of these strategic planning meetings. Uh, all the unhoused, the 14 nonprofits were all active and completely aligned with this this program. So I have to say, uh, this isn't just sort of you know, some random idea. The background of this is very strong, very significant, discussed over three months, had a strong foundation with the belief of housing first, with with really giving uh, and providing the best of options. And if, you st if you'll take a look at what this happened just in a three day period where there was two unfortunate deaths, three overdoses and a couple of fires, I mean, you start to see that this was a, a relatively difficult um, encampment that really needed help. So I don't know if that helps any, but uh, but the reality is uh, there is a, a high level of importance to make some kind of move here. Uh, you know, I'm sorry we can't get better defined, but uh, it, you know, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more from the administration what their perception is. Mr. Jamison. Uh, I, I know I had originally suggested uh, no need to defer because I, I, I honestly believe that Councilman Rosenberg was conveying to me, to Councilman Dreffel, uh, to Councilman Nash, his, uh, his belief that the late filed amendment was an improvement upon two areas of his, of his amendment. Um, if there's not that certainty yet, if we're all more comfortable with Councilman Rosenberg being in here in person and telling you that, um, I would I would suggest a defer, at least a well just a one meeting deferral so that we can get that uh, clarified. Councilman Roten. Yeah, everybody. So before Dave left, we we discussed this for just a minute, and I said, "Are you okay with Councilmember Druffel's amendment?" He said, "Yeah, I'd prefer that one go on." If he does not want that to go on, I don't, or if he doesn't want his amendment to go on, I don't want to move the bill. I mean, this is his, this is his district. It's not my district. It's no one else's district. It's his. And he told me what he wanted when he left. And so if we're not, that's kind of where I am. I just have to abstain on it if we put that amendment on because I don't know what Dave wants. And it's, it's his district and his bill. And so that's where I'm standing here right now. I don't know what he wants. Move to defer, but we have, a, we have an amendment for the, we have the amendment for the. So, so we're on, so here's where we are. We have a motion to approve Council Member Rosenberg's amendment that was made by Council Member Swara. It was seconded, but I think the deferral motion takes precedence over everything. So Council Member Roten, are you moving to defer one meeting? If Yes, move to defer one Second. meeting. Second. Okay, so that does take precedence over the amendment. So we now are on a deferral motion of one meeting. Okay, discussion on the deferral motion. Council Member Van Rees. Uh, yes, I, I'd just like to know that our delay of two weeks is not going to um, 
Oh yeah, he kind of went out of order, didn't he? Okay, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that just because we need two weeks, that's not gonna delay housing for two weeks. And I get um, a clarification on that. Mr. Jameson. I uh, April Calvin was here earlier and confirmed that the, the housing uh, of the occupants is ongoing. They are hoping to um, have everyone housed by January 4th, but that's an ongoing operation. Uh, I don't believe a two week deferral of this aspect will interrupt that in any way. Okay. Other discussion on the deferral motion? Seeing none, we're on the deferral motion of one meeting. Um, all those in favor of the deferral motion of one meeting say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, deferral motion passes. So this one's deferred one meeting, okay? All right, we're now on, <clears throat> excuse me, we're on item number 114, BL 2022-1571. This is by Council Member Stiles and Gamble in ordinance to amend Title Eight of the Metropolitan Code of Laws relative to animals. Council Member Stiles, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Public Health and Safety, Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Public Health and Safety recommended uh, deferral to the second meeting in January. Uh, seven in favor, zero against. All right, Council Member Roten, Budget and Finance. Apologize, what's uh, We're on the Animals Bill, BL 2022 1571. Uh, budget and Finance voted 12 in favor, it's zero against to defer to 1323. To 1323? Okay. Got it, okay. Uh, Council Member Stiles, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you very much. And so today in Committee for Public Health, I did ask for it to be deferred to the second meeting in January. And also I would like to do the public hearing that evening as well. All right, so uh, your motion is to <clears throat> defer to the second meeting in January. Correct. But also to specially set a, a public hearing at the second meeting in January. Yes, please. Okay. All right. So uh, the motion is to defer to the second meeting in January. Also have a public hearing in that at that meeting. Properly seconded discussion on the motion. Now I can't tell Council Member Young on this one. <clears throat> Council Member Hancock. <laughs> You're recognized. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak today. I was just going to let my dog holiday sweater speak for itself. But um, after hearing some comments about whether we should share our opinion at council meeting or not, I thought, hey, I'm, I'm going to share my opinion. We should. This is why we're here. Um, I listened to many of the emails that we all got. Um, I also got some um, emails directly from people in my district. I also read the opinion from the American Kennel Club, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by saying I'm super excited that a lot of the problematic things that um, constituents were concerned about this summer have been removed. I'm also super excited that we're going to have a public hearing because I think it's important. I think that's why we're here, <laughs> is to do things that the public wants. Um, the main concerns with the American Kennel Club, as you can find on their website. So remember, this is a motion to defer. Uh, well, I'm excited about the deferral. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about deferring. And again, I'm super excited about deferring with the public hearing because I think these are the things that they need to say, that they want to say here. And, um, and yet, point of order. So, um, your point of order. So Councilmember Murphy has called a point of order. Councilmember Murphy. We're, uh, isn't it correct that we are on the deferral motion? And so uh, we have we have somehow gotten away from even trying to defend the deferral motion to e-motions. And I, I think it's time that we get back on to the actual discussion of the deferral motion and vote. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. I am super excited and emotional about my pleasure and support for this deferral and the fact that we're going to have a public hearing. I think it's awesome and I think that it's going to give the constituents what they want, the ability to be heard. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Mendez. Ms. Ms. Darby, um, so we don't, we're not required to have a public hearing on this? You, no, you're not required to have a public hearing. Rule 28 would require a two-thirds vote in order to set the public hearing for the second meeting in January. All right. 
r respectfully um, to the people who are excited about a public hearing. Um, you know, we're in, in the middle of uh, dealing with, uh, I don't know how many billion dollars worth of things um, and coming up on the end of the term. And uh, frankly, this is not mission critical um, to running the city and I don't think we should have a public hearing. Um, I think we shouldn't have a public hearing at a, um, uh, the off meeting, the second meeting of the month. And so I would encourage people to just vote no on this motion. And if there can't be a more conventional motion Motion and just have it go through without a public hearing, then just vote it down. Thanks. Council member Roten. A minute, hold on. Council member Roten. Thanks, I'd like to follow up with council member Mendez said and as far as the public hearing, we are trying to get some dates scheduled for January and February uh, for budget hearings for the public so we can get early budget hearings and hear what the public wants on the budget. And so those are gonna be taking up a lot of our time in January and February. So if we can avoid having this public hearing, I would prefer it, thank you. All right, um, I've got more people in the queue. Council Member Parker, you recognized at Council Member Hort's desk. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to, to remind folks, I believe some resolution or ordinance that I uh, attempted to, to move a similar motion for a couple of years ago. We had a different council director at the time, but the ruling was that the motions needed to be split. Um, so that is the precedent for um, these kind of compound motions that, that I recall when I tried to do it. So um, I'm not saying we need to rule that today. I'm just um, reminding folks how it was handled last time I tried to do it. Um, okay, well, at this point, the motion is to gather I think the request, so there's been a request to, you can just vote the motion down and then you can end up with a proper deferral motion. Uh, we've got other people in the queue. Uh, Council Member Gamble. Council Member Stiles, I'll have to come back to you because you've already spoken on it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I guess I need clarification before making a comment. So it, the motion is to defer with a public hearing, the second meeting in January. And we need how many votes uh, today in order for that deferral and public hearing to be approved? Thirds. You need two thirds, two, two thirds. thirds of a vote. Okay. Um, and if it doesn't pass, then we go back on the bill as is, or is that up to the sponsor? It, it, it would be best if the motions were separated, uh, that way you could vote on each one separately, whether to have the public hearing and whether to defer. Um, I think if they're combined and it doesn't pass, it, it uh, is not deferred and it, there's no public hearing. So you would have to go back to uh, a motion to approve or withdraw or, or whatever the. Okay. So. I, I would like to, so, okay, so the motion now is to defer with a, with the public hearing on the second meeting. Can I, do we have to, can I just make a motion then to separate these motions and do the motion to maybe. defer? I think maybe. Yeah, I think, uh, let me go back to Council Member Stiles. Let's okay. try to get this thing back okay. on track. Okay. Council, Member, uh, Council Member Stiles, so the question is, uh, you put the motions together. Do you want to split the motions? No, in fact, because this is clearly creating bedlam, I'd rather just do the deferral till the second meeting in January and I can hold a, a, a public community meeting, which is what I was planning on doing that week before. So it wouldn't be the public hearing, but at least the community would have a chance to voice their concerns. I'm just waiting to. So you need to withdraw your motion. Withdraw, I will draw my motion. I'd like to make a new one. Can do that? Yeah, I'll let you do that. Okay. I'd like to withdraw my original motion. I would like to just do a deferral for this bill until the second meeting in January. Okay, so the motion is to defer to the second meeting in January, properly second. We're now on a deferral motion, just a deferral motion. Questions on the deferral motion? If you have it, raise your hand. Um, no, because this will be a voice vote, okay. Any discussion on the deferral motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Deferral motion passes. Okay, this one's deferred to the second meeting in January. 
Uh, we're on uh, item number 15, BL 2022-1572 by Council Member Young and Bradford. Ordinance amending section 12.12.19 of the Metropolitan Cutters Law relative to traffic calming projects. Council Member Young, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, and happy Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> committee report, please. Uh, transportation, Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Transportation me recommended a one meeting deferral, nine in favor, zero against. All right, Council Member Young, you're recognized. Thank you. I will move a one meeting deferral uh, uh, with, with the added comment that- um, It's just deferred by rule. Oh, okay. It's, uh, I'm being told it's deferred by rule, so you don't have to do anything. Even better. Great, okay, <laughs> off we go. All right, thank you, Councilmember Young. All right, we are now finally on bills on third reading. Okay, um, now I'll, I'm gonna go through items that are on the consent agenda. These are items on the consent agenda. I've got um, BL 2022-1061, item number 121 is on consent. Uh, item 122-1062 is on consent. I think it's all of them. I'm checking. Uh, 1071 is on consent. 1433 is on consent. 1534 is on consent. 1535 is on consent. 1536 is on consent. 1537, 1538, 1539, 1540, 1541, and 1542. Everything is on consent. Council Member Toombs, you recognize. I need to pull 1071. 1071, no longer on consent. Okay, anything else needs to be pulled? <laughs> All right, uh, we are, um, let me go through bills that are on consent. BL 2022-1061 by Council Member Rutherford. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from AR2A to SP zoning for property located at 14656 Old Hickory Boulevard at the southern terminus of Harris Hills Lane. Um, and then the companion bill, BL 2022-1062 by Council Member Rutherford. Uh, ordinance to authorize building material restrictions requirements for BL 2022-1061. Proposed ordinance requires certain materials to restrict in the construction of buildings. Um, item 123 has been pulled. Item number 124, BL 2022-1433 by Council Member Toombs. Ordinance to amend Title 17 by changing from R8 to IWD zoning for properties located at 423 Woodfolk Avenue and 410 Haney Avenue, approximately 519 feet west of Brick Church Pike. Uh, Brick Church Pike. Item number 125, BL 2022-1534. Council Member Evans, Roten, Suara, and others in ordinance approving and authorizing the Director of Public Property Administration to accept a donation of real property consisting of approximately 9.53 acres located at 1209 Tulip Grove Road, 1213 Tulip Grove Road, and 0 Tulip Grove Road. Item number 126, BL 2022-1535, Council Members Roten, Withers, and Pulley, Ordinance Authorizing Director of Public Property, or his designated transfer of the State of Tennessee via the attached quick claim deed. Any remaining fee interest the Metropolitan Government of National Davidson County may have in a portion of a runaway of Broadway Avenue. Uh, item number 127, BL 2022-1536, Withers and Pulley, Ordinance Authorizing the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County to remove existing sanitary sewer mains, ban existing sanitary sewer mains, manholes and easements, and to accept new sanitary sewer Sewer, water main center, sewer man, manholes and easements for five properties located on Lebanon Pike. Item number 128, BL 2022-1537, Bradford, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to abandon existing sanitary sewer main, sanitary sewer manholes and easements, and to accept new sanitary sewer main, sanitary sewer manholes and easements, property located at 1000 Thompson Place. BL 2022-1538, Parker, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to accept new sanitary sewer manholes, property located at Pennock Avenue. Item number 130, BL 2022-1539, Withers, and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to abandon existing water and sanitary sewer main, sanitary sewer manholes and easements, replace existing sanitary sewer manholes and accept new water and sanitary sewer mains, fire hydrant assembly, sanitary sewer, man, sewer manholes, and easements for two properties located at 601 Crutcher Street and 730 Lenore Street. Item number 131, BL 2022-1540, Withers and Pulley. 
Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to accept new public fire hydrant assemblies for property located at 200 Broadway. Item number 132, BL 2022-1541, Lee Withers and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to accept new sanitary sewer mains, sanitary sewer manholes, fire hydrant assemblies, and easements for property located at 41119 Murfreesboro Pike. And then item number 133, BL 2022-1542, Withers and Pulley. Ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government to abandon existing public water mains and to accept new public water mains and fire hydrant assemblies for property located at 1217 Phillips. Street, also known as Clark UMC Residential. All right, anything else needs to be pulled? All right, um, seeing none, uh, got planning and zoning, council member Withers. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. The Planning and Zoning Committee met and considered uh, ordinance bill 2022, 1061, 1062, and 1433, and we recommended each of those seven in favor, zero against, zero abstentions. All right. Uh, Council Member Withers, a motion to approve. I would love to move the consent calendar. Council Member Withers has moved the consent calendar, properly seconded. Any discussion on the consent calendar? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent calendar say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, you adopt. Uh, we're now on item number 123, BL 2022 1071 by Council Member Toombs. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, an ordinance to amend Title 17 by change from IR to MUG NS zoning for property located at 407 Great Circle Road, northern terminus of Athens Way. Council Member Toombs, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report. Uh, I think everything's in. One. Okay. Um, I need to defer this to the first meeting in January. Okay, so the motion is to that. defer to the first meeting in January. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Properly seconded. Discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of the deferral motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. Council Member Roden, before everybody leaves, you recognize. Thank you, Vice, Vice Mayor. Um, in budget and finance yesterday, Council Member Mendez asked me a question about when we could meet and with the administration about the stadium. And I made, uh, I responded to everybody and everybody kind of agreed and the administration said it was okay. On the 19th at the budget and finance meeting, when the meeting starts, the administration is going to be lined up right there in front of us all, and they will take questions for as long as we want to take questions, right? Correct. And so they're going to take questions. Um, I think our hearing, the East Bank Stadium Committee is finishing up next week. So review everything and then come in with all your questions ready to fire away. You'll get an email about it, but I know we've been getting a lot lately. So if you miss it, I just want to make sure you know the 19th. Thank you. All right. I need a uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to adjourn say aye. Opposed, no. We're getting ready to start this We're adjourned. process back yes. up. So start thinking about. Council has concluded about a um, five hour and 40 minute meeting tonight. Um, maybe almost six hours. Um, it was a, had um, 100, uh, the agenda was 50 pages long and came about 133 items, a good number of which were public hearings. We had uh, 44 of those uh, that were uh, second reading zoning bills. Uh, another public hearing that was held tonight uh, that also uh, turned out to be important was one regarding uh, the city setting up a uh, pilot program for license plate readers uh, here in Davidson County. The council approved that idea 22 to 13 with one abstention. Uh, we had quite a bit of debate as it was a part of the public hearing. We had the police chief John Drake and the district attorney Glenn Funk saying we need these uh, license plate readers in Davidson County to help fight crime. On the other side we had uh, representatives of the community over Oversight Board and the Metro Human Relations Commission saying that uh, this kind of technology has not been proven as often turned out to be harmful for uh, uh, color, people of color and brown people and think perhaps we ought to go a little bit more slowly about this and not move ahead. Uh, the council will go ahead and we will have this uh, six month uh, trial period after that that uh, will come back. They'll pick up um, some kind of a person to operate that, some kind of company to do that. And after that's done, they'll come back to the council. The council will debate again whether to continue uh, with the program and if so, uh, uh, if there needs to be a contract for that, the council will have to approve that contract. Uh, that was quite a bit of debate tonight. That probably took up about an hour, and then the public hearings tonight on zoning took up about uh, two hours. The council did inch forward tonight on a couple of different bills uh, regarding the proposed uh, $2.1 billion roof stadium for the Tennessee Titans football team to be built over on the East Bank. The council has been studying this proposal for some time now and conducting public hearings across the, the city, which will continue next week. One bill up tonight uh, that was approved on second reading would increase the 
city's hotel hotel motel occupancy tax in the amount of one percent. That would help to do some of the some of the construction and help for some of the debt on the on the uh, new proposal as it's built. A new project has been built. One amendment was added to that tonight. It basically took the effective date for when that hotel motel tax would take effect to February 1st, 2023. Now it's it won't take effect until the final binding documents to construct the stadium are in hand and have been approved. Obviously, that date is still not certain. The other legislation tonight before the council was a resolution, which only took one vote. Uh, that was uh, 20, uh, resolution 2022-1827. It would uh, move a non-binding term sheet uh, describing all the terms and conditions for the agreements. The council has been a little bit leery about a non-binding agreement, uh, even though the city sports authority approved uh, that last week. The council did a further amend the bill tonight, the resolution, to underscore the non-binding binding nature of this term sheet, but they then deferred the resolution again. We'll take it up in the next council meeting on December 20th. That's when the hotel motel tax increase will be up for final approval, so it may well be we'll get action, final action one way or the other on both these pieces of legislation when the council comes for its final meeting of the year on December 20th. Other resolutions tonight, the council accepted a nearly $500,000 grant from the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant Program. Uh, it will provide a, a broad, support a broad range of activities, prevent and control crime based on state and local needs and conditions. Also, he authorized $200,000 in grants to six different nonprofit organizations. The money will come from C's Office for Family Safety under its Community Partnership Grant Program. It also approved a $177,000 grant involving the Metro Board of Health, the Fire Department, and the Mental Health Cooperative. It would have that nonprofit group provide outreach, assessment, and linkage to, to care for individuals identified by the Fire Department's EMS service as a part of the city's opioid overdose response program. The council also uh, approved a resolution to uh, seek a 63 $5 million grant from the state to modernize and upgrade the city's water sewer services dry creek water reclamation facility uh, this will uh, this facility is right now over 50 years of age and these modernization efforts are projected to increase capacity for the area so it can continue to handle service flow in that area for another 20 years under memorializing resolutions the council recognized the 30th anniversary of asylum health it recognized the lbgt community and remember the victims of the club q shooting in colorado springs colorado they congratulated the metropolitan water services as a recipient of the 20 2022 Tennessee Solar Energy Industries Association. They received their Solar Champion Award, and they recognized the 10th anniversary of the American Muslim Advisory Council. On second reading, the council deferred a bill that would increase the size of several city boards and commissions that is still being studied and perhaps negotiated with the administration. Also on second reading, the council deferred a bill that would rewrite the, no, they okayed a bill that would rewrite the rules, regulations, and permits and fees involved in excavating and obstruction of the public right away for the construction, for construction or any other purposes. They then deferred a bill that would seek to uh, codify the existing traffic calming program maintained by the city's Department of Transportation. Both these have been issues that the council has struggled with, and uh, at least on one of them, they continue to struggle with it with that tonight's deferral. The council also deferred until uh, the second meeting in January a bill that would uh, rewrite uh, the city's animal code. Um, the council got into quite a bit of debate about what to do in this particular situation because they couldn't agree whether to have a public hearing to go with this as well. Uh, wound up that the, they just deferred it until until January, and the public hearing, if there's going to be one, will have to be handled in a separate matter. Finally, on second reading, there was a routine easement that was supposed to be accepted tonight. Uh, usually those are pretty simple, not much to them. But in this particular case, the sponsor, Councilman David Rosenberg, who, uh, it, it, this is in his district, uh, did not want this uh, easement to take effect until uh, all the occupancies at the current um, uh, Brookmead homeless settlement are being offered either permanent or semi-permanent housing in accordance with Metro's uh, plan to do that. Uh, there are already signs up at the camp that uh, Metro is going to be closing up the camp by the end of the year. The council again got into a bit of a, a, a controversy and, and mixed up situation about exactly how to go forward with this because they had some amendments out here. One was late filed, one was already there, but nobody was really comfortable with the exact uh, language of all that. So the council wound up just deferring that because by that time, council, uh, council some of the people who were involved in this were not here at the meeting late, and so they thought they'd be better not to make things worse perhaps by passing something they then were not happy with when it came up on third reading. The council is now in recess for the next two weeks. It comes back for its final meeting of 2022 on December the 20th. We'll be here at that time to provide live coverage. Until then, I'm Pat Nolan and good night from the council chambers. Tonight's meeting of the Metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County Council has been coming to you live from the council chambers at the Metro Courthouse. It's a public affairs presentation of the Metro Nashville Network.
has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.